Notre Dame fans, welcome back. It is Friday, and you know what that means. It is the Friday free-for-all mailbag. And as of right now, Friday is still our mailbag day. That may change here pretty soon. But for today, we are going to be talking about whatever you want to talk about. As long as it's related to Notre Dame, Notre Dame football, uh, college football, and occasionally I let a couple movie or history things by. But uh, we're going to talk a lot of football today, Ryan. Ryan Roberts is with me today, everybody our wonderful director of recruiting at Irish Breakdown, and you know me, I'm Brian. So, Ryan, man, I, I got to tell you, dude, before we get started on this stuff, I mean, I'm calling you dude already. I'm so fired up. There's college football on tomorrow, man. I can't no. – I've never been looking forward, more forward to a Nebraska-Northwestern game in my life. I am so fired up right now for college football. Well, Nebraska-Northwestern at one time was a pretty good game, but right yeah. now it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. the best in the world. Well, you know, it's going to be interesting because, you know um, – you, you, I've got Nebraska win in the West. I mean, that's kind of one of my offseason bold predictions, right? Is Nebraska win in the West? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, how are they going to handle it? You know, playing in Ireland and Northwestern's got the little Irish flag on their end or whatever. We were doing a, recorded a show with John Garcia last night. And I don't think you could see it, but he had the, the Nebraska fighting Irish on his whiteboard behind him, you know, just kind of a joke because Nebraska's going out to play in Ireland. So, uh, but man, I, I can't, I can't wait for it. You know, there's some really interesting games this weekend. And, of course, last night already started. Notre Dame high school kids kind of kicked off their season. Braylon James had three catches for 100 yards and a touchdown and played like a half of football. Yep. I think is what his dad said, right? Peyton Bowen and Eli Bowen had monster games. They beat Rockwell Heath 47-14. Ryan, that was, a, that was a team that won like 11 or 12 games last year. They in were the like Texas I, in the yeah. preview. I think I think I had them down at eleven and two last year. So yeah, it was. I, I put down. It was a pretty good early test for yes. Ben Geyer. No, yes. no, it was not. Peyton was had not. a pick six that went seventy five yards. Eli literally like took a ball from a guy and then ran it back and had a touchdown reception. It's a really brilliant game for them. CJ Carr struggled last night in the game. He had four turnovers, but you know what I loved about it. Mm -hmm. Whenever they needed him to step up and make a big play, he made it. He threw a gorgeous. Yeah. I think. Uh, uh, Hudsonville had taken a lead and mm -hmm. CJ comes back and just throws a 55, about a 55 yard bomb yeah. and hits a receiver in stride, sets them up for a score. And then, you know, late in the game, they're up 17, 15. He had two touchdown runs. They're up 17, 15. They're trying to put the game away. And that seam throw he threw, he, he made to set up that final touchdown was just gorgeous. Sure was. So uh, they started off one and oh, and, and CJ did what we need to do to get that W. So, it was a lot of fun. Tons of games tonight. Ryan has the breakdowns of all of them. It's on at irishbreakdown.com. He also has some YouTube clips, not YouTube clips, Twitter clips of some highlights last night. You get to see that deep shot by CJ Carr. You see a couple brilliant catches that Braylon James made last night. I mean, he, he wasn't just out running dudes. He was making really contested catches. He had an impressive first night. And then, of course, the pick six by Peyton Bowen was something you're going to want to see. And if you're on the board, boards.irishbreakdown.com. If not, you should be. We're going to be doing a little, we'll call it a watch party tonight. So tonight, I talked to Jeremiah Love this weekend. He's actually playing a game in Canton at 6 o'clock Eastern time. My last update, I put the link already on there. Canton, Ohio? Canton, Ohio, oh, yeah. Nice. It's, it's like, I forget what the name of it is. It's something classic or something. Yeah, I'll so be in like there the, on Tuesday. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, man. It's it's really neat. So he uh, he sent me the link the other day. So when I did the little update on him the other day, I put the link in the bottom of there, but I'm, I'm going to do a new post here after we get off the show because I'm going to be watching that game and just kind of do some instant reaction stuff because obviously Jeremiah Love is the number one offensive player on the board for Notre Dame right now, right? So I, I'm really excited to see his game. He he told me, quote, unquote, that he's gonna, they're going to shock the world tonight. I guess they're playing a pretty good football team, but it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure if you're not on the uh, the Irish board, um, the, the, the message board, excuse me, Make sure you sign up today because it's going to be fun to just get a little watch party to watch Jeremiah Love later today. 
I'm actually looking to see who they play tonight. I'm pulling up their schedule. They play they're, they're, Milton. They're an, okay. Yeah, they're they're an o, o and one team, but uh, from what Jeremiah was kind of telling me, it sounds like they're a pretty pretty good football team. So yeah, no, no, uh, Milton's a team I'm familiar with. I'm just curious who they played. They lost to Lipscomb. Okay, so Milton played Caleb Beasley's team in the opener. Uh, so yeah, and can't, uh, Caleb had a nice game against them. He had an interception. They're playing had, in Ohio, but it's a team from Georgia. Uh, Milton is from Georgia. So it's the yeah. Freedom Bowl in Canton, Ohio, but it, neither team is from – because I'm looking at them, and this is a lot of Georgia teams for a team from Ohio. Yeah, <laughs> but no, it's a right. team from Georgia. So it'll be a very, very interesting game. Yeah, but they lost to Kayla Beasley and Lipscomb in the opener, 17-7. Mm-hmm. to 7. So uh, be a very good test for Jeremiah Love, who Ryan has had a lot of updates on over the last month. So I'm glad to see everyone else is finally coming around to what Ryan has been saying for quite yep. some time. So – Ryan, let's dive into the mailbag, man. We got a lot of good stuff coming up. Let's get started with Christopher Moore. I had the first super chat in there. Thank you for this, Christopher. He said, Al Golden has talked about making in-game adjustments from series to series. Do you think he will be in the box or on the field to make those adjustments? It's almost impossible to tell. I mean, yeah. I, I don't I don't know because, again, we're talking about a guy that has not called defense since, what, 2004, 2005? So, like, right. I don't know what his style is. I believe is he was in the box defense. back then. Right. I Most but guys – Actually, eh, it's, it's kind of a mix, man. I was going to say defensive coordinator. It's definitely a mix. Yeah. Def- yeah. Offensive coordinators usually tend to be up top. Not all of them, but they tend to be up top. When I, when I, when I call the defense, I'd like to be right on the field in yeah. the action. But when I was an assistant just to the defensive coordinator, I did like being in the box because it's like the different view. So I, I guess it's really what coach golden prefers. I'm not hundred percent sure. You know, I think he was a guy that was a box guy as a coordinator, but then he becomes a head coach. And then in the NFL, he's always been an on the field guy. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what his stance is. And I think the other part of it, too, is, is what is his trust level with the communication with from himself to the coaches and then to the players? I think that's going to be the big key is do you trust your assistants to relay specifically what you're saying for those adjustments to the players? And it's I shouldn't say trust, because if, if he's on the field, it doesn't mean he doesn't trust them. It right. just means that maybe their communication isn't quite there, or he doesn't necessarily – maybe he wants to just be there because I I don't know if I can say it. I need to make sure that I'm just there. So I think that could factor in it early on as well. Maybe he starts in the the field and moves up. or I mean, there's a lot of different aspects of it. But it just – a lot of it, though, Ryan, is just what is your personal preference? I don't think there's a right way or wrong way. It's what's right for you and what 100%. works best for you as a coach. I, I mean, to your last point, Brian, like I've, I've been around a bunch of coordinators that they would kind of go back and forth. You know, it's like some games they like to be in the box, some games they like to be right in the action. I really think it does depend on not only the personal preference, but like there's different games that just have a different feel to it. Right. Like you just kind of I mean, like if it's a if, if it's a tempo team. Right. Like wouldn't I want the main communicator to be right there on the field trying to relay the, the signals and do all that type of stuff. Like I, there's just a lot of layers to it. So we'll see. But I, I assume it'll be in the box. But that's just speculation on my part. Yep. So we we'll see how that pans out. We had another super chat from Dino Bambino twenty three. I love this name. Uh, I, I like these throwback questions. These are a lot of fun, especially on a mailback day. If Jimmy Clausen and Golden Tate had played their senior year, could we honestly say that they would have been unstoppable and could have gone to the Natty? Floyd, Rudolph, Armando Allen, Sear Wood were there on offense. You know, I have I have often thought about this Ryan and Mm -hmm. when I look at that Notre Dame football team I I looking back I don't know if Charlie Molnar and some of the guys on the offensive staff would have necessarily been good enough to to be that but you know that that football team was not I mean I think they beat Michigan if Jimmy Clausen and Golden Tater there they lost by four and they had a lead when Dane Chris got hurt Nate Montana and Tommy Reese came in. When Dane came back, they didn't have a lead anymore. Uh, he got them lead back. They lost, you know, and then Michigan got it back again. They lost by Michigan to Michigan State on the road by three on that little stupid little Giants play. Mm-hmm. And then they lost to Tulsa by one. Those are three games for sure that Notre Dame wins if those guys play. Stanford in 2000 in that year, I don't know if that's a game Stanford, if Notre Dame wins. I mean, they got, they got destroyed in that game. I mean, it was 37-14. It was a competitive game. Would Jimmy have been good enough to maybe dice them apart? Maybe. I mean, Jimmy tore Stanford up the year before in his last game at Notre Dame. And it was basically the same Stanford team. You know, I mean, the Stanford team in 2009 was not quite as good defensively as they were in 2010. 2010 is when they kind of took a big jump forward. But, you know, he he torched that defense the year before, if you remember. Stanford ended up winning 
uh, was it 45, 38? I'm looking up this, the stats now, but I mean, Jimmy went 23 of 30 for 340 yards and five touchdowns. You know, you That's come nice. in. Yeah. Yeah. You come into that game, you know, in, in 2010 and, you know, Notre Dame had, you know, didn't have Jimmy, didn't have Golden Tate. I mean, I think those guys would have made a big impact. I, I think they would have beat Navy that year. Because mm-hmm. remember what hurt them against Navy was was Michael Floyd didn't play that game, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly, against Navy. And and I'll have to go back and and, and look at that. But I'm pretty sure that Michael Floyd missed that game uh, against Navy. And then they went out and uh, lost. He had zero catches for zero yards. So, yeah, if Michael Floyd didn't have any catches or yards, he wasn't healthy. So he got, he got locked down by a, by that great name. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> uh, so you didn't have him. It just was a mess. I don't think Jimmy loses to Navy with that team. I, yeah, the Stanford's the only game. I don't know. That's the only mm-hmm. game I'm uncertain of. So I think the very least they would have been 11 and one win in the natty. I love Jimmy Clausen. I don't think they're beating Cam Newton. I, no. I just, I don't, you know, I mean, that, that wasn't a great team. It wasn't a great Auburn team. They had a great player. I don't yes. know if Notre Dame would have been able to stop him. I mean, I, you know, the, Bob Yako did a great job with that defense. Would they have been able to stop Cam? I, I don't know. I, I have my doubts. Michael Dyer wasn't either running back on that 2010 team. Michael Dyer. They had uh, yeah. Nick Fairley, a defensive tackle, yeah. had a monster year that year. But yeah. but I'll say this. Of all the teams in the last 15 years, I mean, I think that Auburn team was one of the more beatable ones. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it was – like the 2012 Bama team. I mean, they had they had a great one great player. I mean, that year in 2010, you know, they gave up 24 points a game. Mm-hmm. They had some some really close wins that year. You know, beat Mississippi State by three, beat Clemson by three, beat South Carolina by eight, beat Kentucky by three, beat LSU by a touchdown, beat Alabama by one. Had to come back and do that. And that was in that, that 2010 was, was without comeback. question out without question Saban's worst team since the 09 title team and they lost three games. I mean, they haven't lost that many games in a, you know, in a long time lost by two touchdowns to South Carolina. Cause you had Spurrier was still there. And, you know, so could they've had a chance? Sure. Uh, there were still holes on that roster, but that, that Notre Dame 2010 and 11 teams had a lot more NFL talent than people like to talk about and, and wasted a lot of it, to be honest with you. And that's, that's a different story for a different day. And, LSU fans can deal with that, you know. Now. Was was so. that that year for Alabama? Was that still Greg McElroy? Because they won in 09 right with him, and then they lo- lost like a few games the year after, I believe. If Not, I yeah, it was Greg McElroy's last year. Yes, he was the yeah. quarterback on that team, and then AJ McCarron took over the next year. Yep, and they were a running team. AJ really took off in 2012 and 2013. He was a much better player in those two years than he was in, in 2011. It was just run the ball and beat out Philip Sims. If you remember him, was a highly ranked recruit from Virginia. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean that that, too, that and that's the thing is Alabama wasn't rolling out five star after five star after five star. Then I mean they had some no. guys. I mean they had Julio, sure. but as I've pointed out in the past, that was a team that was physical, well coached, and all those type of things. But they were more beatable back then, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yep. And you know, I, I still think some of the best coaching jobs Saban did were early in his tenure at Alabama. I, I think agree. they have out just out talented and out athleted people, much more so in recent years. For sure. I don't disagree with that at all. What do you Man, think I, that team would have done, Ryan, in 2010, that Notre Dame team, if they had Jimmy Claus and a Golden Tate? I I just don't think the defense was good enough and the coaching had some holes They were top in it. 25 I mean, defense that year, though, scoring. Yeah, I mean, but, like, what were they going to do again? I know you said that, that Auburn's beatable, but, like, how are they going to defend Cam Newton? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't – Cam Newton, I'm not a big Cam Newton guy, never really have, Mm -hmm. but like that season, man, he just made everybody around him so much better that year because it was not a great roster for Auburn. And the the problem was, Ryan, is you could get a lead on him, but then he would just get it right back. And that's, I mean, he did that time and time again. Kentucky almost beat Auburn. I mean, LSU almost beat Auburn. And every game is like Cam would just, you know, but I guess, you know, would would Jimmy Claus, Golden Tate, Michael Floyd been enough to get it back? You know, I think that's the thing I look at because, like you said, that Auburn question. pass defense wasn't great. No, I don't even I don't remember yeah. any defenders on that team other than yeah. um they had well they had D Ford on that team, right? And right. then they had Nick Farrelly. So. Like that's yeah. the only two that I remember that were like significant players. Everybody else was just kind of yeah. I think like Darren Bates was on that team, right? Like a couple okay players, but like nobody special, obviously. Yeah, their leading tack was Josh Burns. Next was Zach Etheridge, Nico Thorpe, Craig Stevens, Nick Fairley, Mike McNeil, Damon Washington, Darren Bates, as you said, to Charvin Bell, Aaron Savage, 
El Toro, Freeman, Antoine Carter. I'm just going down list of top tacklers. Zach Clayton, Jonathan Evans. I mean, you know, to your point, that team won because they had freaking Cam Newton. You know, Darvin Adams was a nice player. You know, I mean, yeah. he's a nice player. Uh, Michael Dyer was a good player, but sure. you know, Ontario Michaela was on that team. If you remember him, they won because of Cam Newton. I mean, yes. that's that's the reality of it. And that's why the next year when they didn't have Karen, Cam Newton, <laughs> they were a eight and five team. And then two years later, when what three and nine and, and yes. Chizik got fired. So, you know, that, Cam that Newton year, had been better than they were. That that year was like LSU 2019, man. It was just like, it was kind of like very average and mediocre around it, but it was just that one season right. where they had a, well, LSU had more than just one guy and Joe. Burrow. Yeah. Like LSU was dudes, more of a great but, team. Your point yes. was that one season was the anomaly compared yes. to the others. But the difference between that 19 team and that 10 team is that team won because of just Cam Newton was just one elevated player. everybody. Yeah. It, imagine if Cam would have had studs around him. And that's what Joe, <laughs> Joe Burrow was a phenomenal player. I mean, look, was. what's funny is all this LSU nonsense that's going on, on on Twitter. Oh, you hate LSU. You're a hater and all that. I'm like, uh, how many people do you know that predicted LSU to make the college football playoff in 2019? Uh, I know a guy that did this guy, you know what I mean? Because you could see that they had the talent. They just didn't have the people in place to, to dick direct that talent where it needed to go. Right. And when they hired Joe Brady and you started hearing things in the off season that coach O was going to open up the offense. And I'm like, okay, if he does that, this team's going to be really good. Cause it wasn't a talent problem at LSU in 2019. It was a coaching problem. Brian, you know what we should do sometime? This is kind of a, a, a interesting little bit of a, a, of a evaluation. Look, I think we should talk about some of the past recruits of just rant. Like it doesn't have to be Notre Dame centric, but some of the past players like that were committed to another school and kind of do like a, what if they went to the other school type of thing? Cause if you think about it, I, th if I remember correctly, wasn't Jamar chase committed to Kansas before LSU? I believe he was. Yes, it was like was, some weird thing was like two that. top hundred kids from Louisiana that committed to Kansas. Yeah. I think I, I can't remember what the other kid played. He might've been a DB running. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, Jamar had committed early to Kansas. It was very strange. And he was highly could, ranked. It wasn't like he was some nobody that nobody heard of. Exactly. And then he blew up and went to LSU. And could you imagine weird. if he went, to, if he oh went my there, God. Man? Like, but you know, what's crazy. What LSU yeah. still wins the title in 19. If Jamar chase stays oh, at sure. Kansas. Sure. That's what I, was I, crazy about that team. Yeah. I, I meant more from like Jamar chase's yeah. perspective. Like what happens to Jamar chase? If he goes to Kansas, you know, like I have no idea. I would like to think that he would still be a, really good player for Kansas because, you know, he's as good as he is, but like, maybe, maybe somebody sent happened. him a thing that said, Kansas puts out first round draft picks every year. And they just didn't tell him that they were talking about the NBA, <laughs> right. you know, not, not NFL, but yeah, you know, but honestly, I, I wish more stuff like that actually happened. I wish more kids would blaze their own trail. I do. I, I'm not saying Jamar chase. I mean, I, I mean, Kansas might be, I don't know if I want to blaze a trail to Lawrence, Kansas, <laughs> right. You know, maybe a different example, but I wish right. more kids would do that. I wish more kids would say, you know what? I don't want to be the next so-and-so at Alabama. I want to be the first at this, or I want to be a guy that plays a role in turning this program around. And I wish more guys would do that. I think that, that's why I like, that's game. why I like the thing that uh, Travis Hunter going to Jackson state, man. Like it's, it's different, you know, it's, I had it's, no it's problem. With interesting. That. Yeah. No problem with that. I mean, it, it's all, oh, they bought him. So right. Uh, is that you know, even what Texas A&M did? You, you know, know I mean, I mean, let's be honest though. He made like what he he got like a million dollar deal or something. That was like the, that, right? that was what was reported. Yeah, sure. he says he didn't, but whatever. I, I guarantee. Well, regardless, I guarantee other schools offered him probably more money than Jackson State did. Like, are yeah. you telling me that Jackson State outbid sure. a bunch of SEC schools? <laughs> like, You're the I, number I one player that. in the country. You're telling me nobody yeah. in the SEC was willing to give more than Jackson State. Like, Don't let's just serious. say that that rumor <laughs> of a million dollars is true, and he denied it, and whatever. I, let's just say it's true. You're telling me nobody else in the SEC wanted to pay more than a million dollars for the number one player in the country? Come on, refuse now. to believe it. Refuse no. to believe it. It doesn't make any sense. He wanted to blaze like... his own trail, and you know what? Right. Good for him. Absolutely. I got no problem with that. I mean, I've had I've, I've had some very interesting conversation about my opinion of HBCUs, right? So mm -hmm. my view of them and what should be happening with those type of schools, I wish more kids would do that. To be completely honest with you. I, you know? I watched um I forgot to tell you, like, it was a few weeks ago. I actually watched the Jackson State spring game mm -hmm. and they got my man playing DB and wide receiver. Oh, yeah, he's on playing that team. And that's part of, that is oh. and, and you know, take the money aside. That was part of the pitch that Deion gave him yeah. is look, dude, you're gonna play both sides. And I mean, your head coach is a guy that did that in the National Football League. Sure. So, you know, I mean, he knows how to 
he knows. I mean, the the sales pitches. He knows how to get that done. So yeah, I, I I got no problem with it. But I wish more kids would. Whether it's Jackson State or Tennessee State or Southern or Grambling or Vanderbilt, NC State. You know, don't go to Clemson. Go to NC State. You know, don't go to. You know, don't 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 go here. Go to, you know, Auburn or you know what I mean. Don't go to Bama. Go to Auburn. Go to go to Georgia Tech instead of Georgia. Whatever the case may be, like blaze your own trail. You know, be that guy that resurrects a program because those are the legends. I mean, mm-hmm. people are like, wait a minute, who was the quarterback on the Bama team? Was it this guy, this guy, or this guy? I can't remember. <laughs> you know, like I remember they had a bunch of good running backs. You know, but it, like to me, it's like, but everybody remembers that guy that turned that one program around. You know, everybody. I mean. Everybody remembers Todd Reesing at Kansas. I love Todd right? Reesing, man. He's can you name another? Players. Can you name another Kansas quarterback in the last? Year? Why was? Why do we remember him? Because he took them to the stinking Orange Bowl. He won. I mean, he yeah. won like twelve games the one year. Yeah. Like, it was incredible. At Kansas, man. right? Yeah. Guy's like five ten, rag arms. Dude no could arm. play. Yeah, dude but, could yeah. play. He was a baller, man. But he's he a legend. He's yes. a legend. He's a five foot ten quarterback legend. Why? Because he went somewhere that nobody expected him to win, and and he won. And I just mm-hmm. wish I wish more kids would do that. To be honest with you, he's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite non Notre Dame players of all time. Yeah. I love speaking. Talk about getting everything out of your talent, Brian. Like Todd Reesing got everything out of his talent, man. Mm-hmm. Like he ended up being a great football player for Kansas. I mean, Kansas has never been that good. I mean, I don't know how they were when they had like Gale Sayers back in like the '60s or right. whatever. But like in my lifetime, Kansas has never been good, except for when Todd yeah. Reesing was the quarterback right. with Mark Mangino. That was the only right. time. Hey, Ryan, what's your dad's name? Ray. So your dad has a comment in the chat. He said, if you remember, Ryan, me and you predicted that if Burrow elevated his play in 2019, they had a shot at winning a championship that season. So there you go. So great minds think alike. But that's the thing. And this kind of relates to Notre Dame. I had this conversation with somebody last year before the season. And they were like, well, we don't have all these first-round draft picks. I'm like, nobody thought LSU had a bunch of first-round draft picks before that year either. Nah. You know, it was those guys were elevated because you put a system in place that maximized their potential. And that's this kind of goes back to a conversation Sean Davis and I had last fr- Saturday about Marcus Freeman is, will Marcus Freeman be willing to be- still believe in the, in the need to play great defense, but not so much to the degree that he tamps down the potential to be explosive on offense? You know, does he try to implement a ball control offense or does he say, hey, look, we're going to open a sucker up because that's how you win a championship. Now, are we going to still value playing great defense? Yeah. Like Clemson did it. What what was Clemson in 2018? 44 and 13, 44 points for 13 against, something like that. Yeah. Right? Like you can be that kind of team. And you know, there's no reason Notre Dame can't be a 40 and 14 type of team, meaning 40 points and 14, four and 14 against. Yep. And that's what you know, Ed Orgeron had always been a we're gonna pound the ball and win these contested games, and it wasn't working. And they were they were not playing to their potential. But then he finally brings in Joe Brady, says, Let's open this sucker up and Look what happens. And all the stars aligned. Yeah, they had all those first round. They had all that first round talent. But even though mm-hmm. nobody necessarily knew they were all first round players, like who are, who are, who really heard of Clyde Edwards Alaire outside of the football junkies before 2019? Barely who anyone. Knew, yeah, who knew who Terrace Marshall was outside of LSU fans prior to 2019? You knew about who all those guys were <laughs> very quickly Je- that season. Je- Justin Jefferson was projected as like a third or fourth round pick before that season. And yeah. then he does what he does. And Mr. now he's three star recruit. Hold on. Argu- I actually want to look that up. Yeah, he is. I, yeah, I remember he was a three star. And he, I mean, he's arguably the best wide receiver in the NFL right now. Like he, the first two years, he went for, he, yeah. he went for 1,400 as a rookie and 1,600 last year. It's the most yards in the first two seasons do you, ever. Do you remember how people reacted on the board the other day when, when Notre Dame landed a defensive lineman that's a three star that's ranked in like the eight, nine hundreds? Yes. Justin Jefferson coming out of high school was the number 2,164 player in the country by, on the mm-hmm. composite list. Number 76 player in Louisiana and was ranked as the number 308 wide receiver in the country that year. Must have been a good year in Louisiana. Yes. (laughs) Yes. On the composite, that's the composite. Mm -hmm. So uh, now 247 Sports had him ranked way higher. They had him ranked number 205 in the country at wide receiver. Good for them. No. Good for them. At oh, wide receiver, oh, I'm being sarcastic. I think overall, I think no, overall. That's just, I, I did that. I paused for effect. I got to there. Uh, number two hundred five overall receiver. So, yeah. Uh, look, does that mean I want to go build my roster with a bunch of kids ranked number two thousand one hundred sixty four? No, it's about finding talent. 
And sometimes it's going to look like, you know, Michael Floyd, five-star recruit. Sometimes it's going to look like Justin Jefferson. Just find the talent or and get Jeff both. Sam- Jeff Samarja. Jeff- right. You want to exactly. take it to a Notre Dame terms. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. it happens. So, yes, you and your dad also had that conversation. I mean, you, you could see it, right? You could see it if they just – if if Edo was legit about opening it up, you just – you knew the talent was there. Because I actually liked yeah. Joe Burrow in 2018 when they let I, him play. I, I liked him. I, I definitely did not think he was going to do no. what he did, though. Like, no. I thought he was going to be a good football player. He turned into a – you know, one of the best that we've ever seen. None <laughs> so. of us are saying that we predicted LSU was going to go 15-0 and 0 and right? score 50 points a game and Joe Burrow's going to do that. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying have, have we knew the they were going to be a really dangerous team that year yeah. if they opened it up because the talent was there. And But, no, I didn't see coming what came. I'm not going to pretend to claim that. But I thought Joe Burrow could be a, a 35, 3,800 yard passer, throw 30 touchdowns. And that alone would have had LSU in the in the playoff. I mean, how much right? talent I mean, they had. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, that defense had some dudes on it too, man. It was yeah. like Christian Fulton and Grant oh, yeah. Delpit. And yeah, it was a good, it was a good. Defense now, they too. gave up a lot more points that year and, and mm-hmm. yards that year because than normal because of just how quickly their offense scored. But, uh, I mean, that was a and that was a dynamic team. That was such a dynamic team, but uh, yeah. So that's that's kind of that's an interesting one. I, I, I love questions like that. Alan Watson with a super chat. Thank you, Alan, very much. This is all right, Brian. Time for your coaching cap today. You win the toss. How would you choose if it's raining or if it's clear? If it's a clear and sunny day, I, Ryan. I don't know if rain changes my stance much. I would I would say other than. I, I would probably lean a little bit more towards choosing whatever option it is to kick off. You know what I mean? So like if it's, if I lose the toss and they defer to me, I mean, you know, obviously Mm -hmm. I'm taking the ball, right? Sure. sure. But um, you know, I would, I would want to ideally start on defense if it's raining. Uh, That's just my thing, but it would also depend on how long has it been raining Mm -hmm. because depending on the field some fields are a little slicker when it first starts raining some fields it's like you want to get on the on the field it just started raining you want to get on the field first before the water settles in (laughs) and it becomes slippery there's just so many different things that go into it alan but uh, you know most likely it would increase my desire to start on defense but a lot of it just depend on you know if we're looking at the notre dame team is it windy you know do i care more about choosing the direction of the wind early i mean it those are different aspects of it, but if it's clear and sunny, uh, I, I, that my personal preferences, I want the ball because mm-hmm. I want that cl- that crowd quiet before their offense gets on the field. I do not want to put my defense in a, in a situation where the, we're down before our offense even gets on the field, uh, sure. and I don't want to put my offense in that situation either. But that's my personal preference. I mean, I know other people are you got to defer, you got to defer. What I think it's a personal preference thing. I don't think it's a you're going to win the game if you do this or do that. I just I'm just I don't I don't buy into that philosophy. I think it's just what you prefer and what your what's the makeup of your football team. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's some t- statistic that tells me that you're wrong on that. Uh, oh yeah, I mean because the, the, the jump, no no there is there's people that have pointed this out. Well, the, this team wins. I'm like okay, so you're telling me that that Bama only wins because they defer. You know, it's not because they have better players and better coaching. It's no, it's because they chose to be on defense first. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean. All right, if you say so, right? I mean, I, I think the better team wins. And I, now I do think there's some strategy into deferring and, and kicking off. I'm not saying that those things don't matter. I'm just mm-hmm. saying I don't think they're this huge thing. I think it, it, you know where it's there's only one way to do it. I just think it depends on what's the best way for your team, that particular game, that particular matchup. A counter argument could be to start on defense in the opener is, you know, let the defense get out there so Tyler has a second to let the adrenaline kind of go down a little bit as the Chill defense out. is on the field. Yeah. I mean, that there's merit to that argument, too, for yeah. that particular game. But mm-hmm. the next week against Marshall, I want the ball, right? I mean, so it's just it's about what is the makeup of your team? What do you think is best for your team to get started off on a good note in this particular matchup? I think it care, I care more about starting about – the problem is people think too much about what it does for the second half. Well, if you're down 24 to nothing in the second half, it doesn't matter. Right. right. I want to focus on what's going to allow us to get off to the best start possible. That's the that's the key for me. Well, um, that's an interesting point, Brian, because I remember when Andy Reid was in, with the Eagles and he had Donovan McNabb 
he, well, I mean, it was easy, but he always wanted to start on defense, actually, even though he's an offensive guy. One, because he has Jim Johnson, who's a great defensive coordinator, right? So, like, they had a great defense at that point. But Donovan McNabb was one of those guys, to your point, that he got, like, way too amped up at times, and he and he had a bad habit of, like, over-squeezing the ball, and a lot of balls would just go into the dirt early on in games, you know? So he was one of those guys who were like, it's chill, man. Like, you're right. We got it. We got it going here, you know? So he, he's to your point. Uh, that that's kind of the Brady Quinn matter. was a little bit like that at Notre Dame, right? If you remember, you Brady would that. just drive some balls high or miss early because he was just he was really strong and he was just really amped up and kind of needed to get into a little bit of a rhythm. But that's again, that's yeah. knowing your team, mm-hmm. right? Know your team, know what works best for you. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, it, it's a Brady, personal preference Brady, thing. Brady gives me the impression that he was probably the guy that was also doing, you know, like pre-workout and lifting right before he went. <laughs> He's out. in the weight room. Like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, no Every, doubt. No everything's doubt. all everything's all tight when he gets out yeah. there. And I'm like, no, Brady, yeah. it's loose a little bit. Buddy. Now that may not be what he was doing, but he definitely looked like it. He was a pretty jacked <laughs> yeah. up guy. He was a pretty he strong was. dude. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Couldn't you That's... see him in like Zimikowski just in the weight yeah. room, just like pumping right doing a push up challenge, there. you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, oh, a yeah. curl challenge or a, you know a dip challenge or something like that. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it didn't happen, but yeah, that, that it wouldn't shock me if, if it did. That's hilarious. Alan Watson with another super chat. Besides a couple of lose, lose teams during his tenure, which team or teams would you like to have a do-over with? For me, it's the team that had to play Clemson in a monsoon. Ryan, there is no doubt. Mm-hmm. It post Lou Holtz, the one team that I believe more than any other that if I could have a do-over with, and make some changes to that team's coaching wise, they win a championship. It's 2015. I mean, you had explosive athletes on both sides of the ball. Yep. You had NFL linemen literally filling both of your lines. Mm-hmm. I mean, the offensive line in 2015 had three first round picks and a second round pick. And the fifth guy would have been a draft pick had he not quit football after his junior year. Defensive line wise, I mean, you had Jerry Tillery was a star on the team. He was a first round pick. Sheldon Day was on that team. He was a fourth round pick. Isaac Rochelle was an NFL draft pick. Romeo Aguara was not drafted, but has been of all those four guys, the best pro of all of them. Yes. You had the most dynamic linebacker in college football in a long time at linebacker. You had NFL players in the secondary. You had, I mean, that team should have been so much better. And they were 10 and three, but they lost mm-hmm. to every good team they played. Because right. of coaching, and that's a team that I, if I get a oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this a second round pick at quarterback, a third round pick at running back. He was backed up by a guy that broke the freshman rushing record that year and ran for 1400 yards two years later. You had a, a, a first round pick at receiver that ran a 4 3 2. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, you had some athletes. Your slow receiver was a 4 4 8. You know, <laughs> I mean, that team should have been so much better than it was. That's, That's the one answer. do-over that yeah. I would give. And it's not yeah. – I mean, I could do 2017, but that that's a little different deal. I mean, you know, look, I, I've said this before. If if Brian Kelly would have fired Brian Van Gorder after 2014 like he should have and just brought in, I mean, Mike Elko, who we would have known even less about at the time, or just any remotely competent defensive coordinator, I truly believe that team wins a title. Because they still almost beat Cle- – think about this. They went on the road, played Clemson in a, in, in a rainstorm. Clemson goes up 7 nothing. Notre Dame gets the ball. They shank a punt. Clemson's mm-hmm. next touchdown drive is 25 yards. That puts them up 14 nothing. Notre Dame fumbles the ball on a kick return after a Clemson score. Uh, I'm sorry. They start the second half with the ball, fumble. Clemson goes down and scores. Notre Dame fumbles the ensuing kickoff. And yet, at the end of that game, Notre Dame has an, a two. There's a two point conversion attempt away from tying against yeah. the eventual national runners up. But yeah, Notre Dame lacked talent. Sure, okay. Yeah, it's the players. It's definitely the players. Yeah, sure. sure. Whatever you say. That that was uh, when Procise had that long touchdown near the end of that game, right? To kind yeah. of get him back into it. Uh, yeah. It was uh, yeah, it's a wheel route. Yeah, fifty five yard yeah. wheel route. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention. Chris Brown fumbles inside the 10 yard line. I mean, come it's on. An ugly, it was an ugly game and yeah. they still should have won. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's just the, the point black. Or, or at least had a chance to win. Like they, yeah, they, they yep. killed themselves that game. That was a yep. self indicted game against Clemson that year. Yeah, that was frustrating. Very frustrating. 
Wade Garrett with a super chat. Thank you, Wade. Wade says, since 1902, Ohio State has never lost when scoring more than 35 points. It changes next weekend. 41-40, Notre Dame on a game-winning Buckner drive. Let's go. I mean, yeah, I mean, not a lot of teams aren't going to lose if you score more than 35 points. I like how he says more than 35 because they did score 35 against Clemson in the Orange Bowl in 2013 and lost. Mm-hmm. But, yes, uh, if Notre Dame if Notre Dame gives up more than 35 and wins, I'll be shocked, pleasantly so. And yep. I'll tell you what, that's going to make for a really entertaining game. Talking about like just one of the most fun games ever if you're a person who likes offense anyway. If you're a defensive that's, person, you're going to be just like miserable, want to pull your hair out. That that's it. That's an instant classic game, man. That'll be on oh, yeah. uh, you know, ESPN whatever for years and years. Well, it depends on who wins. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, if it, well, it actually, before, it may, I mean, it may actually be now because ESPN's probably a little bit in their feelings about losing the Big Ten to, uh, uh, to, to Fox and NBC and Sport and CBS. So they may, they may want to play some more. They may show a little bit more love to Notre Dame than they have in the past. But yeah, it would instant classic, Ryan. At least yeah. for Notre Dame fans. I mean, I imagine Notre. Dame, how many times do you think Notre Dame fans would rewatch that game during the season if Notre Dame wins that game? Oh, if if Notre Dame beats Ohio State, I'm gonna watch it at least ten times before the next week. So yeah, yeah. and you're on the low end of what I think most Notre Dame fans. Will be. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I mean maybe ten times in the next. I know my buddy Jason will watch it ten times before the next game. I'm just fact, fact. I mean he will, he will. There's I'm, no. I'm gonna watch it for um, one time for every Brian Kelly outburst on the sideline that we've seen over the years. So what's that like thirty seven ish? Uh, say that again. <laughs> I said, I said, I'm going to watch one time for every Brian Kelly outburst that he had on the sideline during his tenure. Oh God. Are you, are you going to have enough time to, to, to watch, do anything else other than that? I mean, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot. That's a lot of outbursts mm-hmm. that, yeah, it's a lot of outbursts. We've got Patrick McC- McGrain with the super chat. Is Keon hundred percent done with Notre Dame? Can Buckner be Mary Otis? So that's two questions. We'll answer the first one there. Uh, no, he's not done with Notre Dame. He's still considering Notre Dame. Notre Dame has moved on, but the, uh, Keon also knows. Uh, I'm 100% positive he has been told that if he wants to be at Notre Dame, he knows their number. He knows he can call, and they would welcome him back with open arms, but they have to go prepare for what they got to do. I mean, it's about them. Hey, you know, cause here, here's the reason why, and, 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 and I think a case can be made for people that like it, don't like it, and I think it's a fair argument to be made on both sides. I really don't. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, but if you're Notre Dame, you're like, look, there's nothing else. We did everything. We threw everything at Keon. We had him committed for over a year. We did everything that we could do, and he just decided he didn't want to be here, and for you know all the reasons he decided he want, didn't want to be here, and so – do you still keep begging him to come when he's made it very clear that, you know, they told him don't decommit. If you decommit, you're telling us you don't want to be here anymore. He could have gone on visits and stayed committed. They would have started recruiting other players because that's just their policy, but they did not force him to decommit. Keon decided he wanted to decommit. So that was Notre Dame's sign that, okay, Keon doesn't want to be here anymore. And, you know, and I don't, I think Keon loves Notre Dame and I, and, and I, I, I love Keon. I think he's a great kid. I really do. And I, and I know a lot of Notre Dame fans aren't feeling him right now because of his decision, but, I got nothing but love for Keon. I still remember that excited 15-year-old kid that jumped in our chat, you know, when he committed Notre Dame, right? And I I I always like Keon. But he knows he's got a he's got an open door, but he Notre Dame also needs to go do what they're going to do cuz Ryan, if you're if you're a kid that's being recruited by Notre Dame at Viper, you know, Caleb Herring, Shandavian Brad, I mean, pick a guy that everybody wants Notre Dame to go after and they know you're still trying to recruit Keon, you have no chance with them. For and sure. so then you end up still not getting Keon because he made it very clear he doesn't want to come to Notre Dame. And now you're not going to get those kids. You know, I mean, you, you, they had to do it, in my opinion. I, I don't like it. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a fight to the end kind of guy. But I also understand they need a Viper. And if they stay on Keon, they're not only going to not get him, at least as of right now, but then they, they, they decrease their chances that they get a kid that's even in the same universe as Keon Keeley. And right. there aren't many. Right. There aren't well, many. And, and that 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 is that is the the – that that's the that's the the potential downside is that like if you are just you know putting it out there that like yes I, well, Keon Keeley's still our guy Keon Keeley's still our guy then I mean Brian people just got upset about a high upside three star that just get committed to Notre Dame if you get someone that's in a similar ballpark to that as your viper in the class nobody in Notre Dame fans are going to be happy about that situation right because agree. at the end of the day it's right. going to be a downgrade in their minds so it's and just, to, and look. 
anyone they get at Viper not named Keon Keeley is a downgrade. I mean, For sure. If they got Damon Wilson, who I rank as a top 20 player in this class, it's a downgrade. Mm-hmm. Keon is my number one ranked player in the country, which means if you sign the number two player in the country, it's a downgrade from Keon Keeley. Sure. It, it, it just, they got to find a kid that can play. And the more that they beg Keon, then the more it's going to be, well, I don't want to go there. I'm clearly a second option to them even now because they still want Keon. Why would I waste my time with Notre Dame? What if Keon decides in two months he wants to go back to Notre Dame? Then I then I've wasted all this time on Notre Dame. It's a decision they had to make. Keon knows if you want to come back to Notre Dame, it's up to you. We did everything we could to show you the love. We got on you before Bama, way before Bama did. They came on late. You decided you want to take that path. I think it's an easier path for him. I do. And some of the things that, that I've been told about, you know, why he made the decision, and I'm not talking about from Notre Dame. Notre Dame hasn't told me why he made the decision. I haven't talked to them about why he made the decision. I'm talking about from his side about why he made the decision. I think he was looking for an easier path. And it's not nothing about football per se. So I just, I think it's a choice he made. I got, I mean, he's allowed to make that decision. I, it's not an insult, a criticism, anything. I, I, like I said, I got nothing but love for Keon Keeley. I think he made the wrong decision. I think as a young man, I think he fits in way better at Notre Dame than at Alabama. But I think some people around him have convinced him that that's not accurate. And I think that's the disappointing thing for me. He is about as much of a Notre Dame kid as you're going to find in the state of Florida, in my opinion. But unfortunately, a lot of other people have convinced him that that the easier path is the better path. And I just I'm bummed that he eventually kind of made that choice. It was his choice. I mean, Keon, right. Keon cho- like I've talked on the message board. I won't say it publicly, but I've talked on the message board about some of the influences in there. But at the end of the day, Keon made the choice. Do I think he was influenced in that direction? Sure. But it was ultimately yeah. Keon's choice. Right. And, you know, he's a six foot six, 230 pound, 17 year old who knows what he wants at this point in time, you know, and I hope that he wakes up someday and realizes like, man, I had a chance to talk about earlier. I had a chance to blaze my own trail. I had a chance to go be a legend at Notre Dame, a legend at Notre Dame, a leader, a guy that is the if if Notre Dame wins a title in the next five years, we're going to look back and point to Keon Keeley if he would have stayed as being like, you know, that's the guy that, that you know, he he helped build that recruiting class. He helped keep it together. He went there as a great player, and, and and you're a legend. I mean, think about how Notre Dame fans feel about Chris Zorich and Bryant Young and, and guys like that. I mean, I know Notre Dame fans still talking about, about Jim uh, uh, Ross Browner, you know, who, mm-hmm. who won two titles in Notre Dame. You know, at Alabama, it's, oh, he's one of however many, you know, and that's just the reality of it. But that's the path he chose, and it's his choice, and I respect it. I don't like it. I don't have to like it to respect it and and still respect him. I don't have to agree with everything he does to still think he's a great kid. And well, that, that's just that's how that's I am. the that's the separation for me is that you again, like you said, you don't have to agree with it, but you have to accept it. And and you know, like it's it's just it's it's a frustrating thing to me because I've just I have seen a lot of people talk about him as a person and his character and just kind of right. taking shots at him. I'm just like. Guys, like there's yeah. we, we need to differentiate our feelings from respect, right? right? Like he's he's a Keon Keely he's is, a bad I, kid for flipping away from Notre Dame, right. but the kids that flip to Notre Dame are just making a smart decision that's best right. for their future. Is right. it, that's basically what we're hearing from Notre Dame fans, and that's unfortunate, right? And again, I don't like it and agree with it, but to your point, right? To to and I don't think I don't think it's people in our chat. I really don't. No, and, no, and no. some of the people bashing him on Twitter are not Notre Dame fans. I mean. Sure. So, so some person sitting at home who's never been on Twitter before creates an account in August of 2022 to go bash Keon Keeley on Twitter. No, that's an Alabama fan who created an account to make Notre Dame fans look bad. But there are also legitimate Notre Dame fans that have done that, and that's the disappointing thing. But it yes. is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it. I just wish these, and I've said this to some recruits, those people on Twitter are not do not speak for the vast majority of Notre Dame fans. And, but that, I mean, that's, but that's the world we live in, right? I mean, it's the, the vocal mon- minority is the ones that basically set the agenda for what people are going to perceive to be about, whether it's a political party or a fan base or whatever the case may be. That's just the reality of it. Sean asked with a super, oh, the second part of that question, Ryan, what was the second part of that question? I, I went away oh, from it was, it. It was about if um, it was a comparison, who was it? It was. Tyler Buckner to Marcus Mariota. Marcus Mariota. Yeah. Yep. What do you think about that? 
I mean, completely different body types. I, I, I actually do like the comparison from just being a dual threat. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think they are similar athletes. Marcus Mariota was like a four five something type of athlete. Like he was a pretty, and he had some, he wasn't like, I don't think he's a tough as runner as Tyler Buckner, but like there was some physicality to him as a runner. Very he wasn't productive. Just, yeah. Oh, incredibly productive. And I mean, Oregon with how they ran the, the zone read with him was just incredible, right? Like, I mean, he was a, a weapon in the pass in the run game and he was a good passer too. I mean, in college anyway, so I don't hate the comp. It's just the body types I think are kind of throwing me off a little bit. Like Tyler's probably as heavy as Marcus ever was in college, but Marcus was three inches taller. You know what I mean? Like it was just it was a completely different body type. From an ability to impact the game standpoint, I, I'm fine with it. You know, I mean, he'll never put up the numbers that Mariota put up because he doesn't play in the Pac-12 and he plays in a different system. I mean, the, the numbers Mariota put up that year were just ridiculous. 4,400 passing yards. He basically kind of put up similar numbers to what Tyler did in high school as a quarterback, passing-wise, at least numbers-wise. 42 touchdowns, four picks, 770 rushing yards, 15 touchdowns. I mean, those are – oh, and he caught a 26-yard touchdown pass that year. Do you remember that? So, uh, you know, will, will Tyler ever put up numbers like that? No. Can Tyler impact the game in a similar way that Marcus Mariota did? That's where I think the comp makes a lot of sense for me. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense there. Mariota was a great player at Oregon, man. He was a great, great, great player. So if, uh, if Tyler's uh, even close to that, I'll be like, cool, man. <laughs> that works. Th this is going to be an unpopular opinion, and, and, and I, I don't mean it how it sounds, but I, I, think, I think Mariota was a product of a system to a degree. He was the perfect player for that system, but I, I never felt like he was a natural passer. It was a, a, a – the reads weren't overly complex. It was kind of one, two, check down or run. It wasn't a real intricate, you know, re, full field read offense. Tyler's going to have to do a lot more of that. And I so I think that that is, that is where I think Marcus was somewhat not as prepared for the NFL is in that regard. But even before he got hurt, he was he – was, decent NFL quarterback I thought early in his tenure you know he just yeah, he was okay he wasn't he's, a guy he's that very he's very mechanical mm -hmm. like everything just kind of seems forced as a passer you know what I mean like nothing just, which is, just there's no naturalness to him as which passer, is which opinion. is where the the what I'm referring to the system comes from Ryan because when you know yeah. I got one or two reads it's you get in your rhythm you make your throw when you've got to go through reads I mean the NFL your first read isn't often there rarely is there you know and, and it's about can you get your feet to where then make that quick throw to that number two guy. And, and you said he's not a guy that can go off of that first read and and have his feet set and quickly get that ball out, throw off platform, do all those type of things as clean and crisp as NFL quarterbacks need to be. And that's what I mean by he was kind of a system guy in that mm -hmm. the system maybe protected some of the deficiencies that he had that you couldn't expose in college, but that you could expose in the NFL. And I, I think they got a little bit exposed in the championship game, but even then, Marcos was pretty good in that game. I mean, he ripped off some yeah. big some big plays. He just didn't have the supporting cast that Ohio State had around him, especially on on defense. You know that Oregon had no chance of stopping Ezekiel Elliott that day. None. You you know what was really weird about Marcus Mariota, Brian, for a guy that's a dual threat and a really athletic kid. I thought he kind of struggled like changing platforms and throwing on the move and doing all that type of stuff. Like he was a very odd player like he had like that kind of over top release and I felt like the only time he was functional as a passer was in the pocket just kind of hitting his drops consistently like he was not good off script which is kind of weird for a guy that was that athletic as a like, passer a big, you're yeah. saying right yes. like he wasn't yes. good off script as a passer. Throw on yeah. the run change arm angles like he just but, wasn't good but at it, it goes back to what you're saying he's not what I, you say mechanical what I view that as he's not a natural thrower that's how I view it he's not a natural thrower He's an athlete that, you know, kind of learned how to play quarterback. He's not a natural – like, Tyler is a natural thrower. Right. Kyler Murray was a natural – yes, he was a great athlete, but he was a natural thrower of the football. Yep. Uh, I think Lamar Jackson, to a degree, has a natural throwing motion, and I've made oh, this yeah. case before. I he's I just – I think the problem with Lamar is that he's just not being used. They haven't, they haven't taken the – invested in developing – his uh, throwing ability. And part of me wonders if it's because of, they saw what happened to Robert Griffith, the third, I think the difference is, is they went too far to an extreme with Robert Griffith, the third it, Griffin, the third, excuse me. It, and it, the injury that he had forced them to kind of go too far in the direction of away from running. I think they need to get kind of back to, you know, let that kid be a thrower that then uses his legs to, to be dynamic and you can still run them. 
yeah. just you know make it be more of a, a, a pro style offense and so i'd like to see baltimore do that i've, I've seen some all 22 of baltimore with lamar because i'm like why is he not getting better i really thought he was going to be a good quarterback and when i watched it, i'm like dude what are they they're like running a college offense last year was and, bad man they they um they have a different quarterback i mean a different offensive coordinator now right they, they had um what's his name that was running it but i forget his name now but hopefully, hopefully it's somebody different We'll you're see. talking about uh i know it was, was it greg uh it wasn't greg yes Knapp. greg great no not greg Knapp. it was um i'm gonna i'm looking up right here uh yeah. see who their their offensive coordinator was greg roman that's who roman greg roman yep yeah so he was there in 2020 he was there last year their offensive court doesn't say their offensive coordinator was he their offensive coordinator last year he was their offensive coordinator okay. last year. i'm yep. looking at it down here so he is yeah he was still their offensive coordinator last year and then now this year their offensive coordinator is, I will find it here. Offensive coordinator is still Greg Roman. Oh, that's so, a shame. Well, they, they changed their defensive coordinator. It used yeah. To be, uh, um, man, I'm yeah. losing my mind with all with these names right now, but he's with the New York Giants now. He was Who's their uh, defensive coordinator. Yeah, he was a defensive yeah. coordinator. For they hired Mike Lash, McDonald. Now he's, now he's the Giants. Yeah. yeah, and they hired Mike McDonald uh, from Michigan to replace him. But you're thinking of Don Martindale, Wink Martindale, right? Isn't Wink Martindale. Wink, was? yep. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting name. So, you know, uh, you know where Wink Martindale played college football? No idea. <laughs> he played it at Defiance. Did <laughs> where he? Where I coached. Nice. Yeah. I didn't coach when he was there. He's older than I am, but yeah, <laughs> he's an Ohio guy. I was gonna say, did you recruit him? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, he doesn't have the. He doesn't have. The he frame. may have recruited you. Yeah, seriously, seriously. <laughs> uh, also, Wink Martindale was a assistant coach at Notre Dame. 94 95 he was like an assistant not an assistant coach but he was like an assistant you know helper on that team yeah yeah very interesting 94 95 uh under lou holt so very very interesting background very interesting background all right let's get to some more questions here we have this question from sean s thank you for your super chat by the way sean am i expecting too much thinking xavier watts will have several hundred yards receiving and several tds this year if they play him no you're yeah. not it's just about well, it's about will they give him the opportunity? Look, if they play him, right, like play him, like let him be a part of the rotation. I fully expect him to have eighteen to twenty-five catches for two hundred and seventy-five to three hundred yards. Fully expect that, and two three touchdowns if they play him. That's the you know minimum. I I think Xavier Watts is a really good football player, so it's just about whether or not they play him, Ryan. Right? It's just about the opportunity. Or do they go with, you know, Joe Wilkins once he's healthy all the time? Or, you know, I mean, what you know, what are they going to do? If they play him, he'll produce. I fully believe that. Sean, I need you to get your your time machine out. Go to the end of the season. Send me how many snaps Xavier Watts Xavier Watts played at receiver this year, and I will answer this question for you, sir. It's just to Brian's point. I think it's about volume. It's about opportunity. It's about how many reps is he going to get wide receiver? Are they going to play him at both safety and wide receiver consistently? Are there going to be games where it's more of a focus offensively or more focused defensively? Like I think there's just a lot of questions to answer. Just about what mm -hmm. are the opportunity for him? Yeah. That's uh, absolutely correct in that. Um, I don't know what this means. Uh, Chief Brody said, Ryan just look, uh, looks just like Bob from Top Gun Maverick. Do you remember the Still character haven't Bob? Seen it. He was the Still really smart guy. It. Yeah, he mm -hmm. wore glasses. But uh, you haven't seen it yet? I saw. I told you the other day I haven't seen it yet. Though. But I thought you were going to correct that mistake, Ryan. I mean, you got to see it in the theaters, man. I'm telling you. you when see I get some theaters. time, I mean. I'll, I'll okay, I, okay Ryan, I'm releasing you from whatever <laughs> duties you may have tomorrow. Okay, to go out and watch Top Gun Maverick. All right, I'm supposed so, to go to. I'm supposed to go to a young man's, uh, you, young you child's said birthday in the morning. party tomorrow. Okay, but... last I checked, movie theaters are open all day. Okay, so we're can, gonna do a you, show Sunday can night. You pay for a babysitter. Yeah, for me? yeah, I, I pay you a lot. You can use some of that to go to get a babysitter. <laughs> so yes, uh, but uh, great, great movie, man. It was. It's one of those ones, Ryan. I keep telling you. You're going to want to see the first and the third. There's the action, the sound. It's just, you're, it's definitely a move, first time movie theater situation. You're going to have to, you're going to have to do okay. it. Man. Just, well, I'm going to, I'm going to put my Venmo in the chat if someone yes. wants to pay for my movie tomorrow. Man, you can pay. Get, see, now you're making <laughs> people think I don't pay you. Come on, man. You, I know you got, I know you can afford to go to the dang movies. I know cost of living in Jersey is expensive, but come on now. If, if know, anybody could verify that I could afford it, it's you. Okay. So okay. that's very true. Yeah. There you go. 
Terry Blair with a super chat. Thank you, Terry. We're going to tell you all the rest of these super chats today are going to the Ryan Roberts uh, Top Gun Maverick movie fund. Okay. Uh, Terry Blair with a super chat. Can you explain the differences in the practice and preparation between Coach Freeman and BK? Uh, They seem to be a step behind in those big games with BK. Uh, so I, I want to say this, Terry, number one, my what I'm telling you is from things I've been told, things I have heard. Ryan has been at some of these practices. Uh, obviously, I have not been in any practices. I've seen some video from the practices. You know, Vince and the guys will take video of the periods that they're at. But just talking to different people, it's tempo is a lot quicker. Uh, they're getting a lot more work done, a lot more volume. Notre Dame would stand around a lot when when Brian Kelly was at Notre Dame. And so that's a big part of it, Ryan. The other part is I think there's a lot more competition, right? You're seeing more periods early on where it's like, let's get after it. Let's do something to compete. It's it's creating more of a every day is a battle type of thing, right? It's it's challenge everything. It's just, you know, it's compete every day. It's just get after it. Take advantage of your opportunities that you have in front of you uh, are the different things that, that you're saying. So I think those aspects are different, but that's not why Brian Kelly's teams weren't ready in big games. If you talk to anyone around the Notre Dame program, the problem was the coaches would get super emotional and super tight in games, big week games. I mean, like super tight. We're like, I mean, just the energy around the place was like, you can't, you don't want to make a mistake because coach is going to crush you. You know what I mean? And you can't be that way. That's the opposite of what Lou Holtz had talked about. It's like, Hey man, they know what's at stake this weekend. Right? So let's go out there and mentally get them ready. So they don't, because if the players are going to naturally be a little tight to start that week, and it's your job as a coach to kind of, hey guys, one word about this, and and Kelly would say publicly that oh it's just another opponent. That is not how it went in practice and behind the scenes at all how it went. And this is coming from players throughout his tenure. You know, some of them have said it publicly, all of them say it privately. It just it was a really tense environment. So then as soon as something bad would happen in the game, it would just poof, snowball because they were already at that kind of that breaking point. And so I think that has more to do with it. We don't know how Marcus Freeman is going to be with that. You yeah. know, I mean, this next week is going to tell us. And so I, I, I thought the one positive for me was, is how loose they came out in that bowl game. That is the one thing that I took away from that. But I, even then I don't want to take too much of it because he had 15 practices at the point. Now it's his program. Does he change I mean, what is he going to change to say, we got to change some things to make sure we finish better than we did in that game, but then maintain the things and learn from the things that we felt went out of looking at from a coach standpoint that made us feel we could go out and, and, and play well that entire time. I think those are the, those are the things that they need to, to, to focus on and and learn from. Well, Brian, what do they say? Like a program is a direct reflection of the leadership, right? Of the coach. And I mean, if, if your leadership is tight and, you know, kind of just, you know, in their own minds, in their heads, right? Like psyching themselves out, then how is a team supposed to react? Like they learn those behaviors, right? Like, I mean, right. that's that's like teaching 101 is that you that you 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 show the behaviors that you want, you model the behaviors. Like that's the biggest thing, right? So, like I I mean, you played, I played, I'm, I know a lot of people in this chat have played football, just played sports in general. Like, we don't even have to just keep this at football. When you're tight, man, you just don't perform. You need to be loose. That's why people like, you know, plug their earbuds in and just kind of get in their groove before games, whatever your groove is. I mean, you you can't, you just can't play tight. It's not, it's, it's not the way to win. So, it's, yep. yep, yep, yep. I don't know oh. why you would change it. I mean, I understand that there's the importance of like a bigger game versus a game that you should definitely win. But like, why wouldn't you want it to be a consistent approach to a game? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's yeah. very flawed thinking in my opinion. Yep. Ryan Loftus has a question. He says, is CJ Carr's situation not allowed to be spoken of? I asked about him without start stating anything on my posts were taken down by on IB. Your posts weren't taken down. We already had three other posts about that. They were all merged into one. So that yeah. way, just because everybody had the same question, and I want everybody to be able to see the answers that I have given in those threads. So that's why it was merged, Ryan. It wasn't deleted. It wasn't posted down. The, the, the posts that were taken down yesterday about this subject were not because of the subject. It's because I've told people, don't post links. Don't post tweets from other Notre Dame writers and reporters. They don't allow our stuff on their sites, and we're going to be the same way. And it just it is what it is. So uh, it's yeah. a subject that is more than uh, able to talk about. As far as the situation, there is no situation. Like I, I'm going to keep saying this. It's it's what it's always been. Notre Dame wants CJ Carter reclassify. He knows they want him to reclassify. As of today, his plan is to stay in the 2024 class. Could that change moving forward? Yes, he's allowed to change his mind if he chooses to do so down the road. 
But as of today, as of last night, nothing has changed. That tweet that was sent out last night or that, you know, that Notre Dame clearly gave to people to put out is nothing different than all. They, they have been very clear with C that they'd like him to reclassify. They've also been very clear with CJ that they will support whatever decision he does make. They're not mm -hmm. pushing him from a coercion standpoint. They're letting him know, yeah, we'd love for you to reclassify. But as of right now, CJ's plan is to focus on this season and stay in the 2024 class. That could change some point down the road. So there is no situation that's changed. It's just it's now being talked about more because of the tweet from last night. And But nothing is new. Nothing has changed other than – you know, CJ is still engaging in those conversations. I, you know, I, it, it, but it's, he hasn't changed his mind. Those conversations have been going on. It's it, not frequently because they don't want to push the kid, but right now CJ's com CJ's focus yesterday was on trying to beat Hudsonville, not yeah. whether or not he is or isn't going to classify, reclassify. And so what I don't want this to turn into is a thing where we just constantly rehash this every single week, right? That's the situation. Notre Dame wants him to reclassify. They'll support whatever he chooses to do. Right now, he's focused on being in the 24 class, but hasn't shut down the door to be to reclassification. Right, that's where we're at. And if that changes, I promise you, I'll let you know. It, that's why you need to be on the message board. But there is no situation beyond that. Okay, so, yeah. um, but I don't mind talking about it, Ryan. It's just what was happening yesterday was like we were just had like five people, like five, six different posts, and so I didn't delete them, but we have the option to merge threads in to together. So they're mm -hmm. kind of all in the same thing. So that's what happened with your post. It is your tweet. Is, your post is still there. It's just in that. And I think the title is like interesting pick. I think is the title of the thread that your 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 post now exists because it was it talked about the very topic that you were asking about. So uh, we did address the CJ Carr situation. And Ryan, I know you're on the board, so you'll find out. But if anything changes on that end or any new information comes sure. out. The first people that will know are boards that Irish breakdown.com. So just right. keep locked in there. Brian, I know you right. are, but if anybody else is interested in that conversation, feel free right. to join the message board today. Right. So, I mean, again, like that's where we're at and you know, it's going to keep getting rehashed every time something like this happens and that's fine. And I have no problem talking about CJ reclassifying what all my only issue is, is it's like eight, nine and it's a, well, you know, I, I'm not on the boards 24 seven. That's cool. But just spend 60 seconds just browsing the board to see if it's already on there or not. That's all I ask. And don't like, because there was one day there was like literally five posts in a row of people posting the same exact thing. It's like, guys, it literally taking you five seconds to look and see that. Just, you know, see if it's already there and then we'll talk about it there. And, and if it's something that I don't want you to talk about, I'll make a public statement. So like, that's what we did with Dante Moore. And we said, we're, we're not going to talk about Dante anymore. It's going to be in this one thread. We're not going to talk about Dante anymore. That was a unique situation. I don't have a problem talking about CJ reclassification. I just have a problem with people doing things that we've asked not be done on the board. And I don't think it was done in bad spirit. It's just I think people get excited sometimes and they, they want to share it. So what somebody else did is they just took the pick and then posted the pick. Oh, cool. It's still there. Right. And what it was is it was a car and then four and then a four jersey and then a 23 jersey. Right. As they're watching, the staff is watching CJ Carr playing. So, I mean, it was clearly a recruiting ploy and a pretty smart one. If you ask me, it was a, a shirt with a car on it and then a, a four Jersey and then a 23 Jersey. So I thought it was pretty, pretty ingenious, but that's just more of the same for Notre Dame and CJ Carr. So that's, that's where we're at. So hopefully that answers the question, uh, but I have no problem people. And people ask in that same thread, Ryan, I talk about my yeah. overall thoughts on reclassification. Uh, mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, I don't like reclassification, but why I also understand why Notre Dame wants CJ to do it and the merits sure. that there would be for CJ to do it. So I'm trying to take a, a both sides look at this of explaining the merits of both sides, uh, because at the end of the day, it's CJ's car's decision and whatever he and his family think is best for him is what they're going to do. And I'm good with either decision. I mean, if he reclassifies, it gives you a top 50 quarterback in your 2023 class. And and then yeah. now you can have time to regroup and figure out what you're going to do in 2024. If he doesn't reclassify, they're going to keep recruiting the kids on the board now that they like and, and try to close on one of them. But there's nothing new about what's going on. It's just the same old. Yeah. And, and could I say something real quick, Brian? I sure. don't know what the original conversation was in the chat, but – Someone, I think someone had said that CJ Carr threw four interceptions last night. Mm. I just wanted to kind of. Had four turnovers. Yes, right. he had four turnovers, two interceptions, two fumbles. 
me and Brian talked about it a little bit on the instant analysis. I thought CJ from a physical perspective looked pretty good, but yeah. we both agreed that just forcing a little too much. Yeah. Like there was just a couple of throws like, that you just one like, pick, you're he's a like little scrambling too around and then yeah. tries to launch it 40 yards into the end right. zone. And his receiver didn't make a great play on the ball, but it's just not a ball he should have thrown. I think one of the fumbles he was trying to scramble around, you know, just, I think he was just trying to do too much, which guys will yeah. do early in the year. But what I liked, I like to see quarterbacks suck sometimes to be completely honest with you and, and make, I don't say suck. He didn't suck last night, but I like to see quarterback struggle sometimes make mistakes because yes. that's when you really learn about the moxie, the attitude, the perseverance. Look, when everything's natural for a quarterback, Ryan, it's, it's easy to, for them to, to, Hey, we're rolling. I'm completing 80% of my passes. My team is killing somebody. I want to see how a kid handles when you are the reason that your team is losing right now because of your turnovers. What do you do? Well, you know what CJ did last night? So, okay, that's on me. I'm going to go make up for it, throw this bomb, and just drop a dime over my receiver's shoulder to go set us up. I'm going to lead us down on this, this go-ahead touchdown, and then I'm going to lead us again on another touchdown that puts this game away. And, yeah, my struggles, my turnovers are why we struggled to win last night, and I'm going to learn from that. But then does he bounce back and say, okay, but it's not going to make us lose because now I'm going to do what I need to do. I, I like it when quarterbacks are put in those situations because you learn a lot about a kid mentally – when he comes out, and, and I think what three of them were in the first half, I believe. I think so. If yeah. I remember correctly, yeah. And and so I, I, you learn a lot about a kid when when he has those kind of issues. And we learned a lot about CJ Carl last night. His game is still evolving, and he, and and he's a kid that's got a little bit of moxie because Hudson feels a, 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 from what I understand, a pretty quality football team at that level. So yeah. Well, I'll say this. I mean, the positives are they won the football game. So ultimately, that's that's awesome. He still threw for 350 yards and like two touchdowns or something like that. So he still had some pretty good stats. And I'll say this. When he was staying within his in, within himself, and even when he was working out structure a little bit, Brian, I thought he looked more filled out, which was nice to see. I thought the ball came off his hand a little with a little more juice than you would you would anticipate from a kid going from sophomore to junior year. I think I thought there was just natural maturation from an arm strength perspective. And I thought when he was on schedule and he was crisp, I thought he could put the ball wherever he wanted, if I'm being honest. Like I thought the ball placement was generally very good. To your point, just pressing a little too hard at some points. Cause I mean, he is really good. He knows it. Yeah. And you know, he's well, he was trying to win the game on, on yeah. a single throw sometimes yeah. last night. Yeah, and that's part of the learning process. Hey, Ryan, before we move on to the next question, there's a, a super chat from Mark Stewart at 205 that is not – it's showing up at the top for me, but it's not showing up in there, so I can't star it. Can you see it? It's at the 205 mark. Can you see if you can find that and star that so we can bring that up uh, in, in the chat at some point in time uh, here moving forward? So I want to – I mean, I, I can see it to where I can read it, but uh, – I got it. Did you were you able to start it? Yep, it's okay. Cool. So we'll get to that here in a second, Mark. So I, I appreciate that, buddy. Uh, Sean S says, If you had to bet, how many players on the current roster go first round in the next NFL draft? Jordan Reed had one out today, right? He had two. Yeah, um, we've seen up to four different guys go round one in different mocks. How, where, where would you project it right now? I, I think two is a really safe number if I'm being like, I. I would be surprised at this point, unless something catastrophic happened, that Michael Mayer and Isaiah Foskey were not first round picks next year. I think that that's a, the safe players to bet on. Then after that, it's Brandon Joseph, Cam Hart, and Jared Patterson. Like those are the next three guys that you can kind of talk about in that vein. I'll say two to three right now, but I do think that there's four potentially that could go in the first round. Like I think Notre Dame's going to have a one of the better NFL drafts um, cycles they've had in a long time, man. Like they, they got some dudes in this year's class, but I, I think Jordan's playing it pretty safe and I respect it. I think two to three is the number. It's really dependent yeah. on Cam Hart taking a big step. Is he the third guy? Brandon Joseph getting back more to 2020 version. He could potentially sneak into the first and Jared Patterson staying healthy and right. you know, kind of taking his game to the next level. So there's three if wild cards, but I think Foskey and Mayer are the pretty safe bets right now. If he has another, if he misses games this year, I think that almost is assuredly is going to knock Jared Patterson out of the first round because he's missed a few games. Yeah, I mean, he, and he's been hurt. He had the pectoral injury from this off season. He missed games in 2020. Yep, he needs to he needs to be healthy, in my opinion. And just real quick, Josh P said, "Okay, so so Notre Dame does want him to reclassify." Interesting. Yeah, Josh, we've said this all along. I mean, this is not a new fact. We've talked. Notre Dame has always wanted him to reclassify. That's that's not new. TJ doesn't want to reclassify as of right now. 
his focus is on 2024. That's from CJ's own words. I mean, he he doesn't want to reclassify right now, but he has not shut it down. And here's the interesting thing that, that he told me. He has already done what he would need to do. He's on pace to graduate in, in a time that would allow him to reclassify. It's just he so he I mean, kind of just kind of says a lot about the kid. Hey, I don't want to do this right now, but I want to also be in position where if I change my mind, I've done the work I need to do. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of how you want a quarterback to be, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you want him to be in that point of view. But and and Notre Dame's not against reclassifying. The reason Notre Dame didn't take Braylon James reclassification is because they didn't have room. They didn't have the scholarship for him because of, of, you know, where they're at. They couldn't guarantee that they would be able to get down to 85. And they ended up getting down there. But at the time, they just couldn't they couldn't risk it uh, at that, you know. So, But it's a little different for next year. They're going to be in a better position next year to do that because then the, the, the scholarship they have allotted right now for quarterback in 2023 would go to him. So they've always wanted that, but there's a reason they're also recruiting other quarterbacks because they know that C.J. right now does not want to rec- reclassify. And they're not pressuring him to reclassify. Mm-hmm. There's, I think that needs to be very clear. They're, they've let it be known – where they stand and that they'd want them to do it, but it's not like a, there's no pressure. It's not like, Hey man, you know, if you don't do this, you're hurting us. Or if you don't do this, you're screwing us over. Or you're, you're going to, you know, we may have to go look to somebody to replace you. None of that is happening. It's not a pressure thing. It's just like, look, man, here's why we want you. Right. Here's why we think you play for us. Here's why, you know, get an extra year of eligibility. Right. Or not extra an extra start, you know? So mm-hmm. the, the, if he does come in 23, it's not to beat out Tyler Buckner. It's to, learn for a year, and then in 2024, you can push Tyler, but either A, Tyler goes pro early mm-hmm. and, and you step in, or that now you're now spending your what would be your freshman year kind of backing Tyler up and being ready to step in if Tyler gets hurt. Right. And that would be that would be kind of the, the plan for him. And then if he doesn't start in 2024, the kid still has three years of eligibility left. Mm-hmm. And, and it would make him a fifth-year player it's a lot more likely that CJ Carr is a fifth year player at Notre Dame if he enrolls early. Like, I don't mean enrolls early. Let me rephrase that. Reclassifies. You have a much mm-hmm. better shot of having him be a fifth year if he reclassifies than you do if he stays on track. Because a kid like him, who's going to be 18 years old as a senior, is going to, is the odds of him staying for five years if he's starting as a redshirt freshman, because then he would, he would redshirt as a freshman at 24, assuming Tyler doesn't get hurt. He would play four games and then, and then save a year and then, you know, have four years left. The odds of him playing those final four years are, are not great if he's as good as you think he's going to be. So you have a much better shot of having him in your system for five years if he reclassifies. Would you agree with that, Ryan? Yep. No, I, I think I think you hit pretty much every layer of it, Brian. I would say for the people on, I mean, in the chat and just general Notre Dame fans. You all love the numbers so much from recruiting side of things. And if, if TJ Carr does reclassify, then Notre Dame gets a nice little bump in 2023, huge bump. but yeah, huge bump yeah. to have a top 50 quarterback and wherever he would end up in that class. So we'll see what happens, man. I, I again, I, I am, I'm kind of with Brian in the same wavelength of reclassification for, for any player, honestly, but for CJ specifically, I, I don't think that you should rush it, but, Ultimately, that's not my decision, and yeah. I don't fault Notre Dame for pushing sure. for that because sure. it makes sense from their side. It really does. And here's the difference between his situation and what we've seen some other kids reclassifying, like Tony Grimes. They brought Tony Grimes into play as a freshman. They're not bringing in C.J. Carr to play in 2023. This is a forward-thinking move in a lot of ways. That is one difference where I'm a little bit more open to it then I would have been if it was like, hey, Tyler's not panning out. We're going to bring a CJ in a year early to compete for the starting job. No, no. Look, I, like, I think that hurt JT Daniels. I, I do. I don't think JT ever recovered. He was not mature enough to handle that spotlight as an 18-year-old. I don't think he was. In, in USC. And too. I wouldn't have been. That's yeah. not an insult of JT Daniels. I mean, f- I mean, I wouldn't have been prepared to handle that at 18 years old. I mean, so I'm not 90% of people would not have been No, it's probably higher. (laughs) Like, yeah. yeah. Right. And you lost a whole year of development as a high school kid and a young man. And that's a great program. I mean, he could have benefited from another year with coach Rollison just growing up as a young man, you know? So, but this situation is different. They're not bringing now. Could CJ be thrust in the starting lineup potentially, but that's not why they're bringing him in. 
uh, at this point in time. So uh, we, Ryan from Alan Watson, we do have a Ryan Roberts Top Gun fund. So that right there, Ryan, is enough at least to, to get to the movie. So now we got to get the baby. Yeah, and all the money the- we've gotten so far in Super Chats, there's enough money for the for the babysitter. I think, I think so. I- Alan, that, that'll cover the gas to the movie. The actual ticket's yeah. probably more like 12, yeah, 13 Gas bucks, to the movie. But- that's you know, like a half gallon. a gallon in Jersey, buddy. <laughs> uh, we have asked people in this chat not to spread rumors. So uh, our Ohio State fans in here is trying to start problems spreading rumors. He says, confirmed, Brian only pays Ryan in Mountain Dew. That is false. I don't appreciate those allegations. I pay myself in Mountain Dew. I don't pay other people in Mountain Dew. <laughs> so that is not accurate. Uh, we d- we did have a question here. Uh, we're kind of speaking of your your movie thing. We are kind of having some fun with this, but there actually was a question about it. Robert Bishop said, "Is Maverick really that good?" I intentionally skipped it uh, for because I uh, for, for uh, skipped it for Thor because I figured it would suck like all Tom Cruise movies. Uh, I heard Thor, Thor was so bad. Uh, Thor was so bad. <laughs> let me let me say this. I am not a Top Gun. I am not a Tom Cruise fan. I'm not. I didn't like the Jack Reachers because he it was just unbelievable character. I've I haven't watched any of the Mission Impossible since like the first two. I'm not a Tom Cruise guy. I'm just not. I loved Top Gun and I loved Top Gun Maverick because it was very well done. And it wasn't the overacting Tom Cruise, I felt. I, I thought the the writing was good, uh, how they kind of played out Val Kilmer's uh, Ice ISIS, you know arc i won't say it because it gives away some things but I, I thought it was phenomenal and and again i'm not a tom cruise guy at all i think he's weird i think he's an over actor i think he you know i just I, his a lot of his characters aren't believable i respect the fact he does his own stunts that's pretty cool uh for the most part but i'm not a tom cruise fan but this was a phenomenal phenomenal movie and does he, he does he does all his stunts still a lot of them yeah Wow, like on one crazy. of the Mission Impossible, he broke his ankle jumping from one building to the next. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, he does a lot of that stuff. But I'm I'm not um, I, I I'm not one of the pro Tom Cruise people. I don't think he's a great actor. I think he's been in some great movies, but uh, that this one was excellent. I really feel like this one was excellent. And I don't like I said I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Vision Post said, I enjoyed the Reacher series on Amazon Prime. That was excellent. If you like the Reacher either, if you like the, if you like series on TV, like I watched uh, Terminal List, which Mm -hmm. was excellent with, with, uh, what's the, I get all the Chris's combined. It's Chris Pine. It's not Chris Pine. It's uh, Chris Pratt was in it. It was really, really well done. But the Reacher series on Amazon is much more true to the, the original, the character in the books. I thought it was really, really, really well done. So really, really well done. The only, so. the only thing we, we started watching was uh, House of the Dragon, the uh, Game of Thrones spinoff. Okay. So we started that last week. I've never, I've watched like the first four or five series uh, shows of Game of Thrones, and I was like, okay, that's not for me. But I've heard you got to keep. My dad told me that he's like, you got to try it again. Like just keep watching it. The first, it takes a while to get going, but once it gets going, the it's first. Really good. Yeah, once you get in the groove, the first six seasons of Game of Thrones is fantastic, yeah. and then the last two seasons just very terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chief Brody well, said J- Tom Cruise they, they is the Jim Hart books, Brian, and then yeah. they, then they just had to end it after. The oh, books so they went past time. the books. Oh, yes. that never that rarely goes well. I say never rarely goes well. Uh, uh-huh. Chief Brody said Tom Cruise is the Jim Harbaugh of actors, but he was amazing in Maverick. Yeah, I I, I agree. It was really well done, really well done. Uh, I I. I said, Ryan, you, you gotta, you gotta see it, man. It's definitely, definitely worth it. Yeah. Hulk Strong has said, if uh, Notre Dame were to land Sam Lepemba, could he play Viper? Yes, definitely could. <laughs> definitely could. There's no question. He could probably uh, play four or five positions in the front yeah. seven. So, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Ed said he got a chance to watch Peyton Bowen up close last night on TV here in Dallas. He is definitely as good as advertised. He had a pick six and everything. Ryan, you and I talked about this. There were some technical improvements that he needed to make as a defensive back, but if he did, that's the only thing that kept him from five-star status. We saw some of those technical improvements during the summer at the seven-on-seven things. You saw him a little bit last night. So, yes, I fully expect having him as a five-star by – when I do a regrade of this class he's, at the end of the season, Brian, he's one of those kids that I think he could literally play any position in the secondary. Like yeah. I think he could play corner. Absolutely. He yeah. could definitely play nickel. Cause the most impressive thing I saw about him last night on that interception was 
the closing burst that he oh my has gosh. for a yeah. is unreal, man. Like the changing direction is just silly. He could easily play man to man coverage on yeah. on outside and inside receivers, like no doubt about it. He's he's a special athlete. Zach Martin with Super Chat. Thank you, Zach, very much. Uh, if Notre Dame can land Tayshawn Lyons outside of their in state rival, Washington State, has there been a bigger uh, stick in the let me see stick in their side than the Irish the last few cycles? Thorn in the side, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. let's go there. Um, I mean, they've really taken it to Washington. I mean, Washington went through several years where they were really hurting Notre Dame with kids. I mean, they were beating them for a lot of kids. I mean, the two corners that they had, I mean, Notre Dame really wanted Kyler Gordon. Mike Elko recruited yeah. him hard and couldn't beat Washington for him. I mean, Asa Turner, we remember him. There was Jalen McMillan. There's been a lot of those stories. Last few cycles, it really started with Jordan Patelho in the 2020 class. They beat uh, Washington for Jordan Patelho. But then, of course, you know, Chance Tucker recently they beat him for. Benjamin Morrison last year. And, of course, this year's class, they went out there and got Jade Lamar. You know, from the state of Washington. So, yeah, they've – and then Tayshawn Lyons was considered a strong lean to Washington. Now, uh, Notre Dame's got a close on him, but so far they've they've really made a lot of good progress. So, yeah, Notre Dame has really taken it to Washington. This is a big – you hate to say that about a first-year coach, but that's the – that's the. I mean, like LSU fans are on their feelings because I said LSU's a dumpster fire, as if, you know, Ed Orgeron left and all these players transferred just out of normal circumstances, right? Washington's also like that. I mean, Jimmy Lake left that place in a hot mess. Yes. And they are getting raided. That state is getting absolutely raided by everyone else that's not named Washington. I mean, think about, I mean, Eka, we talked about Ohio State, Emeka Ekbuka, Washington kid. Mm -hmm. I think, wasn't JT, mm -hmm. the defensive end? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. He's from Washington much. kid too. You yeah. had, they got the they got the one defensive end that was a five-star a couple years ago. But then they they lost Jaden Wayne to Miami. I was say Jaden Wayne transferred IMG. Yeah, but, he yeah. A, but yeah. he's a Washington yeah. kid, right? And yep. and you've got Jaden Lamar that Notre Dame just took. Tobias Merriweather in last year's class. Yeah, they have been a yeah. huge thorn in Washington side. Kalen DeBoer's got to get them back on track quickly if he's going to mm -hmm. stall some of that negative momentum with that program. Where, where did but, where did Notre Dame Brian out of because uh, I I don't remember the the. I don't remember where they liked him. Where do they like Asa Turner at? Because he's playing like Rover. a weird role. Rover. Like Rover. That's, see, yeah, that's one of the things. Yeah. Washington, Washington convinced like him roof, he was a safety. Man. It's like, nah. Yeah. Nah. Well, that's how they got him. They convinced him he was a safety and he wanted to play safety. And I don't know why, but yeah, that's what they had him playing. And, and it hasn't worked out for him at all. You know what I mean? But hey, he went here. He wanted to go. He's playing the position he wants to play. So. You know, more, I, more, I saw more his name on uh, I saw his name on the spring grades and he is like an undrafted spring grade. And yeah, yeah. it's just not, it has, not it a very good, good safety for them. It has been good. It has been good. Just your ordinary Joe. Thank you for your super chat, Joe. He goes, OK, here's to cover Ryan Snowcaps. Uh, he's, how unusual is it that XW could conceivably play both ways in the same game? That would be Xavier Watts. How unusual is it that Xavier Watts could conceivably play both ways in the same game? When was the last time um, last time a Notre Dame player did that? Does it happen much in college football these days? It doesn't happen much at all. You'll you'll get the occasional occasional kid, but it doesn't happen very often. I mean, you probably count the same the number of kids in one hand, maybe that that do it, other than just like an occasional thing. And usually, when it happens, Ryan, it's because I remember what was it, a few years ago Notre Dame had to play a kid both ways. I can't remember when it was, but it's been the last ten or fifteen years. It was because of injuries they had to put a kid out at uh, Tory. It was Tory Hunter. Remember they put Torrey Hunter corner one year and they had to play him at corner. Oh, really? It was like 14 or 15. That. Like it was, maybe it was like 14 or 16 or something. Like, can't remember what year it was, but there was they put Torrey Hunter at corner because they were so banged up. No, I think it was 2014. When they had all those injuries in 2014, I'm pretty sure they put Torrey, Torrey Hunter Jr. Torrey Hunter the third at corner uh because of it. But no, it, it just it doesn't happen often. It used to happen a decent amount, but it's never been prevalent in my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, you you know, it was more prominent way. I mean, way back even before my dad was following football. I mean, you just, sure you didn't. I don't think era had a ton of guys playing both ways. I mean, there were some, but there weren't a ton. Uh, it, it it definitely has changed a lot. There, Can we do a trivia question? A I have sure. a weird trivia question about this subject. Mm -hmm. Who is the last NFL player to start both ways in an NFL game? Uh, would it have been for, the kid, dude, the dude season. from the for, oh for a whole season? Would it be oh. uh, Troy Brown? Not Troy Brown. I don't know who that was. Chuck Benaric. Ch wow. Okay. You went yeah. back a long time. Okay. Sure did. Yeah. Wow. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, there's been some great, you know, Champ Bailey did it. 
Charles Woodson did it. Dion did Dion play a little receiver? Did Dion not play receiver at Florida State? He didn't do it until the NFL. Did he play receiver at all at Florida State? I think it was just an NFL thing. NFL. I could be wrong about that. That's pretty amazing. Pretty impressive. But yeah, you know, I mean, he, he also uh, he also lot. started at center field for a World Series team too. Sure, so, you know. sure, <laughs> sure. I could have seen Bo Jackson playing like Mike linebacker and running back, and you know, I mean, you just don't you just don't see it often. You don't see it often, and. uh I mean, yeah, so it's it's very unusual. Is it, you know, I, I don't, I think there's a reason for it because the game is so much more complex, you know, yeah. and requires such different technique where in high school you can play both ways because you're just the best athlete on the field and it's usually not very close. But even in high school, we don't see it a ton at the big schools. Like, you know, you don't see a lot of dudes at St. John Bosco and Modern Day and, you know, doing both ways. I mean, you have some, I mean, you know, the, the elite players do it. Pey- Peyton Bowen does it. Eli Bowen does it. Right. Kid do it. right. Yeah. But like, yeah. you don't see most kids don't do it. It's just usually those really freaky athletes that can just go out there and run by people. Right. But you know, you have to have a lot more precision in how you play the game on both sides of the ball in college. And that's why you just don't see it a ton. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Mark Stewart with a super chat. Thank you, Mark popcorn. See, now you got movie tickets. Now you got popcorn money from Mark. Is the best best path to victory trying to play physical and keep the ball away from Ohio State, even though it's not the way we probably want to play, or do we just play our game? I think they need. I am always a believer, Ryan, in play your game. Do you know why Michigan was able to do that against Ohio State last year? Because that's who Michigan was. Yeah. Because you know what, Michigan? Like, there's this perception that Michigan played keep away from Ohio State last year. They didn't. They took shots on Ohio State. They threw the ball down the field against Ohio State. And who was it? Cornelius Johnson that smoked Denzel Burke on the one bomb. Probably. And they took two other shots and they got pass interference penalties. Like Michigan played their game. Their game was just physical football. I mean, Oregon played their game. They didn't do anything to play keep away. They played their game and Ohio state couldn't stop them. So I think you need to play your game, but I think this team wants to be a physical running team that uses that to set up the throwing game. I think that's who Notre Dame wants to be Mark. So I don't think it's a, much of a transition to play keep away. I think the keep away may come as we've talked about before is like, this is an up-tempo game. Both teams are scoring a lot. And Al Golden's like, Hey guys, can you give me a, a couple extra minutes on this series? Okay, sure. We, we, we got you. You know, maybe you call it, maybe you start your next series and you call a timeout during the series or something like that. Or, you know, I mean, there's, you can send your offense out to start a series and then say, Hey, look, let the cl- play clock run down and then we'll call a timeout you know, and, and come back and, and, you know, maybe they'll go to another TV timeout or something. And that is how we can get our defense a little bit more time to make some adjustments and catch their breath. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, there's all types of different things that you can do. Ideally it's because you put a long drive together, but you can say, look, you know, you were snapping the ball at 15 every time now snap it at, snap it at five, you know, things like that on a particular series where you're trying to give your defense a breather, but you got to play your game. You're not going to beat Ohio State doing what you don't do or who mm-hmm. you aren't. The teams that have beat Ohio State beat them because they played their game better than Ohio State played their game. That That's how you beat great teams. Yes. You know, and, and that's what Ohio State did to Clemson in 2020. Right. That's what LSU did to Clemson in 2019. That's what Clemson did to Alabama in 2018 and 2016. We're going to play our game. And it's going to be better than you. And then yeah. we're going to, you know, and then what Dabo did was smart is Dabo built his team to beat Alabama. Mm-hmm. Like he just built his team that way. Cause he didn't need to build his team to beat North Carolina and those teams. It's like, Hey, let's, let's be the anti Alabama or, you know, so what, did, so what did they do to beat Alabama? They got big physical dominators in the trenches and speed on the perimeter. So they were able to kick Alabama's butt in the trenches with their defensive line, and then they had athletes on the perimeter that could run with them. Yep, that's what they did. And you know, like somebody who was at uh, Field Yates tweeted something out yesterday, like about how AJ Terrell is not a top hundred corner in the NFL, and how he could didn't believe that to be true. He, he can't. It's like they did the top hundred ranking. I don't think AJ Terrell was in it. He was saying something about that, and I don't know how good AJ Terrell is. But AJ my thing, Terrell is very good. Right. <laughs> very good. I don't, again, I can't speak that, but what I'm, my yeah. response was him being underrated started in college because that kid never made an all American list. And I, I, there weren't any corners that I thought were better than AJ Terrell his last year in college. But, you know, that's the kind of, I mean, you had Trayvon Mullen and AJ Terrell, two high level NFL draft picks as your corners. I mean, that's how you beat Bama. Well, 
You know, you know what was the problem with AJ Terrell is everybody got this preconceived motion after he got torched by Jamar Chase a few times yeah. in the in the in the playoff game that like he wasn't good, but it's just right. like guys, Jamar Chase did that to everyone right. that year. And like, some guys have player. bad games. Some guys yeah. have bad games. You know, and that's the other thing is is but that's the thing about corner we talked about yesterday, Ryan. Like you are out on an island and everybody sees when you get beat. But to your point, yes, Jamar Lamar and Jamar Chase is still doing that to people. <laughs> everyone he just so, has 40 yards as a rookie. right <laughs> like, right yeah. right yeah. all right oh, Arch so is trying to get me fired up in the chat man he talked about mac jones being in the top 100 yeah yeah yep. he was yeah. yep 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 anyway we've got some more questions up here lots of great questions today uh, guinea pig clips which 2023 recruits do you think will see the most improvement in their senior year and surprise some people would you take a couple cracks at that ryan I think Armel Mukum is a, is a great guy to pick. I mean, he's entering his second year playing football. I, he's an incredibly talented football player. He's only a three star recruit across every single platform, and I think there's going to be natural maturation, Brian. And if he's he seems like a very focused kid, and if he is as focused as I think he is, then the athletic traits, if his technique comes even close to where his athletic traits are, then I think he's going to be a big riser. And I think that he's the most natural one in this question for the most improvement because he just hasn't been playing very long. Right. Like that's right. the guy for me where it's just like, I think he's going to be so much better than last season. Like so much. Cause yep. literally hasn't played football. So. Yep. I mean, that's the easy one just because he's cut, he's got the furthest to go couple that I, I think Charles Jagasaw is going to see a big jump. I think Charles Jagasaw's high ranking right now is based off his potential. I don't know if his, if his ranking will improve. I mean, he can't go much higher than six on, on three. I mean, I don't know if his ranking will go up higher. It may even drop some because of the way, you know, there may be uncommitted guys that they need to bump up to create storylines and clicks. But I think yeah. Charles Jagasol now, year two after missing the COVID year, uh, year two of the new coaching system, I think Charles Jag and he spent a lot of time this offseason boosting his game up, Ryan. I think he's a kid that I could see making a big jump as a player this year. He's a guy that pops my I think Braylon James is another one. Yeah. You know, Braylon's put a lot of work on his craft this offseason. He was just an athletic kid in the past. He's put a lot of work into being a better route runner, catching the ball better. You know, his his hand technique as a catcher has never been great. It's it's fixable. So I think he has good hands, but he, his technique is not always good. It looked great yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just his timing as a passer, you know, where he was putting his hands. And, you know, it, some kids can have strong hands, but they don't catch the ball well because their technique, their timing – those type of things is there. There were things that I did as a coach. I mean, one of the things I did with my receivers was I would tell them to lay in your bed at night, turn all your lights off, don't have any TV on, and then once your eyes start to adjust to the football, start throwing the football up and catching it and, and trying to identify that, you know, focus on the tip, try to see if you can see the X because your eyes got to really lock in on the football. Even in, in the dark, when your eyes have adjusted to the dark, you got to really lock into the football because if you're not, it's going to hit you in the face and then throw it over to the left, go get it, throw it over to the right, go get it. There's all types of things you do to try to really work on not just hand eye coordination, right? But timing, right? You know, as a pass catcher. And so, and it has nothing to do with if you have strong hands or not. It's there's, there is a level of technique that comes to that. Some of it is natural, but when you got guys throwing heat the way that some of these college kids do, um, you know, it, it, it's a little harder to, to see that. So, yeah, it, it. I think he's another guy that I look at, and I think is 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 going to make a big jump this year. Elijah Page would be another one yeah. for me. I mean, physically, he's, he's. I think he's just an underrated player, just in general, even based upon his film from last season. But especially the, since he's, I mean, last time I talked to him a week ago, he was three hundred five pounds now, right? And if he's, if it's good weight and he's improved his core strength, then I mean, that was really the only thing absent in his game, in my opinion. Like he's a good athlete. He's got good technique. If he's stronger. I think he could be one of the better offensive tackles in the nation in the 2023 class. So I, I'm excited to see how he does this year for Pinnacle. Yeah, it's going to be. And I think the other side of the ball, I'm really curious to see what Micah Bell does this year as a corner. You know, I don't know if his ranking will go up, you know, but I, I really want to see his growth as a corner. He's another guy that I think has a chance to, to see a lot of improvement. And I'm not, when I think improvement, I'm, I'm more looking as players, you know, like, like a Don Schuler. I, Don Sewell is a pretty savvy, experienced, smart kid. I don't know if he'll make a ton of improvement beyond just another year older, stronger, more experienced. Sure. You know, like like some of those guys. But uh, another guy that I'm very curious to see what kind of improvement he makes this year is Bubakar Traore. Cool. I want to see what kind of growth he makes this year as a player. Uh, that's a very interesting one for me because he's another really raw kid with a lot of talent. 
And mm-hmm. I want to see what kind of growth he makes this year as a player. That's going to be really fascinating. Good question. Good. And That's another good. one here from Guinea Pig uh, Clips. Which receivers do you think will step up in the Ohio State game? Uh, Ryan, I don't know who's going to step up, but I know who needs to step up. They really need Braden Lindsey and Lorenzo Styles to play well in this game. They yes. need the guys that can stretch. They need to be able to stretch the field. If they can't beat Ohio State over the top a couple times, even if it's an incomplete pass where Ohio State's like, uh-oh, you know, we, we can't keep doing this because they're going to catch one of those. Uh, but, they, I mean, ideally you need to hit a couple, right? But they got to be able to stretch the field and take the pressure off the run game. Because Ohio State's going to basically say, we're going to make Tyler Buckner beat us with his, with his throwing ability. We're going to make your receivers beat us with their, throwing, with their catching ability and speed. You're not going to run for 300 yards on us, right? Yes. And, and so now can they pull it off? We'll see. I, I mean, I think Ohio State's got the talent to where if they commit all their resources to shutting down the run, they're going to be able to slow down the run game. I, I just, I don't think Notre Dame's going to bully them if they can't complete balls down the field like they did, like Oregon did. I think Ohio State was a different team by the end of the year last year than they were against Oregon. I don't think right. Oregon would have done to Ohio State in November what they did to him in, in September. Michigan was able to do that to Ohio State because they did bully him in the trenches, but Michigan also immediately in that game took shots and hit some mm-hmm. shots and they did not play keep away from Ohio State. As we said, Ohio State had the ball for more minutes in that game than Michigan did. They just took – they played their game and took it right to Ohio State, which included running the football and throwing the ball down the field. That's how they beat Michigan. And that 190 yards is misleading because they didn't throw it a ton, but they didn't throw it a ton normally. completions. Right. But they had two big plays that were – they had two big 15-yard pass interference penalties – off downfield shots because of, because I think Denzel Burke was on one or both of those pass interference penalties. So that kind of tamped the numbers down a little bit too on plays that probably would have been caught. So my answer, Ryan, is the guys that got are able to stretch the field. I don't I don't think, you know, like let's say Jaden Thomas comes out and catches eight balls for 97 yards. That's great. They need that, but that's not going to be the thing that beats them. It's the it's right. the guys that now if Jaden's the guy that stretches the field, great, but they're going to need the guys that stretch the field to step up in this game, in my opinion. I agree because I think that when you're – so if I'm the defensive coordinator, if I'm Jim Knowles, I'm looking at the situation Notre Dame's in, I'm like, okay, they had a couple interesting players at running back, although they haven't done a lot yet. They have Harry Heastan coming back, who everybody knows about Harry Heastan. And, Brian, they have a very dynamic runner in Tyler Buckner. Like, that's what you know about this offense, right? So my immediate reaction is they're going to run the football, and they're right. going to try to establish a physicality in the game. So I am also going to load up against the run. Like I, as a defensive corner, I would also do this. I would say I'm not going to let them beat me in the run game. I mean, that's natural. Mm-hmm. Offensive line should be much improved. You have a running quarterback. Sure. Stop the run. In that situation, I imagine Jim Knowles is going to play a decent amount of man coverage early on in the game, mm-hmm. right? Like he's going to give yeah. you some one-on-one opportunities and to beat those, Needs someone to be dynamic, man. Needs some right. explosive plays to be created. And I think there's going to be opportunities. The question is, can Notre Dame capitalize on them? If they can, then that box starts getting a lot looser yeah. down there because then you have to start playing too high. Yeah. You have to start playing maybe a little more zone coverage, a little more off, that type of stuff. And that plays into your advantage. So I agree with you. I think that early on, you're going to see a whole lot of man and Jim Knowles trying to load it up against the run. And Notre Dame needs to ease that pressure and the right. best way to ease that pressure is to create some explosive play. So you brain lens. He's a four, four flat type of athlete. Lorenzo styles is a four, four something type of athlete. I, I would even throw in a, Hey man, I don't know what Deion Colsey is going to be doing in the first game, but like a Colsey or a Merriweather, some guys that have that vertical elements, although it's different than those two, you need whoever is the ability to create explosive plays needs to come up, come, come mm-hmm. up early in the Ohio state game. If they hit a couple t- shots early, Brian, then right. I am going to be feeling pretty good. It's going to be a lot like that USC game, game in 2017. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a 49-14 to 14 game because Ohio State will score. I'm just saying that will make it the much more ba- – Ohio- this Ohio State team is way better than that 2017 USC team. I'm just saying the dilemma that they put on the USC defense that day is what I'm referring to. It'll be like that game where, look, we're trying to stop the run and they're throwing it over our head. Because you, you you'd mentioned, you know, Buckner's a di- – you got to take Chris Tyree into account as well. There's no way they're going to watch the, the bowl game and say, ah, we're not worried about 25, right? I mean, they're going to know he's a home run threat because the last game they saw him play, he made big plays in that game. That's a, But how do you stop him? Get down closer to the box. You see him swinging out, see him releasing, close down hard on him. It's similar to the run game. 
which go, leads into Ryan's point even further about they're going to protect the deep shots. That's that's where it's going to be. That's yeah. where they're going to be. Okay, let's get to some more here. John A1 said, in terms of athleticism, where would you rank the Notre Dame roster? Top five, top 10, or top 25? Just athleticism is the question. It's definitely better than top 25. It's between five and 10. That's Yeah, I, I think it's, it's closer pro- it's to 10. It's probably literally in between five and 10. Yeah, it's that's why I was, like yeah, six agree. Six or seven or something. Like, I, I, I wouldn't know. go five because we're just talking athleticism. I think there yeah. are some teams that Notre Dame has a better roster than, but mm-hmm. that includes the trenches. Yes. Like, I think Notre Dame has a top five roster. There's no doubt in my mind they have a top five roster. I think that's where – now. Number five is a lot of times a lot different than one and two. That's how it's been in college football for years. But they have a top five roster. What I don't know is if just pure athleticism, if they're still top five. But they're definitely top ten. I'm just leaving open the idea that a team like USC, could you could argue, could be ahead of Notre Dame just from a pure athleticism standpoint. I'm not saying I would have to think through it and look through it, but I leave open that idea that they could be there just from an athleticism standpoint. A team that has Bijan Robinson and Xavier Worthy is at least under consideration regarding their athleticism. I'd have to look at their entire roster. I'm just making the point that there are going to be teams like that if the question is just athleticism, right? But as far as football talent, trenches, and athletes, that's what gets their name in the top five. But I don't. They may be top five, Ryan. I'd have to think about this one. It's close. But I probably just my gut is to not is to say they're not top five from a just yeah. athleticism standpoint, but they are definitely a top ten. There's no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah, my, my impulse was Brian, like between five and ten, somewhere in that ballpark, right? Like definitely top ten, but like, are they six or seven? Are they five? Are they like, eight or it's, nine? It's, it's, right. Right. It's it's right. close. I mean. Judging by Feldman's freak list, uh, Wisconsin has a more talented uh, athletic roster. So, you know. <laughs> and then punters, man. And John yeah. Sott's hurting Notre Dame's ranking when it comes to athleticism. And then Blake Groupier completely drawing Notre uh, Dame Bre- down. Bryce McPherson seems like a pretty uh, athletic kid. but Not know, a freak, whatever. though. Not All a freak. Right? Not a freak. Not yet. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, I'm going to keep my comments about punters and kickers to myself uh, moving forward here. But – I think for me too, Ryan, is if you were to ask me, does Notre Dame have a top five roster in regard to trench play? 100%. I mean, that's yes. where they're three or four in the top three or four. Yeah. You know, because that now you remove Ohio State from that. Does Ohio State have a more athletic roster top to bottom than Notre Dame? Probably. Just athleticism. Yeah. That doesn't mean football town. means athleticism. Probably. Sure. Sure. You know, some positions definitely. Other positions, uh, you know. But yeah, top of them probably probably a little bit more athletic than Notre Dame. Yeah, I would but say so. when you add the trenches, um, no, I don't think they're better there. Uh, I don't. And and so that's kind of where you said I, I do think this game should be more competitive than a lot of people think, which we have some questions about that that we'll we'll get to. John A1 asks, what would you predict to be the dominant trait of this offensive line? Pass blocking or run blocking? It's a good question. Uh, I think that you can make a case for both sides, John, yeah. honestly, because you have two bookends at offensive tackles who Already showed some good spurts last year in pass blocking, but I'm gonna go with run blocking here, Brian. I, I don't know why. I, I'm not. I, I'm not like. If anybody says pass blocking instead, I'm not gonna like fight back too much. It's just what we've heard as far as the impact in camp. It sounds like those guys are moving on some guys, man. Mm-hmm. And like I, I think that Harry Heisen is bringing the physicality out in this team and is bringing kind of that aggressive nature. So I'm going to say just for that influx, I'll lean run blocking, but like, I'm not married to it. Like you can convince me that it's pass blocking at the end of the day. I think right now, if you had to say, which one am I more confident they'll be best at? I would say pass blocking because we have seen this group as it's currently constructed for the most part, be really good in pass production, pass blocking. I think Joe Alt last year was an excellent pass blocker for, a, I mean, not just for a freshman, just in general, Very good. was yeah. really good as a pass freshman blocker. Freshman All-American, yep. yep. Yes. I was, you know, again, with, with Blake Fisher, we're talking about a game and a half of football. But in that game and a half, he faced Jermaine Johnson, a first-round draft pick, and held his own, and then played a team that at the, going into the bowl season, I believe, ranked number one in the country in, in sacks. And was a really good pass rush team, and he more than held his own in that game as well on seventy plus pass attempts. Right, so 
I would say, Ryan, that I'm more confident at the current moment in the pass blocking because we have seen it. Jarrett Patterson has always been a better pass blocker than a run blocker. 100%. Uh, you know, Zeke Carell, you know, I think he had some good pass blocking. When he had mistakes in 2020, it was in the run game, not taking the proper angles to cut a guy off, stuff like that. He was good in pass pro. Uh, you, you look at uh, Josh Lug, I think he's going to be solid as a, in pass pro at guard. I, I'm confident seems to be really good pass blocking. I think this unit's highest potential is going to still be – Andrew Kristoffic, if he's starting, is a better pass blocker than he is a dominant run blocker right now. That's true. So I, I think they're, I think right now that's what I'm more comfortable in is what we know. But I think from what I've heard and what, what Ryan is referring to, they have really looked good in the run game in camp, but we just haven't seen it, right? And so I'm trying to be honest and objective. I think this team is going to run the ball really well, but what I know that this group can do is protect the quarterback as it's currently constructed. Because when they were having all the pass pro issues, you know, one of the guys that had one of the big issues is gone, Kane Madden. You've moved Josh Lug to a more comfortable position. Joe Alt was inserted into the lineup, which cleared things up. You know, a lot of things, Andrew Kristoffic was inserted in the lineup, and that helped clear things some things up in that regard. And then once that, you know, once it was Patterson, Kristoffic, Alt, the pass protection got a lot better. It wasn't great, but it got a lot better. Right. And and then in the bowl game when it was Alt and Fisher and then Patterson and Kristoffic, they were really good at protecting the quarterback in that game. They just never receivers that could get off the line and they couldn't run the ball. To strengthen your argument too, four out of five of those guys have a background at Notre Dame as a tackle at some right. point, right? Like Jared Patterson was a backup left tackle as a true freshman. Josh Lug just started at right tackle last year. And then obviously the two tackles, right. I know even C Corral was a high school offensive tackle, but like at Notre Dame, four out of five have had some type of experience as an offensive tackle. So to strengthen your point, as far as yeah. the pass blocking well, upside, thank you. thank you for strengthening my point. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Love the assist, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, you were, if you were, if you were the OC in the DC, what changes would you make to the offense and defense from where it was last season or what we think? Yeah. Going let's to just go with that. From last let's go with that. You know, cause we don't know what they're going to do this year, but yeah, from right, what they're exactly, going to do with that. Exactly. I, I would, I would, and play you can't a use more... be competent as a, as a, um, as a, you know, an answer, it, be it, competent it, coaching it, the offensive line. Look, Rob, they, they made a couple of the, the things that I would have done already. They hired a better offensive line coach. They hired a better wide receiver coach. That's a great start, right? Like I think fundamentals on offense is the biggest thing that I would have improved from last year. And then Brian defensively for me, I'm just more of a four man guy. So I would have probably had a little less three man lines. If I, if I could have last year, I felt like there was just too many times. And I know people share this frustration where I saw Isaiah Foskey, playing in space a little too much and dropping into coverage and doing all that mm -hmm. type of stuff. So probably just a little more four man defensively. And then offensively, it's just being better at the fundamentals. And that comes with the coaching side of things. So I think they made, I think they made a couple of those adjustments already. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, the biggest adjustment would have been all offensive line coach. I would like to, I want to still see more. I, I hope they don't go away from RPOs. I really hope they don't. I don't know that they will, or well, I'm not saying that I've heard that they will. And I'm warning against it. I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I just hope that they don't. I think it was really came down to on offense. It was about be coached better. Just be coached better and have a different mentality. I think I think one important aspect of this team, and then we're going to learn about Tommy Reese is, yeah, it's great that he can call plays and all that. But what I want to learn about Tommy Reese this year is can he oversee a team that needs to become more tough physically, mentally, emotionally? This offense has to be more tough. The reason I'm confident that he will is not anything I know about him as a coach. It's what I know about him as a player. Tom Reese is a tough, gritty, like no nonsense, mentally tough kid. So I, I think that you're going to see that, but I need to actually see it to, to say, yeah, it's going to happen. But I think that's a big thing is this was not a very tough Notre Dame football team it, it, this past season, especially. They weren't tough in 19. They had some tough guys. They weren't really, really physical in 2018. The only year they were really physical was 2020. And that was a byproduct of a lot of different reasons. But that's the big thing for me, Ryan, is is I need to see them be more physical. That's a big yes. part of this. Big yep. part of this. Let's get to the next question here uh, from John A1. Which player needs to make a name for himself week one, offensive, defense, outside of Tyler Buckner? Well, so we, I would assume that we're going to add yeah. that if Notre Dame is going to win, who would need to be that guy? 
Well, I mean, I, I think I would just stick to where we were talking about the offense last, uh, I mean, a couple minutes ago. I think it's w- w- there has to be a wide receiver that makes some big plays. So, like, someone has to make a, pl- a big name for themselves as an explosive pass catcher, ability to make some big plays. Defensively, I think it's going to be one of the defensive linemen, but I, I don't think it necessarily has to be Isaiah Foskey. It needs to be somebody that, like, if it's a Riley Mills or it's a Jason Adam Alola or somebody like that where it's just like, again, we talked a little bit about it was it yesterday, the day before Brian, where like, there's a perception that it's Isaiah Foskey and a bunch of guys. Like I want to leave that game. And it's like, wow, the best defensive lineman on Notre Dame's team that day was not Isaiah Foskey, right? Like it was somebody else. And Isaiah was just his typical, very good self. Right. So I think one of the defensive linemen has a huge game, whether that's pressures and as a run defender and then explosive plays on offense. So I'll go with one of the wide receivers that could be, I'll go with Lorenzo styles. Cause I'm a Lorenzo styles guy, but it could be Lorenzo styles. It could be brain Lindsay. Could be Tobias Merriweather. It doesn't matter. I just need a wide receiver to make an explosive play like we already talked about. I agree on offense. It it needs to be a receiver or a running back. I mean, it needs to be like, wow, this was the coming out party for. I, I actually I would even say that's as as important to a conversation as as the receiver. Like the receivers have to play well. They have to hit a couple big plays. They don't need to have nine catches for 170 yards. If they do, great. But they don't need right. it. They just got to hit a couple big plays. If we come out of this game saying dude, Chris Tyree is a monster or Audric Estime is a beast or, you know, now I see why Audric was talking about him being a dope walker or Logan Diggs is that dude. I mean, if one of those guys or just the backfield as a whole, you're coming out of the game like, whoa, Notre Dame's got some dudes at running back. I think that is going to be a a great sign too. Because then I think that then opens up those big play opportunities, hit a big play here, hit a big play there, right? Like, and that's what made Ohio State so good in 2014. Well, House State didn't have that dude at receiver. Like they had talent there. Michael Thomas played receiver for that team, right? And he was pretty good. But like forty some catches for seven hundred yards. They weren't a they, Devin Smith to me was their best receiver that year. Well, not say best, most impactful receiver that year. He didn't catch that many balls. This is when he did. They were going for like thirty. I mean, that was the he has. I want to pull up his numbers from that year because he had some insane yards per catch. Did, numbers didn't he literally year. average thirty yards a catch that year? It was like close to it. Yeah, it, he had he had nine hundred and thirty one receiving yards for on thirty three catches, twenty eight point <laughs> two yards per catch and twelve touchdowns. Michael Thomas, I was right about the seven hundreds, but he had fifty four catches and fifteen games. I mean, that's that's good production. Nine touchdowns. He had a sure. good season, but he wasn't like. It wasn't what he was in college. He wasn't T. Higgins. He wasn't Justin Ross. I mean, because the offense, that's not what the offense was. But what they could do on that team is they could hit home runs. Yes. And, I mean, if you – Devin number – I mean, he did all that in 15 games. He had 931 yards. He averaged less than uh, three catches per game. Yes. I mean, 15 games, 33 just, catches, you know, I ain't a just, math Just guy, over but, two yeah. a game, not just, not under right. three, like right. barely two a game, right. <laughs> if we're being he, honest. Here's like, what he did not. that year. Two for 94 against Navy, one for 58 against Virginia Tech. Let's see here. One for 42 against Rutgers, three for 72 against Illinois, six for 129 against Michigan State. Let's see. One for 52 against Michigan, four for 137 and three touchdowns against Wisconsin in the Big Ten title game. Two for 87 against Alabama, one went for a touchdown, and then one for 45 against Oregon, right? Like, if Braden Lindsey just kind of has some games like that or a game, like if he just does against Ohio State what Devin Smith did against Michigan, I don't even need to do what Devin Smith did against Wisconsin, Ryan. I just need him to do what he did against Michigan. Two catches, but one of them's a bomb. Or, I mean, Alabama, one of them's a bomb. Or, or, you know, or – that's, I mean, if if he just has one catch for 52 yards like Devin Smith did against Michigan, that's going to have an impact in this football game. And that's the things I need to see from him in this game. I, I, can't, you know? I can't believe those numbers from Devin Smith. That's like the uh, the Tayshawn Lyons high right. school numbers. But he did it in the Big Ten in the college football playoff. You know what I mean? Like, that's a little different than doing it at some small level of California high school football. They were sick numbers. But what did he, why was he such a great part of that offense? Because you you were always leery of if you put a little too much emphasis on the box to try to stop Ezekiel, they're going to throw it over your head. And yep. he's a 50-plus yard play waiting to happen. And I think that's kind of 
that's kind of the thing for me that if Braden Lindsay can just give that, and he doesn't even have to be the stupid 28 yards per catch, just where you can be that guy and make one catch like that, then that opens up the running backs and, and that type of thing. Defensively, I actually want to see a DB have a breakout. And I don't care who it is. It can be Brandon Joseph. It can be Cam Hart. But if some DB comes out of that game, because even now with Cam Hart, I mean, Brandon Joseph, he's getting some preseason All-American love, but it, he's not like a talked about figure the way Kyle Hamilton was. You know, it's like, oh, we'll put him on the All-American list because he was an All-American two years ago. That's how I feel they're, why they're putting him on the All-American list because he was already one. But they don't then talk about him the way they talk about other guys, right? No. If we're coming out of that game and people are like, yo, Cam Hart, Brandon Joseph, that's a dude you got to worry about. Like, that's a good sign for Notre Dame because no one's going to be talking about that if Notre Dame gives up 500 in passing yards and loses by 30. Hey, but that Cam Hart guy's really good, you know. Uh, you won't see that. It means that they at least had some level of success or he, that player, whether it's Clarence Lewis, I don't care if it's Tariq Bracey, I don't care who it is. It could be mm -hmm. DJ Brown, you know. It could be Houston Griffin. I don't care if it's Justin Walters or I don't I don't care. Somebody comes out of that game making a name for themselves, it means they made game-changing plays in the secondary. And that would be huge for this Notre Dame football team. And yes. big time, big time. Big time hey, big and look, time. if it is Isaiah Foskey coming out of that game, because, like, hey, we need to put this cat on that Will Anderson conversation, that's a good thing, too, because it means he went out and had, like, you know, two or three sacks on on uh, uh, C.J. Stroud. So as long as people are talking about those guys in week one, it means that Notre Dame played really well. Win or lose, it means – they battled for 60 minutes and played really good football. And that's oh, the key. Brian, not to go into tangent, but during our show yesterday, I forgot to tell you, there was someone that at some point that put in the chat that uh, it was, it, I think it was like an LSU fan that came sure. into the chat. They said Isaiah Foskey's overrated. He only had one sack against Oklahoma State. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Great All commentary, right. buddy. He only has one sack a game. He's going to have 13 sacks in the season. Like, come on, y'all. Yep. Like, yep, yep, yep. Are you shocked that an LSU fan made a dumb comment? I mean, that, that's – I've actually had two LSU fans I've engaged with the last couple of days who I had really good back and forth with. We didn't agree. We had good back and forth with. That's two out of about 100. And, so, and you're going you're, you're going in the Tiger Den tonight, my yeah, friend. It'll be fun. I like Preston. He's a good dude. He's had me on the show before. And all I asked him to do is don't play this gotcha stuff, right? Like don't, don't yeah. bring up stupid things people are saying in the chat. If you want to hammer me for what I said, I'll own what I say. I'll always own what I say. And I'll always answer for what I say. I believe everyone should be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you want to try to debate with me about the merit of what I said, that's cool too. As long as it's not some stupid gotcha stuff. And Preston has right. promised me he'll do that. And and from what I know about Preston, who, who works for Tiger Bait, I have no doubt that he'll be fair. And he's going to be tough. And I would expect him to. I don't need him to throw me softballs. Come at me because I believe in what I say. He believes mm -hmm. in what he feels about it, and we'll have a fun debate. So you want to check that out tonight at 7 o'clock. So. 7 o'clock Eastern. Tune yep. in. There you go. John A1 says, when two great quarterbacks are playing against each other, is there added pressure or is it complete focus on the defense? I don't care what any quarterback says. There's always a thought of that other quarterback. Always. Yes. You, you don't think you don't think that Peyton Manning got like tired of like the Tom Brady stuff early in his career, like oh Peyton Manning can't beat Tom Brady in the playoffs or something. And eventually, he broke through that shell, right? But like, there's no no one can tell me, no matter how great the quarterback is, that it doesn't it's not in their mind a little bit, like it 100 percent is. And then also, Brian, like let's be honest, if you have two great quarterbacks, that usually usually means that your offenses are pretty good. They're going against each other, and you know that you have to match that guy, right? It's like mm -hmm. oh that guy's going to score here. I need to come back and be the best version of myself. So either way, the op opposition of the quarterback is always in the person's head because they know sure. what they have to do in order to beat them. So uh, yes, they are right. They and are, I think they're, to, it's a mental right. position. So they're always thinking like that. And Absolutely. to a degree, I think it needs to be. I mean, Hey, look, man, you, you can't just be flipping with the football when that other guy's on the other side of the field. Cause he will take, he will, he will take advantage of that and put in crush your defense, you know, with those type of turnovers. There's, there's no doubt. Hey, you know, Tom Brady, you can't give Peyton Manning that extra drive at the end of that, you know, a AFC playoff game. Because that's the funny thing is, like, the Colts actually had pretty decent success overall against the Patriots. Just early on, they didn't. But eventually, yes. you know, he got his wins, you know. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I think. He broke I, through you know, eventually. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's kind of where you need to be, right? Is you know you know who's on the other sideline, and it, it it adds pressure, but it shouldn't add pressure. It should add to me if you're a great quarterback. It's not going to add pressure. It's going to add fuel. It's going to add focus. It's going to add hey, 
I got my chance to go prove I'm the best. Not like, oh my gosh, I gotta, I can't mess up or so and so. No, I don't think that. Like that's not how Peyton got to where he got to. That's not how Tom Brady got where he got to. They were worried about the other guy, but it's more of a, you know what I think of it. I think of it in terms of a of one of my most memorable commercials as a kid. I'm a Larry Bird fan. I was a Boston Celtics fan. Do you remember the McDonald's commercial where Larry Bird and and, and Michael Jordan are playing that like game of horse and it's like off the rafters. You know, it was just like this really absurd thing where it's like, you know, off the rafters, off this bleacher and then in, into the hoop and they're both making it. They're playing for McDonald's. It's kind of like that. Like anything you can do, I can do better type of thing. That's how I think the great quarterbacks are when they're playing against each other. And if you don't have that mentality, then I question whether or not you're a great quarterback. And they will say, they will say that, oh, I don't care about what's going on. I, bull, bull, <laughs> right? They need to say that, you know. But that's, yeah, that's that, not that, that, that commercial reminds me of. Do you remember those fantasy football commercials where they made those guys do like outrageous things that are actually not possible? They had like the no. David Akers one where he like he they actually recorded that at my high school when I was when I was coaching. David Akers like popped this thing up way in the air and then kicked like a 60 yard field goal <laughs> off the ground and like all this ridiculous stuff. I think it was like Tony Gonzalez punched his hands through like a brick wall to catch a ball or something like that. I'm yeah. like, yes, it's very possible. Very possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At, uh, I'll have to, ch- I'll have to look for that one. Uh, that was one of my favorite parts of Super Bowls growing up was just the commercials. They've gotten somewhat lame the last five, 10 years, but they used to be, they used to be pretty awesome. I used to, yeah, used to love it. Used to love those. Next question here. We got, boy, we're already two hours in, man. This thing has flown by. John That's a one says, do you predict the kicking game to be more similar to Kyle Brinza or Justin Yoon this year? I hope, I actually think it's going to be closer to Justin Yoon. Yes. And and now, is Blake Groupie as good as Justin Yoon? No, because Justin Yoon actually had a pretty decent leg. Uh, do I expect him to be quite as accurate as Justin Yoon? No. I mean, Justin Yoon is probably the most underrated and underappreciated Notre Dame kicker of my life. Yeah. Like, nobody talked about him, but, like, that kid was money. I think of, like, the, the Clemson game. You're, you're down 14 nothing going into halftime. In a monsoon, he drilled a 48-yard field goal in the rain against Clemson right before halftime. He was a money kicker, man, and a really good kid. So does Blake Groupie have Justin Yoon's leg? No. But if he can be as accurate at Notre Dame as he was at Arkansas State, then it's going to look a lot more like Justin Yoon. Whereas like John Doerr and Kyle Brenza had huge legs, but you never knew what they were going to get. What I did respect about Brenza was – is he had some big opportunities in his career to make kicks that mattered. And from I can't think of one that he didn't hit. I mean, of course, the one I first think of is the LSU one in 2014, where he drilled that Music City Bowl kick. But, you know, I mean, I'm sure there were some that people can remember and point to. But, uh, you know, I, I think Groupie will be more like Justin Yoon than Kyle Brenza for a lot of different reasons. Bren- Brenza had a cannon for a leg, man. Oh, man, like, yeah. Shoo, yeah. again. You never knew where that yeah. thing was going, though. But he had NFL leg strength, but not NFL yeah. accuracy. Not at all. Right, right, right. He was an interesting kid. Very interesting kid. All right. Cajun Domer. Brian, any chance of having a discussion with Blake Rafino again, or do you drown out that kind of noise? I drown out that kind of noise. I got no time for stupid people. That's not very nice to say. I have no, t- I have no time for non-serious. That was rude of me to say, and I apologize for that. I should not have said that it's stupid people. Uh I don't have time for childishness. How about that? I know that's insulting too, but I don't, I think that's more accurate, right? It's, it is, it's, it's less of a, a, uh, it's less, it's less childish than calling stupid. Yes. I think you, I think you did better there. I think you did. Yes. And I think it's more accurate, um, to, to the current situation. Reason I'm going off Preston is because I think Preston is more of a serious person and we'll push back. We'll, we'll ask me tough questions. We'll, will you know defend LSU's honor so to speak but he'll do it professionally and that's that's how I expect it to be mm-hmm. so that's why I'm going on there because like if you if you're not willing to answer for what you say then don't say things right if, if you don't want people to push back or have reactions or whatever then don't say things that's just how it is it's it's you know you say something you're answer for it and I have no problem answering for it and going on to LSU people and explaining where I'm coming from because I believed everything I said we'll turn out find out if I'm right or not but I believe everything I said the funny part is people are like oh you're just mad because Brian Kelly left and I'm like it would take you five minutes of research to realize that's not true I may be wrong about Brian Kelly 
But to turn this into, and that's where I say the childishness part, right? Because like Preston knows my stance on Brian Kelly. He knew it when he brought me on a show back on Brian Kelly's heart. He knew I wasn't a big Brian Kelly supporter. Other mm-hmm. people are just like, oh, you're just mad because he left. I'm like, why? Why would I be mad that he left? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, life's tough, man. Number three recruiting class, country, and, you know, yeah, life's tough, right? Sure, okay, whatever. Uh, I- that, that's what that's my about. favorite thing is people always say that about me too on Twitter sometimes. And I'm just like, you have never talked to me before he was, before he was, <laughs> before he left then. If you yeah. think that I'm really upset sure. that he left. Sure. Okay. okay. Whatever. <laughs> you can criticize me. I may end up being wrong, but at least be accurate in what you're referring to. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. All right. Let's get this next one. God country, Notre Dame barbecue. Can you compare the Rocket, Deion Sanders, Desmond Howard, Charles Woodson, and Reggie Bush from a pure athleticism standpoint. Can you put them order of most dynamic? Here's the interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Reggie Bush is going to be in my bottom two in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, probably. that's how elite this group of athlete, of athleticism are. Because because uh, to me, athleticism is not just speed. Right. And, and so to me, what made – the rocket and Deion Sanders and Charles Woodson so special is that they were not only fast, but they were dynamic athletically. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where I'd rank them. I'd, I'd put Dion number one. Yes. For me, I'd put again, athleticism taken away. See to me, I'm not, I'm not putting in the size aspect of it. So sure. I'd have rocket two. I'd have Charles Woodson three. I'd have Reggie Bush four. I've had Desmond Howard five. They were all great athletes, but I, that would be the order of for me. It, it, taking in all of the aspects of athleticism, ex- right. agility, explosiveness, speed, top end, change of direction, balance, all those things. Because the thing about Rocket, Rocket had some of the best balance I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And he was a 175 pound guy that could bounce off tackles, hit the ground, and just bam, get right back to being a four two. And that's why that would be that was so Dion, Rocket. Woodson, Reggie, and and uh, Desmond with how I'd rank those. See, see, my struggle is I I don't re- I don't remember Rocket that much. Okay, you know, like I've only seen the highlights and him with he played with the Cowboys a little bit, right? And Raiders, a couple yeah. other teams, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I actually remember the NFL version more than I do the college right. version, which is unfortunate. He was just more of a speed but, guy in the yes. NFL. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's Dion number one. Like that's, mm-hmm. I mean, literally we talked about it. He was good enough that he could play both sides. He literally has played both sides of the ball. And he was a starting center fielder for a World Series team in Atlanta, right? So mm-hmm. like that's, yeah, yeah. So Dion's yeah. number one. I'm not going to put Rocket in it just because I, I haven't seen enough. So I'm only going to rank the guys that I have seen. Okay? Right. So I'll go Dion Sanders. I'll, I'll put it like this. Imagine if Reggie Bush was a four, two. <laughs> well, if that case, then I mean, is, that's what rocket is, was. I mean, yeah. with all, I mean, that's what rocket was. He was basically Reggie Bush with four, two speed. I mean, that's, that's what he was. Well, let, let, let's, let's throw him at number two. Then I'll, I'll yeah. take, I'll take your word for this one. The Reggie Bush, Charles Woodson one is interesting to me because the same things I said about Dion is Charles Woodson is that same type of player. Like he literally played both sides of the ball. That's why he won the Heisman at Michigan. Right. And he was a player where, I would argue in the NFL, he was a better safety than he was a corner at the end of his, like he was a really good safety man on top of being a good corner at the NFL. So I probably out for him, Reggie Bush, and then Desmond Howard. So I think we ended up having the same list. I just yeah. kind of went through it a little bit differently, but I mean, Desmond was a, was a dude as a returner, but like, yeah. just I mean, those, the other guys like Charles Woodson and Dion, like they could have played so many different positions sure. on a team, right? Like that's sure. The difference. And that's, yeah. I mean, Desmond, if Charles Woodson wanted to be a, an offensive player, he could have been a thousand yard receiver in college. I mean, just, he was, I think you could maybe argue that Reggie could be ahead of Charles Woodson. I, I just, I wouldn't. Cause I think the thing that I give Charles and I think power is part of athleticism too. Yeah. And that's another thing that made Rocket really unique, right? I'm going to send you some highlight tapes when we're done here because you're going to see like him bouncing off of tackles and, you know, breaking tackles and things like that for a 5'10", 175-pound guy. And and to me, that's what, you know, made him really special. But Charles Woodson was a, a – he was a powerful athlete, really powerful yeah. athlete, uh, and was a f- was really fun to watch. He was a Unfortunately, I remember – I remember Quadri Ishmael more than oh, yeah. Rocket Ishmael. So. The missile. The missile. <laughs> yes. yes. Decent player. Go. Decent yeah. player. Yeah. 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 And this never was going to be able to live up to his brother's expectations, you know. 
Uh, let's see here. Somebody asked, why do we assume Tyler Buckner will not be at Notre Dame in 2024? No one's assuming that. We're, no. we're, you always have to uh, prepare for contingencies, right? Like you we have to prepare. Tackle right, like, right. Yeah. You have to say, do you think Tyler Buckner's leaving after 2023? No. Do you need to prepare for it? Because what we also said is if he leaves early or gets hurt. You always have to prepare for situations where you don't have the quarterback you think you're going to have or the offensive tackle you think you're going to have, and you want to be in a situation right where you're not replacing him with a freshman. And that's what we're referring to. So if you took that as we are assuming he will be gone in 2024, we're definitely not assuming that. But part of building your roster is looking forward to the future and saying, what could be the thing that could get us in trouble in 2024? Tyler Buckner blows up in 2023. You know, look, because look, college football is going to lose a lot of stud quarterbacks this year. Yep. They're going to probably lose CJ Stroud. They're going to probably lose Bryce Young. They're going to lose Phil Dracovic. They're probably going to lose Tyler Van Dyke. They're probably, I mean, there's a lot of big time quarterbacks that they're going to lose. And, which and there means, was a lot of, there was a lot of seniors that came back for the extra year right. as well. So like, it, it's, it's Sam Hartman's a 60 year quarterback. I mean, yes, you were correct. Uh, you're going to lose Grayson McCall. You're going to lose Devin Leary, most likely. I mean, there's a lot of Hendon Hooker, I think, is done after this year. Yeah. There, uh, other than Caleb Williams, I can't think of a guy that's expected to be a big time quarterback this year. Maybe Anthony Richardson. Quinn, Quinn Ewers. Right? Uh, okay. So, so of those guys, <laughs> You know, like the, the point is like, you know, I, I would expect Anthony Richardson back, but I don't think he's a big time quarterback yet. He's a big time talent, but he's a, not a big time quarterback. You know, I don't count Will Levis in that conversation, right? He's a system guy. The point is, is there's just, there's going to be a, there's going to be new blood in 23. If Tyler Buckner has a good year this year and Notre Dame is a good team this year, 10 plus win team, then he's going to get a lot of hype and expectations next year. Because one thing Tyler Buckner will do this year, if he's healthy, Ryan, he's going to have a lot of highlight real plays mm -hmm. uh, he just going to and so you'll see that hype and then let, let's say he builds on it and as a as a junior in college has a similar year to what he had as a junior in high school uh, relative to the level he's playing meaning not 4400 yards passing 1600 yards rushing and the greatest college quarterback season ever we're talking about relative to what that would look like in college they say 3500 yards passing 800 yards rushing 40 plus touchdowns and he's a you know he may say, hey, look, with the injuries that I've had, I, I got to strike while the iron's hot because I don't think it's going to necessarily be a great quarterback draft class. Outside of Caleb Williams, can you project someone right now that definitely that guy is going to be a first-round pick? There will some that will be that will emerge, right? Sure. But Tyler Buckner, I think, is going to be right in that conversation. So you have to at least prepare for it. I think it'd be irresponsible as a coach to not at least prepare for it. But then if you get him back – then now you've got another year of CJ grooming, and now CJ is ready to be there if Tyler gets hurt. That's where the conversation came from. I want to I want to look up the Tyler Buckner recruiting class at quarterback real quick. It was a pretty good class. I mean, you yeah. had Caleb Williams in that class, right? Uh, yeah, obviously had Tate. Got, 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 there was a couple guys in that class that I thought were were a, a little overrated. If I'm going to be completely honest with you, so uh, I got. I, I loved that rivals counted him as, by the way, as a. Uh, a dual threat quarterback. They counted who's that? They ca uh, Caleb Williams. They uh, called him a dual threat quarterback. No, he is a pocket passer that can run. That's not. Sure. A, you know, I wouldn't call him a dual threat quarterback. But that was Quinn Ewers was in that class. Yep. Uh, I got you had right obviously now. okay. You got it up. Sa so Sam you, Sam Heward was in that class. Right. Brock, Brock Vandegrift was a very Vandegrift. overrated part of that. class. JJ McCarthy. Yep. Kyle McCord at Ohio State will uh -huh. eventually, in my opinion, Kyle McCord will be one of those guys that emerges as a future first round pick once he gets a year under his belt after replacing CJ Stroud. But that would be 2024 season. Mm -hmm. So he'd replace CJ and start for one year in 23. I don't think he's leaving after one year. And then it's happened. Dwayne Haskins did that, but I don't think he would do that. You know, so then he'd be more 2024, which again, we're talking about Tyler breaking out in 23 which would cause him to go there so i mean oh, a lot know, of these other go ahead ryan you know who i watched i watched miami spring game that jake garcia kid's got a live yeah. arm man he's got a live Sheesh. arm i'm not a yeah. huge i wasn't a huge fan of him coming out in some of the mm -hmm. other quarterback areas but you are correct he has a very 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 live arm you know so so who breaks out i mean does jackson dart break out at Ole miss this year and is he in the same boat as as tyler buckner you know he's a guy that you could see maybe do something like that you know ty thompson at oregon is somebody that some people like I, you know i like them but I, I 
I don't see him as a potential future first round pick. So, but there will be some guys that break out it happens all the time, but I just, right now, I don't see that being a, you know, a year and you look at the 2020 class. I mean, those are the guys that it's crazy. We're talking already about guys that are in the 2021 classes as leaving for the NFL already. It's just, <laughs> it's crazy how this goes, but then there's some 2020 guys that, you know, you look at could maybe break out over the next couple of years, you know, and be that guy. And, you know, who, you know, we talked about Anthony Richardson. I think he probably needs another year, in my opinion. Uh-huh. You know, Evan Prater was a, a pretty talented kid that goes to Cincinnati. You know, does he kind of have a, a couple good years? I put him in that Tyler Buckner conversation, you know, now that he steps into the starting lineup. So oh, Je- Jeff Sims is a kid from Georgia Tech that I like, but he's just in such a bad situation. Yeah. I like yeah. Jeff Sims, though. Yeah, I do like the off. I do like if he I think Chip is a guy that could maybe help him become a, a more of a pocket passer. That's what Chip wants. I mean, Chip wants a guy that can sit in the pocket and throw the ball. Hope so. There's no doubt. I've I've heard good things about this Hunter Decker's kid that's starting at Iowa State this year, mm-hmm. but I haven't seen him yet. That'll be uh, interesting. It'll be interesting. There's no doubt about that. Let's get to some more questions. I I I, I thought that it was a good one, USMA, and I'm, I'm glad you asked it so we could kind of clarify where we're coming from. Let's see here. Chris Basker says, which one-on-one matchup match on the matchup on the field gives Notre Dame the biggest advantage, and which is the biggest mismatch in favor of Ohio State? I mean, Ryan, I, I think this one, the one on favor of Ohio State, is pretty easy, and that's whoever's guarding Jackson Smith and Jigba. There's a we don't <laughs> right. anticipate that being Cam Hart a ton, right? Mm-hmm. We yeah. anticipate it being Clarence Lewis at times. We anticipate it being Tariq Bracy a lot, the Rover a lot, the safeties a lot. Because what I mean by that is if if they're in their base defense then it's the rover and the safety over top of him. And mm-hmm. to me, that's that's a a big part of this, Ryan, is is just kind of having – can you hold up in those matchups, right? So yeah. I think on, right now, could Tariq Bracey, you know, have a good game? Sure. But right now on paper, that's the, the biggest challenge for Notre Dame from a matchup standpoint, in my opinion. I can't even think of one that's a close second, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Like, that's that's the, that's the hard one, you know? You know, like, I can't think of one Tariq like, Williams against Zeke Carell. If if Talik Williams Maybe. has the breakout that you think he can have, I think you know Zeke Crow's got a lot to prove, right? Sure. I mean, if we see the Zeke Crow we saw last year, that's a big mismatch for Ohio State, in my opinion. Right. Now, I don't think we're going to see the Zeke Crow we saw last year. I think Zeke Crow's going to be a good football player. But if yeah. we're being honest and, and holding, hey, look, we're going off what we saw last year. Talik Williams looked really good in limited snaps as a freshman last year. He's a big kid. Mm-hmm. Zeke Crow really struggled in his starts last year that would be the only other one that really pops in my head. I don't anticipate that being an issue the right. way, the way that, you know, we just described it. But again, this is a show me business, right? And we can think all we want about how good the line is going to be or whatever, but you got to see it. Right. And that's going to be the big thing. So I, I think that's a fairly objective take on that. What about the yeah. other side, Ryan? You it's know, I, I think it's but I think it's an offensive tackle versus defensive end conversation on both sides of the football, if I'm being honest. Because mm-hmm. not look, the defensive ends for Ohio State are all talented, but they have not shown me anything. You just said to show me visit business, right? They have not shown mm-hmm. me anything right now. So I feel pretty good about Blake Fisher and Joe Alt against the defensive ends. I do. I feel good about both those guys in that situation, unless barring some crazy breakout. On the other side of the ball. If I'm getting Isaiah Fat Fosky matched up against Dewan Jones, I feel all right, Brian. I feel pretty good. I feel pretty yeah. good about that matchup. I think him versus Paris Johnson, if Paris Johnson settles in, could be a really nice matchup. You know, mono versus mono. But I think I, even though I've heard Dewan Jones has lost a ton of weight this offseason, which is great because it's something that he needed to do. I still think that he's going to have some tough time with the athleticism length combo. That's a Isaiah Fosky has. So I'll, I'll say yeah. it's a defensive end versus offensive tackle clash on both sides of the wall i think they're gonna they're gonna have to figure something out for michael mayer as much as jim Knowles says they have athletes and linebacker and safety that can run with michael and play with michael mayer they don't they're gonna have to bracket double teams don't always mean you have two guys accounting for him at the same time you can triple team a guy where only one has him at a time it's you you hey if he comes here you got to take him if he goes there you got to take him you know, different things like that, but they're going to have to bracket him a lot, double team him a lot. Uh, that's not a matchup that I think really favors them all that much, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Connor O'Doherty, any word on how the corner position opposite Cam Hart is trending? How is Ryan Barnes progressing along with R- Benjamin Moore? So we had another question about Ryan Barnes moving to safety. Ryan Barnes did not move to safety from what I'm told. He is cross-training at safety now that Xavier Watts is now cross-training uh, at – 
corners or I mean at, at receivers. So that one is a little bit different. Um, how is it trending? It's it's Clarence Lewis and then guys like Jaden Mickey and Benjamin Morrison are pushing for playing time. I think Jaden Mickey more so than Benjamin Morrison. And then also you can always move Tariq Bracey outside. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where that one is at. Um, here's one, Ryan. Who is the player not named Tyler Buckner that if he hits a ceiling can help Notre Dame win a natty this year better than anyone else? It's a tough question. I mean, my my initial thought, Brian, is I think the guy with the biggest ceiling on the team just in general might be Blake Fisher. But then the question mark is like, would not not that offensive tackle isn't an impact position, but it was just it wouldn't be the first one that I would pick for like difference between a championship and not winning a championship, you know? So my thought went to Isaiah Foskey was another guy, but I, I'm thinking wide receiver as well because we need a wide receiver to really break out right. and be a guy. It would be but, the one you keep talking about, Lorenzo Styles. I mean, if Lorenzo yeah. Styles hits a ceiling this year, this offense could be really hard to stop, Ryan. I mean, yeah. really hard to stop. I, to me, I think a guy that could – I think that guy to me is, is, is honestly, it's Riley Mills. It, good one. I'm going him or Maris Lewifauer, the two for me. I think if those two guys hit their ceiling, we know what Cam Hart can be. We know what Brandon Joseph is. We know what Isaiah Foskey is. We know what Jason Adamiola is, right? If 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 it's somebody else, mm-hmm. you know, like if Cam Hart, if Clarence Lewis hits a ceiling, he's a good steady player. But you're not winning a title with a good steady corner unless your ends are just dominant. Because we're talking about winning a natty, right? So this isn't about beating, you know, North Carolina, Stanford, teams like that. This is about beating the best teams in the country, beating Georgia. You're not beating Georgia, Ryan, if you've got one defensive lineman that's making plays. You're not. You're not beating Alabama if you've only got one defensive lineman that's making plays. You need somebody else to step up and take games over. And that's why I say it's got to be Riley Mills or even to a degree Jason Adamula. But I think Riley Mills is a bookend if Riley Mills reaches his peak, which what would you say if Riley Mills plays the best he can? What would his numbers look like? I'm kind of thinking like 12 tackles for loss, seven, eight sacks. Seven sacks yeah. That's kind of where I'm looking at, like a big power rusher. You got that opposite Isaiah Foskey. That's a really dynamic one-two punch when you consider how that is played. Because what's that going to also do, Ryan? How do you stop Maris Lufau on blitzes if those two bookends are getting after it? How do you mm-hmm. stop Jason Adamiola up the middle? if you're having a hard time and putting all your pressure on ends on the opposite side of the offensive line, that's what make, could make this defense really challenging. So I'm going to go with, with Riley Mills, to be honest with you, because I always have felt Ryan, and you can, you can disagree with me on this if you want. Mm-hmm. If a, if you're a defensive lineman can have a much greater impact on everybody behind him than a great defensive back can have on everybody in front of him. Not that a great defensive back can't impact other people, but more so. Like if, if my choice is between Lawrence Taylor or Deion Sanders, the two be- the best that I've ever seen do it, I'm taking Lawrence Taylor because I don't need Deion to be Deion if I got Lawrence Taylor. You know what I mean? Because the quarterback doesn't have time to do that. You know, so you can just make the same case with the Reggie White. I mean, you just pick a great pass rusher. Mm-hmm. I just. I, that's just kind of how I feel. I, I just pass rush, yeah. pass rush over pass coverage. I'm there yeah. with you. No, that's, I want both, right? But right, sure. I can only pick one if guy to reach his one. full ceiling. PFF you know? says that's stupid. They, what? They, they hate your opinion on that. Well, I that that actually solidifies the confidence <laughs> I have in that decision. Uh, yeah. That PFF doesn't feel that way. So if it, if it was up to PFF, the uh, team would pass every single play. They would never run the ball ever. So. <laughs> Even more reason not to like PFF. <laughs> they they would rush three linemen every single yes. play. They would have six defensive backs on the field. That yes. was just, yes, that's PFF's yep. recipe for success. There you go. So just a seven on seven league, basically. Hundred yeah. percent to me. Sounds good to me. Uh, Stone Adore says it seems like Notre Dame still struggles to land the elite five star type players. Is a future national championship realistic if Notre Dame can can be balanced and have a great players everywhere or are elite players needed? Elite players are needed. Notre Dame has elite players now. It, this comes down to you're putting two things together that don't belong together. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ask you this. Who was the elite five-star player on Ohio State's 2014 team? You say, oh, Joey Bosa. Nope. Joey Bosa wasn't a five-star player. Ezekiel Elliott. Nope. Ezekiel Elliott wasn't a five-star player. 
the only the only five star player that I remember starting on that team, and I could be wrong, is Curtis Grant. Curtis Grant was a five-star player. Average linebacker. Mediocre player. Joey Joey Bosa was ranked 47th, 53rd, and 56th coming out in the rankings, right? Now, that's a really good player. It's not like, oh, my God, they missed that one big time. I mean, they thought he was really good. They had him as basically a top 50 player. I mean, you know, he ended up being even better than that. Ezekiel Elliott, again, similar player. He was ranked high, but not an elite national player. He's ranked 70th, 84th, and 109th. I actually... Did this once to prove my point. Seven of Ohio State's eleven starters on D on offense that year were three star players coming out of high school on the comp- composite list. Josh Perry was not a uh, uh, like an elite five star player. Darren Lee, who was an elite college player, was not an elite recruit. I think he was a three star on the composite list. I'm looking at that now. He was uh, on uh, on threes consensus. He was ranked. He was a consensus three star recruit coming out of high school. So I'd have to look at the secondary. There might have been a guy in the secondary on that team, Ryan, that was was a five-star player, but they weren't like the guys on that team. They were like freshmen. I think they had a couple five-star freshmen on that team, but they weren't like the guys. They weren't mm-hmm. considered like the best players in that defense. They were a great team. They had elite players, but those elite players were not all five stars. That's right. the thing I keep telling everybody. Five stars hit at a higher rate. Nobody denies that. So the good thing about landing five-star players is you increase the odds that guys pan out, which is why you've never heard me say, I've, I've said this, if you give me a team with 11 Jeremiah Wusu koromoa type players and, and pick any, you know, Tyler Eiferts, I'm going to have an elite championship team. But you don't recruit that way. You can't right. recruit that way because you can't assume that all those three stars are going to hit. They hit at a lower rate. That's why what Notre Dame needs to do is increase the rate of highly ranked players from the, you know, again, the perception of what they are or the reality of what those guys are. Higher floor players. People use star rankings. I care more about the floor, regardless of the ranking. But more of those guys that you know have high floors and less of the low floor guys. But there Mm -hmm. still is merit to those low floor, high ceiling guys because some of those guys turn out to be Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa's. Right. But you also need some guys that, you know, can go out there and at least be good football players. And so that's the thing for me. And, and now they Ohio State had five star guys that played. Raquan McMillan played on that team. He came off the bench with Curtis Grant, but they were not the be- their best linebackers were Josh Perry. who was not a top 100 recruit and Darren Lee, who was a three star. Mm-hmm. You need star players. Star players aren't always five stars. A lot. Would, does anyone want to tell me that Isaiah Foskey is not an elite player? Does anybody want to tell me that? He is. He was a, he was not a top 100 recruit coming out of high school. Does anybody want to tell me that Jarrett Patterson has not been a really good player at Notre Dame, you know, potentially elite, not a top 100 player? Jeremiah Wusu koromoa the one outlet had him as a four-star. That's it. I mean, I could do this all day. You need elite players. Sam Hart. Yeah, you need elite players. Yeah. If you can get them in five-star packages, great. Because what I like about five-stars is, is – whether the hit rate and draft and the but I feel five stars more often than not are more ready to play now. Mm-hmm. That's one of the benefits of because even Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa, for example, a five star linebacker comes in like Raekwon McMillan and plays right now, yeah. right? Comes in and plays right now. Raekwon McMillan was physically ready to play as a freshman. He was a part of that rotation that, that Ohio State had. Really, really good football player, right? I believe Raekwon was a five star player, right? Uh, coming out of high school. I'm actually looking that up right now. Yes, he was the number 13 overall player in the country. Really good college player. Where was he picked? Second round, number 54 overall pick. Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa was a three-star kid on the composite who didn't play a defensive snap at Notre Dame for two years because he had to get bigger, gain weight, and all that. He was the second round pick number 52 overall selection. Ended up the same exact place, great college players, high NFL draft picks, but they got there in a different path. And I think mm-hmm. to me, that's the biggest difference, Ryan, for between four stars and three stars is that kind of guy. And that to me is where is where I think you need to be. And and the other thing is, is you need your where I think Notre Dame has also lacked is they have they haven't spread their elite players out at enough positions. 
they've been really manifested at a small number, smaller number of positions. The best Notre Dame teams we've seen in recent years are ones that had big time players. You had Kavari Russell corner in 2015. You had Jalen Smith at linebacker, really good D line. 2018 team. Yeah, you had a great defensive line. You had two great inside line. I would say you didn't have two great inside linebackers, but you had a great inside linebacker tandem, right? Mm -hmm. Is that more fair to say? Great corner tandem, including one All American elite player and a great safety tandem, even though they weren't elite players. But you had enough impact elite college players that you had at all three levels that you could have a great defense in 2018. Mm -hmm. So they just got to spread it out more consistently because then the next two years, it was, it was not that way. It was right. one great player here, but the next, I mean, you, know, you had 2019 to 2020, you had a better mm -hmm. linebacker on that team than you had in 2018. Jeremiah Wusukormo was better than anybody that Notre Dame had a linebacker in 2018. With all due respect to Tavon Coney and Drew Tranquil, he was a better player, but the linebacker unit in 2018 was better. And that's the thing that Notre Dame's got to get better at. It's it's you had a great guy like Jalen Smith, but play him next to uh, 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 Luke Keekley, which is what Notre Dame should have had, right? I mean, they passed on Luke Keekley for Dan Fox, and I don't mean any disrespect to Dan Fox. I've heard he's a great kid, played his butt off at Notre Dame, but he ain't Luke Keekley, you know. And so it's make better evaluations. And guess who? Guess where Luke Keekley was ranked in high school? Not real high. Let, yeah. let me look that one up here real quick. Uh, he was not a really highly ranked guy. John Tenuta didn't think he ran well enough to play at Notre Dame, right? So it just shows you how great he, they did. And then he ran right. four, five, eight at the combine. Correct. Yeah. And uh, he he was the consensus three star pick that that uh, was ranked as the number five hundred and sixty three overall player in the country, right? Guys, just find elite players. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that every time Notre Dame gets a three star, you rejoice and do backflips because he may turn out to be the next Tyler Eifert. That's not what we're saying. Right. And that's not what we said about Ben Minich. Right. I mean, in fairness, but every five star is not going to pan out either. I could tell you right now, there's some five stars. Notre Dame got him. I'm like, that's going to be great for recruiting. But like, I remember when Ohio State signed Tate Martell's like, that's going to be great for recruiting because everybody thinks this kid's a great player, but he's not, you know, helped him with recruiting. But what did Tate Martell do in college? Five star quarterback. He wasn't that good. Right. It's about finding great players with great potential. Some higher floors. Some lower floors, and that's the balance you got to strike. And that's not always what Notre Dame did a good job of. They were able to find the great sleeper guys that needed time to develop, right? What they need to do a better job of, and this is where I will embrace what Sonador is saying, they need to start bringing in some more dudes that can be dudes right now. Mm -hmm. That's the Peyton Bowens, the Keon Keelys, the Jaden Greathouses, the guys like that, right? The Quentin Nelsons, who was a stud by the time he was a red freshman. You know, I mean, that that's the reality. Find great players. I will never say you can win a title with 22 just good players starting. You're going to be a playoff team, but you will not be a championship team. You need stars. You need stars. But those aren't five stars, right? Mm -hmm. If he would have left the five-star part out of this question, I'm sorry, assuming it was a he. If he would have left the five-star part out of this, I would have probably been more, yeah, I think you're right, and not said as a whole lot. It's the five-star part that gets me. You know, they've got to get more great elite players. But I don't right. care if they're Jeremiah Wusukor, Mose, and Tyler Eiferts, or if they're Aaron Lynch's and, you know, you know, pick a guy, right? And in matter of fact, the five stars in Notre Dame haven't hit at an incredibly high rate. I mean, Max Redfield wasn't, you know, didn't play to that potential. Aaron Lynch obviously flamed out after a year. I mean, played great when he was here. You know, Jalen panned out. Quentin Nelson panned out. But some of the others didn't pan out. You know, so uh, while other, you know, a two star Navy transfer named Elohi Gilman turned out to be, you know, one of your better players in the last decade. So that, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm where I'm looking at it. But Good question. God Country Notre Dame Barbecue. Uh, what can you tell us about Maris Lufau? He seems to be elusive to the media during their practice time. Is there a reason for this? I don't want to speculate what Notre Dame's reason is. I have asked a million different people about this. I have heard he is not injured. I I have been told he's played in all the scrimmages. I just think it's one of those things where we haven't seen a lot. Look, the day after – the last time they had a full media session, Ryan, it was right after the scrimmage. Well, yeah, you're not going to have a guy coming off of a season-ending injury necessarily getting all the reps the day after you had a hard physical scrimmage. I've also been told by some people that they are kind of rotating days – when the veterans are coming out and kind of, hey, we're going to pull back the reps. Because remember what Marcus Freeman said at the very beginning of camp? Was, we're not going to ask guys to go 80%. It's our job to then limit their reps. 
So you're not going to say, hey, Marist, let's take it easy today. No, you're going to say, hey, Marist, we're pulling you out of these drills today, right? Mm -hmm. Mental day for you. And, and I actually I actually kind of like that approach. Hey, let's not wear them down. Let's not overdo it. You know, you've also got to know Marist is kind of a high energy guy, you know, so you got to kind of, you know, pull that back. Well, you're not going to pull that back by telling Marist, hey, go 80%, because you know what? I don't think Marist is capable of that. <laughs> I don't. And I don't think you should. I think the way he that was such a great comment. I I never liked the whole, well, we're going 90% today. Well, what does that mean? Like, I mean, do they have a clock that they can, oh, oh, dude, you went 93%, you're overdoing it. I mean, no, you practice how you want them to play. I don't ever want a guy to play at 90%. So if you want them to, to not have as much workload, then take them off the field and put somebody else in there to get that guy some reps, you know? So I think there's some of that. And I think that has led to a lot of speculation that I just haven't been able to verify. I've literally, every single source I've had said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. He seems fine. And if if that wasn't if that wasn't the case, they would tell me and I just would ignore the question because I can't give injury information. But I'm just telling you, everyone has said, no, he's fine. Just like a lot of the other veterans, it's just they're pulling back on him at times. And I, I do think there, Ryan, do you think maybe there's also maybe a little gamesmanship there too? That how they're using Maris, they don't necessarily want to, because Al Gold's been in the NFL for a minute, and you mm -hmm. you and I both know that NFL coaches make NFL coaches make college paranoid college coaches seem like open books. You know, you know what I mean. So maybe there's some games and shit to it too. Maybe you know they just don't want to. They don't want people reporting on. You know, hey man, Maris Lufa had three sacks on pressures or something like that today's practice or something like that. Who knows? Who knows? I, th I think it's like I mean in basketball, what do they call it? Load management. Like, yes. that's what I think it is. Honestly, yeah. it's like you kind of know what, what well, it's funny. You don't know what Marist is on the field yet. Right. But I, the coaches were excited about him last spring. Right. And they're excited about him this spring. Right. And I think it's just something where it's, you know, you, you have, you have, you have kind of a tangible understanding of what he's going to do, I think. And I, I don't think that there is a need to push him to the brink because there is still, I mean, he's still coming back from an injury. I know he came back later in the year to practice and all that good stuff, but I mean, you don't want to repeat a last year where he gets hurt in fall camp or, you know, in the right. summer, whatever it was like, you, you want him to be able to be available. So I expect to see Maris Loy foul. I, I, yeah. I, I think there's more behind the scenes than what is being let on. So right. just leave it at that, I guess. We'll see, though. But yeah, Maris, Maris breakout season is still in effect, folks. It's still right. in effect. Right. We haven't heard anything different. And yeah, so we'll have to we'll have to see about that. Let's get to the next question. Uh, Hulk Strongest said, morning, guys. Let's just say in a perfect world, Notre Dame beats Ohio State just as bad as Michigan did. Do you guys think any recruits might flip to Notre Dame? Immediately? No, not immediately. I think it's yeah. about like, I think it's about getting things going in a solid direction, yeah. right? Like that, that's, it's more like you're, you're reversing momentum, anything Hulk strongest in my opinion. Like, I don't think there's a player that's like on the fence between Notre Dame and Ohio state that is, that is committed to Ohio state that would just be like, Oh, that's the difference maker. Like I'm flipping type of thing. Like, I mean, you can start the transition type of thing, but I, I don't, I don't think that that's like the nail in the coffin. <laughs> per se. Like, I don't think Are so. you saying you don't think if the kid's literally back and forth and having trouble deciding that that game may not be an influence? Oh, no, or are you in saying that situation? I, okay. I, I think you're saying I was answering is Ohio I don't State. think there's any player that is in that situation. Okay. Right now. So yeah. you're not saying like if they wanted, I'm trying to think of a guy, if they were trying to flip Arville Reese, yeah. right? Or so, whatever. I'm just first kid yeah. that popped in my head yeah. uh, that all of a sudden he's going to flip just because they beat him. I agree with you on that. I agree with yeah. you on that completely. If yep. there are some kids like in the 2020, I where I think that game would have the biggest impact is on 2024. So like and no, no name's trying to recruit. Some, be there, yeah, and there's so. some DBs from Ohio, Aaron Scott from Springfield. There's as a Bryce West, I think is the kid's name from Glenville. Maybe yep. it helps you with them. Maybe uh, I think it has a big impact in recruiting. I think it helps solidify your current class. I think it, it might help you close on some guys. But like what I don't think it does, I don't think it means Jason Moore's calling Notre Dame that Tuesday and says, "Hey, I made a mistake. I'm coming to Notre Dame." Right. I don't. I don't think it's that. I don't think it's That's that my point. Yep. Could it be a thing that maybe gets Keon Keeley to rethink things? Yes, I do think it could. Because yeah. one of the things that Ohio State or, or Alabama and Ohio State are using against Notre Dame is, hey, dude, you want to win a championship? We, we've shown you we can do that. And right. Notre Dame hasn't beaten those teams in the field. Like they're over against Ohio State, Alabama, and Georgia under Brian Kelly's tenure. And the only win they have against Clemson was the one game they played without Trevor Lawrence. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that's the facts. Say, say whatever you want about it, but that's a fact. And so beating one of those teams in a situation where there aren't some asterisk that you can place by it because C.J. Stroud's out or, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba and Travion Henderson don't play or something like that, then, yeah, that's a, that's a needle mover for those uncommitted kids to where it doesn't mean that Keon calls – this is to Ryan's point – it doesn't mean Keon calls Notre Dame the next day and says, hey, you know what, I'm back. But I do think it opens up that window and puts that thought in his head like, you know what, these things that they were telling me, I can do that at Notre Right, which is ultimately where I think Keon, deep down in his heart, what it is. I just think he's got some other things that have sort of distracted it from what made him so high on Notre Dame and recruit so hard for Notre Dame for all those years. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I think about that. So I think we're I think we're kind of saying the same thing, Ryan. I think we're yep. I think we're it's about the decision yeah. making process. You have to yeah. plant the idea in the head before you take action, usually. Yep. <laughs> but yes. Yep. Chris O'Connell says, hey, what's going on, everyone? First time follower to the show. Welcome, Chris. We appreciate you. We'll be at the home opener on the 10th. So will we. We will be having a tailgate on the 10th. So uh, welcome aboard. We we appreciate that. Jason Smith asked, did Kevin Austin use all of his eligibility? No. He could have come back for 2022 and should have come back for could, 2022. Didn't he, have, he had two more years, technically, didn't he? Because he Potentially. Because yeah. he was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. Uh, would, would have been his fifth year, but technically he could have come back because of the COVID yeah. year. Yes, but gotcha. there was no way he was going to come back in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> you just wish you could get him to be the other one. This is a history yeah. question, Ryan. If you were drafted in war, World War II, what theater of war would you want to go to? Pacific, Italian, or German? All um, you. <laughs> I, I'm not a big fan of boats. Like I'm, I, so I, I would not be a. I would not want to be in the Pacific. I, I, as much as I would love to be a fighter pilot, and I think they're amazing, I I don't like heights, so I don't I don't think that would have been that would have been great for me. So I, I would have been I would have wanted to be in the European theater somewhere. You know, I mean, both neither of those were easy. I'd probably you know go to the Italian theater because maybe then the food might be a little bit better. You know, so uh, but true. no, I mean, um, like I've said before, my my grandfather fought in the the Battle of the Bulge. So it's one of the, I think it's one of the areas where you got a, a bronze star. So uh, I've got his uh, military record is one of the things I got when he passed away. I didn't know that. I didn't know he had, uh, actually, let me pull it up. I think he had three, three of those, I believe. But uh, I didn't know that until after he passed away, because he did not like to talk about, um, he did not like to talk about his military history, his time in the military a whole lot. And we talked, we talked about it a little bit more, as he kind of got closer to passing away, mm-hmm. but um, he he didn't like to talk about it a lot, to be honest with you. But um, like he uh, he had a before maybe about a year before he passed away, he actually had a box of a lot of souvenirs, not souvenirs, but just mem- memories from then. And one of them was a swastika patch that he took off of a dead German soldier, not in any kind of way to revere it, but just more of like a this is what we fought against kind of thing you know this is what we were up against it was a symbol of hate and 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 that's what i think something that that he had mentioned to me is like that was the thing that they had a hard time grasping after the war when things started coming out about what happened with the jewish people and things like that it's like you had a hard time understanding how people could have so much hate towards a you know towards a group and i and i don't know if americans really thought like really grasped that until they got over there and just saw the because people that have that kind of ideology, my Ryan, I mean, they're they're gonna, I mean, they're gonna be a breed of people that like you know, they're not backing off of it just because you make a good, sound, rational argument. You know, to go that deep into the 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 level of hate, you're just not gonna, mm-hmm. you're just not gonna go go back from that. But I'm I'm trying to find uh, trying to find that picture that I have, and I can't find it. But um, yeah, I would probably say the Italian theater, German theater for me. I would have, I would have been a much better on the ground boot you know, guy. I don't think I would have been much of a soldier anyway, which is why I didn't join the military. But if I was drafted, which is what the question was, I think I would have been better in one of those. I, I don't know. Are you a boat guy, Ryan? Like, do you like? Being, I don't like being out in the ocean. I, I'm just Boats are okay. I like cruises. I, it's like because, indifference. Yeah, like, I'll go on one occasion. Yeah. But it's not like I fiend to go on a boat or whatever. But I'll handle a cruise because I, number one, I can kind of remind myself as much as possible that i'm not on a boat but it just seems yeah, bigger it doesn't me, really feel so. like you are so yeah, yeah yeah but like being out on boats in the ocean like i'll go I, I you know where i like boat i like boats and like rivers and stuff that i can swim to shore 
That's that's mm-hmm. my thing. We're like, I don't want to be on a boat where I'm out and I'm okay. I'm not swimming ashore and I'm getting eaten by a by a shark or you know what I mean. Like just no, sorry. I probably shouldn't have watched like Jaws as a kid. Kayaking like that kind fun. of kind of jack. But yeah, if if your thing goes over, you can swim to shore though. I mean that's unless exactly. you get bashed in the head on a going around a, a, a corner. But yeah. Anyway, yep. so that's that's my stance, Rob. Interesting question. Dave, country boy, what is your opinion on how many sacks will the defense have against Ohio State? We kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, Ryan. You want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I said I said I thought that the number is a little arbitrary because I think it's more about the amount of pressure that you have on Bryce Young, like force him into bad mistakes, get, getting some hits on the quarterback, pressures, hurries, all that type of stuff. But I think I threw out three and a half as the number, and I went over three and a half, and I'll, I'll still stick to that. But I'm much more concerned with how I'm affecting him in the pocket than I am necessarily getting him on the ground. Like it, it matters. Of course, like I want to get him on the ground in, in certain situations, obviously, but I'm much more worried about just rattling him a little bit. So I think pressures, hurries, those types of things matter more, but I set the over under three and a half and I said, I, I would go over. So about four ish is a good number. I think. All right. Tony Spag. Nuola, I never found out this answer, but why did Tyler Buckner not play in the Oklahoma State game? Was he hurt, or did the staff want to showcase Cone before the draft? I have not heard the answer to this, but I've heard some rumblings that it was the latter. Mm-hmm. That they just the, and Marcus Freeman said it like this game is about sending the seniors out right. Yeah, and and I and then I think by the time Oklahoma State kind of had gotten some momentum it was like well now you need to kind of rally back but like i think there's this notion that if you put tyler buckner in the game all of a sudden things change and i don't think that's true because tyler buckner's not some i mean he's not barry sanders right there's a comment earlier about barry he's not a guy that okay no one's blocked but i'm gonna go do this crazy thing where i'm gonna go make this play even though no one's i mean they were getting their butts absolutely destroyed in the trenches in that game yeah I don't care who you had at quarterback. At least Jack could get the ball out to people, you know. And but I think it was just more about this was going to be Jack's game, and that's why they didn't bring Tyler in in the first half, and and that's why I don't think they were going to make that change at the end. This was going to be Jack's game. Jack went through a lot last year. Kept his mouth shut. Kept battling. Kept plugging. Shrugged off all the criticism, all the calls for Tyler to be the Tyler to be the guy. Cheered on Drew Watt, Drew Pine when Drew replaced him against Cincinnati. Was he happy about it? No, but he was he was a, he was a good soldier, so to speak. Because we just had that that World War II reference. I think it was just about doing right by Jack. That's what I think yeah. it was about, right? And I also keep telling people, don't worry too much about it because there was things that Marcus Freeman was doing in that game beyond just trying to win the game. Did he want to win the game? Yes, of course he wanted to win the game. But mm-hmm. there were some other things that were a little bit more important to, than that. Like, let me see what this coaching staff can do. Let me see who can handle this kind of thing. And he eventually did take over from what I'm told in the second half, or at least made some force some adjustments on defense. But I think that game told him a whole lot about, okay, I got to go outside the program to find me a defensive coordinator. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if he would have taken over that game, would it have really answered that question? Would he have really known where the staff was in that regard? I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have. Yeah. So. And it's not like Jack Cohn was the problem in that game. I mean, he threw for 500 something yards, right? <laughs> like it's it's exactly. not like he was like a, oh man, that guy stinks. And I can't believe they didn't put in the other backup. Yeah. Like, I mean, he threw for 500 yeah. something yards. So yeah, he played pretty well. He had a couple misses. The uh, the interception was not a good throw. And early in, it, it ended up not hurting him, but the drive where he hit Lorenzo Stodge for that touchdown pass, Braden Lindsay act, I mean, just torched a kid off the line. I mean, it wasn't even, he didn't even put a move on him. He just literally, the guy was kind of playing. They were playing tight all game into the to the field, but they were playing like they weren't pressing and jamming. And Braid just came up and just like ran right by that. He did about three or four times in the first half. Just ran, literally just ran straight by a dude and just by multiple steps. Go back and look at that first drive and look at how bad Braylon just ran past that Oklahoma State corner and Jack just underthrew it big time. If he leads him, if he th- makes the throw he threw to Kevin Austin against Florida State, that's a touchdown. But he bounced back a couple of plays later and hit Lorenzo Styles for a touchdown. I I know those that the secondary played pretty well as a unit for Oklahoma State, but like individually, the corners were not very good in mm-hmm. my opinion. Like mm-hmm. Bernard Converse was a pretty solid football player, but like Christian Holmes was just right. kind of a. He's guy. at LSU and now, right? The four, first guy you mentioned, Jared, he yeah, Jared Bernard Converse. Yeah. He started at LSU most likely. And, and Tanner McAllister was a nice player, solid. Uh, you know, but I mean, he, I mean, Lorenzo smoked him. I mm-hmm. mean. So no, in the in the Big Twelve last year wasn't what it had been in previous years. It wasn't the 
juggernaut offensive league that it had been in previous years. Uh, and, you know, and they and they had a great – I mean, their pass rush, this is what we talked about earlier, Ryan. That pass rush made that secondary look a lot better than it was. 100%. Okay, let's get to some more. Let's see, Tyler Evans, what is one thing do you think that will kill college football? I think it's already happening, and that is is that as long as it's about making more money, nothing else matters. Espe- think, especially with people yeah. that are not going to set – standards or boundaries or anything right. like it's it's something i think the ncaa is going to kill college football that i yeah. guess really like yeah. they're not I, until they they have Agreed. some type of standard in place man like it's just the wild wild west and it's not gonna it it because we saw and this was more a, i forget what sport it was but there's a, a young a, no it was malachi nelson malachi nelson just signed with it with a sports agency and it's was like it clutch sports right i yeah. think it was clutch yeah and if if agencies are starting to get involved in this guys then it is going to get way worse before it gets any better because the ncaa until they put some standards or regulations on it i mean if you think if you think that parents are money hungry or relatives are money hungry wait until agents get involved like it is going to get awful they're going to want more upfront money then they're going to want these kids not play their junior years yep it's 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 gonna it's gonna be bad now listen i'm all for maximizing revenue as long as it's done within the framework of are we staying true to what this game is about i am all about creating opportunities for players to make money off their name image like likeness big supporter of that but it's got to be done the right way and the way it's going now it's it's you're negotiating contracts you're not actually getting deals to make money off of your name image and likeness and uh that to me greed is really what it comes down to right there's nothing wrong with making money Every decision we make is built on how can we make create a stable business at Irish Breakdown, right? Because it's a business, but it's always done with, but it's got to be true to the product. The product, there are things that we could do that would make us more money. There are articles that Ryan and I have talked about we could write. They're like, nope, that's not who we are, right? And we both agree, which is why we're working together, but it would make us more money. There are, there are things I could report that would completely burn sources of mine that I promise you would get 100,000 page views. And that would make me a lot of money. It's not worth it because we're going to stay true to what we believe in is what makes Irish Breakdown special. And we've lost sight of that in college sports. It's no longer about the tradition of the game, creating, developing young men. Nobody cares about that anymore. No, The national media does not care about what type of young people we're creating anymore. I right, get them money. Uh, okay. How about you guys do an expose on whether or not these kids are going to class, whether they're getting real educations? You know what I mean? Like, how about we do that? No, nope, can't. Sorry, because that's that's going to hurt our 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 money maker, and that's what's to me killing college football. And this again, this is not a I'm against making money. I'm not. I actually think there's things they do if they were smart. They're trying to go for the easy money. I think there are things that the NCAA was really smart, and if ESPN was really smart, that they would do things differently that would make them even more money. But it would be a little bit more risk involved because you can't guarantee you don't you don't, you know the model of a fourteen plan and you know the money that's going to make. You know some other things would create more. So I think it's I think it's greed, Ryan. And you whether it's NCAA or it's just it comes down to one thing: it's greed. Mm-hmm. Mike Reddy asks, I'll ask you this, Ryan: Which freshman do you think will have the biggest increase in snaps from the beginning of the season to the end of the season? One of the corners, I, okay. I, Jaden Mickey. Probably like I think he'll mix in early on, but I think by the end of the season he could be playing significant amount of snaps uh, potentially. And that's not even a shot at Clarence Lewis. That's just like a general maturation that I think that Jaden Mickey is on that trajectory. Like I think that yeah. he's going to be able to challenge for one of those spots. So I, I would say one of the rookie corners, uh, freshman corners. So Tobias Merriweather would even be in the conversation potentially sure. on but offense. I, I th- yeah, yeah. But I, I think that for me, I would I would go Jaden Mickey in this in this conversation. I understand why you would say Tobias Merriweather, and that was my gut reaction on offense too. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it would be, you know, because Tobias is going to play early, but he's going to continue to play even more, you know. Mm-hmm. And, but I actually think it's going to be one of the tight ends. I think one of the tight ends is maybe going to play a little bit against Columbus, but one of them at least, and it could be both, is going to be playing a lot more by the end of the season. And another guy, I agree with your your corners, but I think another guy to keep an eye on is is. Um, obviously junior to Alamaka 
because I don't think he's going to play a ton against Ohio State. I don't think he is, but I think by the end of the year, he's going to be playing a lot. It doesn't mean he's going to be beating out J.D. Bertram. I think he's just going to play more. He's going to have a bigger role That's as the season one. goes on. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Smith at Smith asks, would you prefer to have Lindsay as an inside receiver or the outside considering him the speedy brings? He's an outside guy. Outside. Outside. Clearly. 100%. Yeah, he is. I want him vertical. I want him in. I want him on taking the top off. I want him running. I want him running this way or this way as fast as he can. That, that's what I want Brayden Lindsey doing. Because I, I think I think he he changes directions okay, but like he's a straight line player right. more than he is like a quick twitch player, right? right. Like so, yep. put him on the outside and to the to your point about taking the top off. You can take the top off from the slot too, but like it's easier to take the top off on the, as an outside receiver. Yeah. You want a little bit more of a shifty guy or a bigger yeah. guy. And he's not either one of them. Not that he's, again, he's not stiff. He's not, it's just, his game is vertical speed. Yes. Vertical speed, speed. That's the key. Running that's point A to point B as fast as he can. That's that right. Game. And that's right. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But to the point is to Ryan's point, it can be utilized better outside than it can be inside. Yep. Next question, Ian Johnson. How do you think the CFB landscape would be different in the Big Ten if the Big Ten didn't end up playing football in 2020? It's a good question. How would the landscape be different if the Big Ten didn't end up playing in football in 2020? Ian, I think you kind of stumped me a little bit. I'm trying to think. Part of me says that I don't think it would have changed much because you still would have had college football. Because the reality right. is, is once the ACC decided to play. I think, you know, what's funny is the best way to describe the 2020 season is with the SEC shorts clips because they had mm -hmm. two of them. And the first one was the SEC is going it alone. You remember, did you ever see that SEC shorts clip, Ryan? Yeah. The Big yep. Ten's going crazy. You can't do this. It's nuts, right? And then the ACC jumps on board. You know, that girl played, you know, that, that was the ACC jumps on board. And then the Big 12's like, okay, because that's exactly what happened. The SEC said, we're playing. Mm -hmm. And then the ACC, largely because of Notre Dame, decided to play. Notre Dame had a yeah. big influence on the ACC playing that year. And then once the ACC said we're on board, then the Big 12 jumped on board. And that at that point in time, the season was on. You were going to have mm -hmm. a season. Well, then the Big 10's like, well, we can't not play. All right, and then the Pac-12 was like, what are you doing, Big 10? Okay, we'll follow along. And that's what I loved about the SEC shorts because you had that kind of nerdy-looking dude that was just doing whatever the Big 10 said, which is like so true. At the yeah. time, anyway, I don't know if it's the same way now. They got a new president, but at the time, it was definitely true. And then the second version of that SEC clips thing was like after week one, and you got the Big Ten 12 got like thrown up because remember they had those upsets in week one where all the Big 12 teams got beat. Mm -hmm. uh, but then then the Big Ten comes strutting down the highway, <laughs> like, oh, we're with you now, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I mean, ha had they not played, I think it would have, I think the landscape would have changed because I think it would have hurt the Big Ten in a big, big way. They'd have lost a ton of revenue. I think that they would have they would have been in a tough financial bind, which interestingly maybe would have expedited some of the moves they, they moves they've already made. I mean, part of the reason that they're pushing these deals are happening as quickly as they are is because there's a lot of teams that need the money in flux, sure, because they're they're still hurting from the. COVID. I mean, Notre Dame, as, as soundly as they run their institution, they suffered during the COVID. I mean, they did during the COVID stuff because there was people laid off and you know, sales, different things like that. And, yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah, ticket sales are a big one. You know, they yeah. made more TV money, but they lost millions by not selling tickets to yeah. games. There's just a lot of different things. You, know, you didn't have vending. You, I mean, just a lot of those things that you lost. Part, I mean, think about all the money they make and the, just on, it's like $100 to be in the joy slot. You know, hundred some dollars to just get a parking pass in the joy slot and think, you know, all the cars that are people are taking. So mm -hmm. uh, everybody suffered, but some of those conferences are suffered even more because of just how they just, they live outside their means. And that's, that's what people say, how do athletes go broke? And it's some of it's, they get manipulated and they, but a big part of it is you're spending every dime you have. Right. And when you stop making the amount of money you have, your expenses don't go down all of a sudden. You're like, well, I got, I've got, you know, I'm living a lifestyle that requires me to make $5 million a year, but I'm making $1 million a year. Okay. You got problems, <laughs> right? So that's a problem because people are saying, Hey man, you know, don't worry about paying your bill. We understand your contract. No, they're gonna say, Hey man, I want my money. <laughs> and that's how it's going to be. And that's, that's why you got to be smarter and live within your means and save for the future to a degree, live your life, but save for the future. That's my advice for you. Right. 
All yeah. right, here's a good one. Robert Bishop asks, if I saw a clip of receivers practicing catching low balls and off-script throws, is this an example of Stucky thinking outside the box, or do most receiver coaches emphasize this? Okay, here's the thing. It's great by Stucky's doing that. Uh, I did that. Right? I mean, I would do drills where I would have guys on their knees, and I would throw the ball low, and they'd have to work on getting their hands low and then rolling their chest underneath it, right? You know, that's simulated dive. You don't just catch the ball and let it hit the ground. You have to catch your ball and then work on rolling. They weren't going to roll like that in a game, but if their thought right. process was that, they were going to roll enough to where they'd be able to protect the ball. Sure. Right? Because at D3, we didn't have replay. We had to make sure that the refs got it right the first time. You work on those things. Most receiver coaches do work on those things to a degree. How seriously mm -hmm. they take it is going to determine whose guys are really good at catching off balls. I've seen Chancey Stucky doing a lot of that stuff in the clips that Vince and the guy sent me from fall camp. It mm -hmm. is ridiculous that people are looking at this like, wow, is this a new thing? Is this something most coaches do? Because they weren't doing that. I mean, it's – it's. Wow, they're, being, they're, they're working against press coverage? Who would have <laughs> – Wow, they're, they're working – yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. They're working oh on goodness. releases? Wow, Brayden Lindsay has yeah. a release package as a fifth-year yeah. player? Mm. Wow. Oh. Super chat from Alan Watson. Alan, thank you very much. Is the, the, do the Irish need a dominating win against Ohio State to get national respect, or will they accomplish the same if we just eke out a win? I think we need at least one dominating win between Ohio State and Clemson to get respect. I don't agree with that. I just think they need to win. I think you need to win. Just win. Yeah. Nobody yeah. cared that 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 Clemson only beat Notre Dame by two. That They yeah. got a huge boost from that just by winning. Same thing with beating Alabama the next year. It, it wasn't about style points. It's, wow, they beat Bama. Wow, they beat, yeah. you know. It's about winning. I mean, look at how people reacted about Notre Dame after they beat Clemson in double overtime without Trevor. The, yep. Notre Dame got a lot of love the next few weeks for that. A lot of love for that. Of course, it all evaporated when they got curb stomped in the ACC title game. But they got a, even with all the circumstances, Notre Dame got a lot of love. If Notre Dame goes into Columbus and beats Ohio State 31 to 30, mm -hmm. they'll get a ton of love for it. Now, Just they'll always maybe. be the haters. They could win by 30. If, if they win by 30, Paul Feinbaum's going to say, well, Ohio State's clearly overrated. In, but who cares what he thinks? I'm saying most people that are care about being objective will will give them credit. I don't care how many points they win by. There's no mm -hmm. doubt. Same with Clemson. Just win. That's the key. Just win. Just I don't win. I don't I don't care. We're talking about the great Miami game in 1988, how that was the game that really put Notre Dame on the map that year. They won by a point. I don't care. Win. Just win. That's all you need to do. Just win. Thank you for the super chat, by the way. Josh Klein, make with the super chat. I don't think we have the real Tyler Buckner. He just seems like a gamer, a different player in the game. Yes, he practices hard, but a switch goes off in a game. I think there's something to that. I think there's yep. something to that. But he has, I mean, look, I kind of feel like maybe this is a comment in reaction to some of the other things being reported, Ryan. But from everything I've heard from sources, from my guys that are at practice, Tyler Buckner has been really good at most practices. And especially, this is coming from sources, especially since he was named the starter. You heard the Notre Dame players talking about that, too. Defensive players also. Brandon Joseph made a comment, like, ever since he's been named starter. No, it was it Michael Mayer? One of those two guys, like, ever since he's been named starter, he's just raised his game to another level. That's so that's what I'm hearing. Other people aren't, and that's okay. It's all right. I've had, like, there's been some reactions to, okay, I'll just say it. Tim Priester's had some comments about how he just, he hasn't been impressed. That's Okay. Right. That's mm -hmm. his opinion. That's what he's seen. I respect him. I got a great deal of respect for Tim. This isn't some conspiracy where he hates Tyler Buckner. People can see things differently. Right. Our guys see it differently. My sources say one thing, his, but it, it's okay. Not everything is a, is a battle of, oh, this guy has a different of opinion than we think. So let's crush him. Let's destroy him. Call him a hater. It's just not that way. See things differently. I tend to not agree with him based on what my guys are telling me who I trust, who, who know football. That was not a shot at Tim. I'm just saying, I'm just speaking, striving my guys and my sources. Uh, everybody's fired up about Tyler right now. And they weren't as fired up in the spring because of the fact that, you know, he, it was spring. It was evolving process. I just don't care what he does in the spring. I care about what he does in fall camp. Spring is about mental, Ryan, and getting into rhythm. And it's yeah. the mental part. Fall is when you get your timing and your accuracy and your decision making down. So the, the one thing to the gaming gamer narrative, though, I'll say is that the one thing that I keep reiterating about Tyler Buckner is I think that he's one of those kids that just is kind of the same guy all the time. And mm -hmm. that is big for the mental side of the quarterback position. You know, like there's some guys that I think their highs get too high and the lows get too low. And uh, Tyler Buckner is not a player that I think fits that description. I think that will be able to handle some 
adversity, some down moments. I think he'll be kind of the same guy throughout there. That's why I have a lot of confidence in him, not just because I think he has a good arm and he's a really great mm-hmm. athlete and all these things, but I, I think that he gets it from the mental side of things, which gives me hope, it gives me a lot of hope yeah. for the year, for the future for him. Yeah, I think that's a part that you're right, Ryan, is is not getting enough love. It's yeah. it's he's a he's a smart football player. Yeah, like, uh, he's a smart football player, and we'll we'll see that. We'll he's see. Just, that he's just out. like one of those kids that just seems like he knows how to carry himself. Yeah. You know, like he just yeah. is is mature, very mature for his age. Right. I'd say. Yep. Sean S. with a super chat. Planning on day of post game shows this year. Absolutely. So just say it now. We're gonna have a Monday, two Monday shows, two Tuesday shows, two Wednesday shows, two Thursday shows. We'll get into the specifics of those here next week. We will have a Friday show. It's going to be a prediction show this year, not a mailbag. Our mailbag is now going to probably be Wednesday night uh, with Sean on Wednesday nights. So that is probably going to be our mailbag night. And and then we're going to have our Friday is going to be predictions for Notre Dame games and a couple key games that weekend. Saturday, 10 a.m. will be our C- – and we're going to start that tomorrow. will be our, our IB countdown to kick off. We'll pre- preview the Notre Dame games and then the biggest games of the college football weekend. After the game, we will have a post-game show. It will be me, Ryan, Sean Davis, and Vince most weeks. Some weeks one of us may not be there, but the plan is for us all four to be there as much as we can. And then Sunday night, it's going to be 7 p.m. on Sunday nights. Vince and I are going to have an upon further review. We're going to get in the film room, break down the film, kind of talk about some things that we noticed after breaking down the film. Going to try to get a couple technological technological things going for that game that we'll hopefully be able to do and still be mon- still monetize it. Uh, but that is our plan as of right now. So we will have post-game shows. We're going to have a lot more video content this year than we did last year. There's no doubt about that. We will also continue the daily mailbags. We are not going to do a lot of three-hour shows during the season. But, you know, hour for the first part, hopefully like about an hour for the for the mailbag, and then, you know, we'll get back to rocking and rolling. So uh, we will definitely have a lot of content for you. And then uh, there's a couple of things we're planning, but I don't want to say it because I don't want to promise something I can't deliver. I've already done that too many times here this past year with things that I wanted to do, but just other things come up and just can't get quite get to it. But um, that is that is uh, our plan as of right now. Th- those things that we just said, those are definites. We've already scheduled them. We're already set. We're already rocking and rolling with those. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing in season. So good question, Sean, and gives us a chance to talk about it. Richard Evans with a super chat. Who gets the last spot in the playoff, in your opinion? A uh, a one close loss to Ohio State, Notre Dame, or a one loss Georgia in the SEC championship? I I I need a little bit more context than that. Um, yeah. How convincing were Notre Dame's wins? How convincing were Georgia's wins? Yep. You said it was a close loss for Notre Dame. Was it a close loss for Georgia? I think there's a lot of different factors that I would need, Richard. So my guess would be a, a a Notre Dame losing a close game to Ohio State, in my opinion, if they run the table, Ryan, I just don't see them not being in the playoff. I just I just don't. I think they're a playoff team. If they if they have that scenario where they go eleven and one, beat Clemson, beat USC, beat what BYU, beat all those teams, I think I think you're barring Ohio State losing two games the rest of the way. I think those are two playoff teams. I'm still working on my final playoff predictions this year. Uh, haven't made them officially yet, but I'm leaning actually towards potential rematches. So like the playoff being four teams that have all played each other in a regular season. I'm just one of my fourth team I'm having a hard time with. I'm having a really hard time with. So we'll, we'll see. But I, I would lean towards Notre Dame being the the, the winner in that one because I, yeah, based on history as well. When Notre Dame's a one loss team with that kind of loss and then run the table, they're usually in the top four at the end of the year. And and you and you got the loss out of the way in the beginning of the season, which gives which gives you time to right. You know, kind of right. right the ship, I guess, if you want to say it Correct. that way, or ride momentum into the Correct. into the the playoffs. Yeah, right. So, well, I mean, yeah, and you say, well, you know, one lost Notre Dame team last year didn't get in over Georgia, who lost, but yeah, but that Notre Dame didn't beat anybody, there. right? I mean, it's yeah. it's a it's a fair initial response, but like they didn't beat anybody last year. Right. Their one loss was an embarrassing eleven point home loss to Cincinnati. Right? This is a yes. close road loss to Ohio State. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Maltavius asked with well, a super chat. Thank you. Happy Friday. Thank you, Maltavius. Uh, love the picture of his kid in there with the Irish breakdown hat on, by the way. Oh, yeah. Is there any way we really lose a bit the big game on 9 3 by 18 points or more? Asking for a friend, go Irish, uh, Lou Holtz. So I, um, I'm, I'm not going to predict a victory, but I would be shocked if it was a lopsided game either yeah. way. I'm just going to leave it like that. Like, I just, 
I'd be very surprised. I have a lot. I have confidence in this Notre Dame team. Again, not predicting a victory, but I, I think it's going to be a good football game. And yeah. <laughs> losing by 18 or more is not a good football game. <laughs> like, that's no. just not. So it's not the only effort, way not. I would say it is if it was something crazy late, like the Wisconsin game, where, right. like, you know, you fumble because you're trying to go in or you turn it over on downs as your own 35 with two minutes left. And, you know, they, they go down and punch it in to go up 11. And then, you know, you throw a pick six at the end of the game. I mean, I just, I'd be shocked. Now, if you listen to a lot of the Ohio state videos, it's, it's just a, like, they really think Notre Dame sucks. Like I they do, I, I, like they don't know how to pronounce kids' names. They don't have any clue what they're looking at in a lot of instances. But they they think that this is – like honestly, if it was a 14-point game, there's going to be people that cover Ohio State who thinks that's a bad win for Ohio State. I They should have beat them by more. I mean, it is nuts. Like even Georgia fans had some level of respect for Notre Dame going into that game and even more coming out of both of those games. But for Ohio State, there is zero – I mean, they think they're playing Indiana. And they really do. They think they're getting ready to play Indiana. It is the wildest thing that I've seen. And 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 that's someone who grew up in Ohio. Like I know they're an insane. And it is, I mean, oh my gosh. It is wild. It is wild. Every every part of fan bases are insufferable no matter who it is, but like it has been magnified. It's the lack of season. knowledge that I hear from so many of them. Like it's one thing if you're a homer and you you know, hey, I, I I'm always pick them to win. Like they can barely sure. pronounce kids' names. They have like no context for who these kids are. I mean, it's just it's it's wild. It's mm-hmm. wild. Uh, I mean, it just it's a lot nuts. of a lot of them don't even know who the starting quarterback is. No, like, uh, their like their new quarterback is Tyler Buckner. You know, no concept. He was a top hundred recruit. No clue yeah. who Isaiah Foskey is. It's just it's why it's wild. Wild. Yeah, and Archer just said, you know, the uh, the big game boomer guy said, you know, yeah. Notre better Notre better Dame. Than Notre so Dame. a lot, a lot of people on Twitter also just look at those lists. Is like, oh yeah. man, Notre Dame had that fluky fourteen point win over Purdue last year. You know, yeah. you know how that goes. Shelton Hager says, "I've been uh, thank you for the super chat, Shelton. Hope you and your family are doing really, really well, man. Uh, always thinking about you. I've enjoyed all the recruiting stuff for the last few months, but boy, am I excited about watching and talking about some actual football games, man. You have no idea." No idea how fired up I am to be able to focus more on the team now and less on the recruiting stuff. I mean, oh my gosh, Ryan, it, it is. And you're a recruiting guy right now, I man. It's your job, yeah. but man, uh, there's nothing like football games. There's nothing like college football games, man. Yeah the the end of the end of this summer got a little like, oh man, football needs to happen. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. There's no doubt about it. Oh my goodness, yes. All right, let's get last couple. I'm on, I, I know the question I'm ending the show on. There is no doubt about it. I know exactly the show I'm ending on, Ryan. I think you know if you go to the start section what, sh- what question I'm answering uh, last. Uh-oh. Archer says both late kick and CFB nerds did not have Notre Dame in their preseason top tens. Do you think it's disrespectful or do you think the skepticism is valid? I don't think it's either one of those things. And here, here's my thing. I've I used to listen to the CFB nerds and they used to have a different name and I don't think they're disrespectful I just think they're misguided. I don't think they like I've watched them say things about Notre Dame that I'm like dude that is not the team I study and it doesn't pan out the way that they panned it out but I remember watching them uh, I think the guy that you never see you only hear him he gets disrespectful towards Notre Dame a little bit I'm not going to lie sometimes. But I don't mm-hmm. think it's intentional disrespect. I just don't think he thinks Notre Dame is any good. He always say things like speed. Like he still lives in like the 1990s version of Notre Dame or the Charlie Weiss version of Notre Dame, where like they're not fast, yeah. and and doesn't realize like Notre Dame hasn't been slow for like a long time outside of the 2020 team because of Kevin Austin got hurt, right? Lindsey got hurt. I mean, you had a lot of injuries on that football team. Uh, they they have that hasn't been a real criticism in a while, in my opinion, where it's really valid in a while. And, and so, but the other guy, the guy that whose face you see all the time, he predicted the Georgia game in 2019, I think it was like 26 to 27 to 21. That's kind of right how the game played out. I mean, it, it played out exactly how it went. I don't think it's disrespectful. I just think it's incorrect. I, I don't think it's, I don't think the skepticism is valid either because what I have found is people are picking apart Notre Dame's warts while ignoring Texas A&M's. 
and ignoring yeah. Michigans and ignoring Clemsons. And I mean, you're taking teams who were worse than Notre Dame last year, who lost even more than Notre Dame lost from their roster last year, like AM, and saying they're going to be better than Notre Dame. So I think it's just more of the 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 Notre Dame bias, but I don't think it's intentionally disrespectful. I have not listened to Josh Pate much, jo- Ryan. I don't know if you've ever really listened to him. From everyone that I know that listens to his show, they say he tries to be fair. He's not some guy that gets on there and takes shots and you know does yeah. the clickbait. So I've never, no one's ever, I've never heard anyone accuse him of that. In the couple shows that I did watch of him, I didn't agree with everything he said, but I thought he was very fair. He made good arguments. He he seems to know the game. I respect that. Right? Mm-hmm. We can have a difference of opinion at that point in time. So I don't think either one of those people are disres- disrespecting Notre Dame. I I think the people that uh, that cover Ohio State that are like. Yeah, you know, probably like at least a 21-point win. Like, you're getting ready to play Indiana, you know, start the game. What was funny is I went back and watched their stuff about Oregon last year, and one of the guys predicted a 35-point win over Oregon. Like, 35. 35-point <laughs> win over Oregon. So it's like, okay, uh, it's not just Notre Dame. They're just homers. I don't think it's even necessarily disrespect to Notre Dame. It's just they think Notre Dame sucks. You know who else they think sucks? Everyone else not named Alabama. Sure. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So I don't – look, guys, every time someone disagrees with you doesn't mean it's disrespect. It just means they're misguided. If, if you believe what they're saying to be inaccurate, it just means that they're wrong in your view or they're misguided. It doesn't always mean disrespect. Some people just – Paul Feinbaum, that's straight disrespect. Yes. But that's him playing to his shtick. Like other people will disrespect Notre Dame. Not everybody's that way. I've never I've never thought that the, the CFB nerds guys disrespect Notre Dame with malice. I just think they're wrong sometimes, and it comes across as disrespectful because I think they're incorrect, but I don't think it, there's malice intended, Ryan. I don't know if you've ever listened to the CFB Nerds show. I have not. It's it's okay. I mean, I can't listen to it when they do Notre Dame just because I know Notre Dame, and I know just like, dude, come on. That's just a bad take. Yeah. You know, but but there's some of their other stuff is like, I like, I wish they were still the SEC guys because they mm-hmm. used to just be SEC guys. And you could kind of you you knew what you're getting into, you know, because like oh you're SEC guys. There's gonna be and bias, right? There, but yeah. their SEC breakdowns were really good because they had an SEC bias. So I mean, they were given kind of both teams. They had some really good stuff. I enjoyed it. And but you know, I don't think there's I don't think either one of those groups are disrespect. Some people are disrespecting their name. I don't think either one of those two guys are. That's it fair. sounds like from your reaction, you have listened to Josh Pate a little bit. Yeah, Do you agree okay. with my sentiment? I, I have no problem with Pete. Fair. I, I think I think Arch, Archer just put in the chat that his power rankings are a model base, so it's like it's an analytics right. thing, and that he yeah. actually stands up for Notre Dame a little bit. So, like, I don't like that because if you don't agree with your model, then like, why do you have your model? Like, that's my biggest thing. But I, I, I've listened to Peyton; he's fine. I have no issue with him personally. Yeah. It's uh, right or wrong. This is the thing. I don't need you to, and I've said this to Ryan before. I don't need you to agree with me. Mm-hmm. I just need you to have a reason why you don't a, right. a valid, like something where I can say, I think you're wrong, but I understand where you're coming from. That's, that's all I ever ask. And it's the same thing with non Notre Dame people. You can think Notre Dame's not a not top 10 team. I mean, look, there's, there's, I could make an argument for it. I don't believe it, but I can say, hey, look, you're com- you, you've gone 10 and nine against teams ranked in the top 20, not 10 and 10 against teams ranked in the top 25 last five years. Mm-hmm. You're what one in six against top 10 teams. Your only yep. win was a game where Trevor Lawrence, Mike Jones, Tyler Davis didn't play in the game. And you needed double overtime to win that one. Most yep. of these games against top 10 teams that you've played in the regular season have not been competitive games. Okay. Yeah, okay, I get that. What they then will ignore is that that every other team not named Bama, Clemson, or Ohio State, or Georgia has that same thing on their resume. Like, you know, don't pick Notre Dame apart and then still have AM in your top 10. Right? Like, sorry. You can't get you. I can't accept your criticism of Notre Dame when you have AM in your top 10 or USC in your top 10 or, well, Notre right. Dame doesn't win these big games. Yeah, but they've beat the crap out of USC the last five years. You know what I mean? So it's like, I can't go with you there, right? Apply the same standard. And I think sometimes Notre Dame doesn't have the same standard applied because I think some people just have a built in bias that they don't even recognize. That a, a bias like that is not disrespectful. It's just wrong, in my opinion. Right. It, it's just inaccurate. And so I think that's why. And then the group thing starts. Like I remember when I predicted LSU, Notre Dame to beat LSU in 2014, I think there was only two people in the entire Notre Dame beat who picked Notre Dame to, to win. And some people say, well, you're just doing that because you always pick Notre Dame. I'm like, well, I do normally pick Notre Dame because it isn't very often that Notre Dame is the least talented team 
on the field that day. And I kind of look at it from a coach's standpoint. I've been honest about this. I look at it from a coaching standpoint. If this is what I would do if I was coaching, and this is how you're going to get to the W. I never went into a game being like, we're going to get our butts kicked today. You know, sure. I just that's just how I look at it. But I genuinely believed after breaking down film that Notre Dame could play with that team because they were going to be healthier. They had a month off to recover from all the injuries. And I, and I didn't like that LSU team. Outside of Leonard Fournette, I was like, there's not a lot there that, that, that scares me. So I picked mm-hmm. Notre Dame to win that game. And guess what? They won. And so you get into this, well, George, Notre Dame has no chance. Remember that? Notre Dame has no chance against George in 2019. I'm like, well, I think it's going to be a really close game. I predicted Notre Dame to win by a touch, by a field goal. And guess what? They had the ball at the 48-yard line with two minutes left with a chance to go make my, my prediction correct, and they couldn't get it done. The point was, however, is that was going to be a competitive game that a lot of people just assumed Notre Dame was going to get killed because that's the perception that has been created. And to a degree, Ryan, it's a valid perception because of how Notre Dame has performed in some of these big games. My only thing is they're not alone because other teams have had – like, does does AM get the benefit of the doubt because they beat Bama? I'm sorry, but that benefit of that was lost when you went and lo- when you get went and got beat by Mississippi State like a week or two later. Like you know what I mean? Like you know you don't you don't get the benefit of that. Oh, they beat Alabama. They lost four games last year. Like okay, you beat Bama, right? Oh, all right, fine. You got your butts kicked. No, they lost b- the week before. You got your butts kicked by Arkansas. Then you went on the road and got smacked by Ole Miss, and then you lost to LSU. They had already <laughs> fired their coach. You know, it's like team. Yep. your benefit of the doubt that you got for beating AM is gone, especially since AM since Alabama, I mean, has curb stomped you the last few years. Like they're they're literally hype is coming off of a, the COVID year. They've been a mediocre team outside of the COVID year. And so it's but but that's more of an SEC bias than it is a Notre Dame hate disrespect thing, right? Would you I mean you, Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, I don't think <sighs> I mean, there's there's separating factors to it, but I mean, I agree with you for the most part. I think that there's just there's always an SEC bias because that's the people that you sure. hear from. Like you mentioned, Feinbaum. It's like, what did I expect Paul Feinbaum to say about Notre Dame? Did I expect right. him to ring the praises of of Notre right. Dame? Like he's an SEC guy. That's right. His that's exactly. His, that's his focus. He's that's not trying role. to give you that's real analysis. Title. That's the right. thing. He's not trying to give you a real analysis. I yeah. felt like when I listened to Josh, but I think I listened to like two shows. I felt like he was attempting to give honest, legitimate analysis. And and I agree with that. I enjoy shows like that. If I don't have to agree with you to like your show, as long as I feel like you're coming from a place of intellectual honesty and you're, you've done your homework. There's guys, exact the homework thing is the biggest thing for me. There's guys that have clearly done their homework and have clearly know the teams that they're talking about. And then there's people that are just clearly just, just putting a narrative out there about Notre Dame, like Notre Dame, Hasn't done this in a long time. Notre Dame is has lost these big games in recent years, and that's all they know, right? Mm-hmm. Like they don't know who's their starting quarterback this year, what what coaching hires do they make in the offseason, that all those factors that clearly matter, but they don't want to talk about that. They want to right. talk about Notre Dame has not won a big game in X amount of years. Like that's what they want to talk about. A lot about. of teams haven't done that. <laughs> you know, you're not wrong. Uh, you're we'll not see. Wrong. We'll see. They won a big game two years ago, but then it's the, well, yeah, but they didn't have Trevor. And that's fair. Right. I mean, I, I get it that. Is fair. that. I one get was that. Fair. I get that. But a lot of other teams haven't done that. Right. Sure. So, you know, they don't belong in the top three. They got to prove that, but they top five to seven easily. Like yes. I can't go. I've said, I can't go past seven. I, I I have a hard time having them lower than five. I mean, I even have a hard time accepting that Clemson's going to be better than them this year. I do. Because this is not the same Clemson team, but I understand why Clemson gets more of the benefit of the doubt. I do. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. So, but I can't go past seven. And, and I can't accept anyone that's going to put Michigan State ahead of them. And it's the same argument we had last year, Ryan, when, when we saw the North Carolina Iowa State hype. I was like, Iowa State hype. I was like, nope, not going to happen. You're nuts. You're nuts if you think that team that wasn't that good last year is going to all of a sudden be in the top 10 after losing all those players. An and 84 team, like North Texas Carolina A&M. Was wild, man. North Carolina they lost 2,000 yard rushers, 1,000 yard receiving their leading tackler, but they're going to be better than, they're going to be top 10 yes. teams after going yeah. eight and four. It was wild. And man. they got smacked wild. by Notre Dame at their place. And Kyle Hamilton got kicked out of the game in half before the halftime. Yep. And Rame still went out and won that game. The North the North Carolina hype was so wild last offseason. Didn't understand that. No. Just didn't get it. And uh, I mean, is the A and M stuff any different? No, they lost some pretty good players off their team last year. They not, lost their defensive not in, coordinator, not until, and they weren't that good. Not until they get a good quarterback in that room. Right. There's, it's just not going to happen. Doesn't make any sense. I don't get it, man. Who's their quarterback this year? 
Is it the king? Did the king? They named king, it. Probably. Haynes king. I didn't know if they named yeah, him. The most likely. Yet. I know that they, they had that freshman that came in, but I don't think he's. Going oh, to I threaten. love that kid. I don't think yeah. he's going to start as a freshman. But I love that kid. Yeah. Connor Wegman. Have you seen Wegman, him before? Yeah. I love that kid. He was one of my favorite quarterbacks. I don't. I didn't have him number one. I had Cade Klubnik, but he was probably my favorite quarterback in last year's class. You know who's in? You know who's in, in that quarterback room now is Max Johnson's also in that yeah. quarterback. Oh, room he's now. probably going to be the starter, don't you think, Mac? If he's I, healthy, I, I think someone told me it's going to be Haynes King most likely. Really? But I don't wow. know if they've announced that yet, but we'll see. I, I'll tell you what. I I mean, Max Johnson beat A and M last year. I mean, goodness gracious. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, he went twenty-two of thirty-eight for three hundred and sixty, three hundred six yards and three touchdowns. Jimbo is the most overrated quarterback guru in college football, and it's not even close. Yeah, he lucked out with Jameis Winston for a couple exactly, years. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> even though turn... I mean, if you take a look at Jameis Winston, though, Jameis was fantastic as a redshirt freshman, but he took a huge step back as a oh, redshirt yeah. sophomore. But yep. Yeah. Almost cost him a couple games, then got suspended. I mean, it just a lot of interceptions that year. Yeah. Yep. 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 So uh, let's uh, here's a about that. Jason Rose says, why does Notre Dame get hammered for beating Clemson without Trevor and other guys get, but Georgia gets the benefit of the doubt for beating Bama without Jamison and Mechie thoughts from you guys. Because, because Georgia won the national championship. Right. I mean, that's. And, and And they had to beat other teams to get there. They had to beat Michigan to get there. They had to beat teams in the regular season to get there. I think the other thing, thing too is is Jason. It's the it's the the order. Mm-hmm. If if Georgia, let's say Bama didn't have Mechie and Jameson Williams for the SEC title game, mm-hmm. and Georgia beat them thirty three to eighteen, and let's just say somehow a, Alabama still made the national championship game. And and Alabama smacked them the way they did in the in the SEC title game. Then Georgia would probably be getting this, you know, like oh, that Bama game doesn't mean anything. They didn't have Mechie and Jameson Williams. It's the order in which it happens too. Like if if Notre Dame would have lost to Clemson in the regular season, and then beat them in the ACC title game, right, without Trevor, then I think the perception be, that you'd still be talking about the injury, but you'd yep. still say, oh, you got the momentum of of winning that game. I think the timing of it matters too. But For I think sure. Georgia's won enough big games to get the benefit of it out there. Yeah. Uh, that's the other thing is is that I would say to this. They got two playoff wins now. I mean, th- well, three. But, I mean, even before the title game without that, they had two playoff wins. They beat Oklahoma in 2017, from. and then yeah. they beat Michigan last year. Notre Dame has zero. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Hey, look, it's real simple. If Notre Dame wants to stop having people say these things about them, then freaking win these games. It's yep. not that hard. You know? I mean, no one cares that you beat an 8-5 and five LSU team or a 9-4 and four LSU team. Nobody cares. Beat them when they're good. Yep. And that's the key. And that's what I always loved about the Bryant. Oh, he beat LSU twice. They were eight and five and nine and four. <laughs> Their quarterbacks were what was it, Justin Jefferson and Danny Etling. You know, I mean, was it Jordan yeah. Jefferson? I always forget. Jordan Jefferson. It was the older Jordan brother. Jefferson. You beat yeah. him and you beat Danny Etling barely. Danny Etling. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Like, come on, man. I saw he's still playing preseason football for someone. Yeah. Good for him. Yep. So whatever. <laughs> Uh, Sheldon Hager, 91. I think Archer's be, thank you for the super chat, Sheldon. I think Archer's becoming a closet Notre Dame fan. Just saying, I, I, I think he think, always has been. I think we might be able to convert him here in one of these days, man. And we'll have to see if Notre Dame wins, we're going to make a hard push to, you know, that's the flip we're going to try to make happen, Ryan, <laughs> right? If Notre Dame beats Ohio state, that's the flip we're going to try to make happen. We're going to nope, try to flip nope. Archer, Archer to Notre Dame. No NIL money though, Archer. Mm-hmm. Sorry. No, sorry. Sorry. Mountain Dew's on it. Maybe on the table though. Might be able to get you something like that. You know what I mean? So we'll have, we'll have to see. Here's the here's the last question, Ryan, mm-hmm. for Matthew Lass. This is going to be the last question, and we got to run, everybody. It's been a fun show. Really, really appreciate you. Uh, Ryan, if Notre Dame beats Ohio State on a scale of 0 to 10, how insufferable will you be on Twitter? And with 10 being the – let's go with 10 being the highest. Well, I'm, I'm already insufferable on Twitter, so I'm going to say I break the scale, sir. It's going to be a 12. It's going to be a 12 yeah. on Twitter if – Honestly, I mean, like, it's a joke, but, like, it will be the biggest win of my lifetime. Sure. Probably. Right? I mean. Yeah. Certainly of bigger... my adult life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was born in 91. So, like. I mean, your lifetime is is 93 Florida State, but that game, sure. you were two. Sure. 
right. Of games that I am old enough to remember, this would be the biggest win. What is the biggest one up to this point in time, Ryan? I don't know, Brian. I don't know. The I, I'm what's the biggest one? Um I mean they the, they beat they beat the defending national champion Michigan in ninety eight, but you were still pretty young. Yes, you I probably I don't, don't remember, remember that, that one, one right? Like Stanford with the goal line stand and Stefan Taylor sure. was a big win in my in USC twenty seventeen. Right? Yeah, that was right? a big it's win in my eleven books, win. But like yeah. yeah. Do you do you remember the Michigan win in 05? No. No, okay. someone just put uh 2012 o- Oklahoma. Sure. Yeah, that was Yeah, a, that was I a good still one. think the Stanford game was bigger than that. I, I they were I, both big that yeah. year. So I'll I'll yeah. Yeah. But like I said, the Stanford one Stanford was like a better team in my head because I was like yeah. stopping Stephon Taylor at the goal line was like, yeah. Awesome. Two reasons why Stanford's the bigger win, Ryan, for me. I know one was on the road. Number I didn't think Oklahoma was that good. They were 10 and 3. They were not that good. That that they were ranked higher at the time, but Stanford was ranked much higher at the end. Stanford was the top mm-hmm. 10 team at the end. And the other part of this is Stanford just owned Notre Dame coming. I mean, they they beat them in 09, blew them out in 2010, mm-hmm. blew them out in 2011, blew them out or let's see, let's see they last time they had been in a competitive game was 08, really. And then you go out and you beat them. I mean, that had been your kryptonite. I mean, they had mm-hmm. been your kryptonite. That was the dragon you needed to slay. And that I think that game then led to the win over Oklahoma. I don't think they beat Oklahoma if they if they lose to Stanford. I don't. I don't think they would have had the confidence they needed to do that. I really don't. You're probably right. But I still say Stanford was probably that Stanford 2012 was probably the best team that Brian Kelly beat. In my opinion, I, I know I know thirteen and one Michigan State the next year was a really good team, but they weren't that good of a team. I mean, the big it wasn't a great played, year in the Big Ten. Yeah, uh, I, I I didn't think it was, um, especially at the know. time that wasn't a huge win. They weren't even a top like, ten when, team. Well, like yeah. when they beat them, I was like, oh, that's that's cool. That's they good. were unranked. I mean, Michigan yeah, State was exactly. unranked. No, it shouldn't have been, exactly. but they were. But yeah, I remember I still, when they beat. When they beat Stanford and stopped Stephon Taylor at the goal line, I was just yeah. like, oh, man, this is, might be different. This year might be different. And the and first then... big win is always the most memorable, usually. You know, that's why 88 Miami, even though I was younger, was more memorable for me than 93 Florida State, just because it was the first one. Like, by 93, you kind of expect the Notre Dame to win that game. If you were a Notre Dame fan, you're like, why are they un- Why are they the underdog? They beat Colorado. They beat Miami a couple times. They've beat Florida. You know, they had proven that they shouldn't have been disrespected in that game. If I mean, right. you could even put it that way if, if they were. So, um, you my, know, it just – Like, my my earliest memories are, like, the last year maybe of Bob Davies' era and then oof. going into Tyra Willingham. So, like, it's oof. it's been rough, man. It's, it's not yeah. been great. It hasn't been great. Well, I know Michigan in 2006 was ranked really high. They ended up not being yeah. good that year, but that that's one for me – that that even though Michigan wasn't good that year, mm-hmm. it was memorable to me because you know Notre Dame had been so bad, and at the time Michigan was ranked number three. Mm. And so you went on the road, you beat the number three Michigan team because at the time we didn't know that Michigan was going to be kind of just okay that year. Michigan ended up uh, going seven and five that year under mm-hmm. under Coach Carr. They yep. weren't a great team. Lost to Wisconsin by three. I mean, they lost a lot of close games. Lost to Wisconsin by three. Lost to Minnesota by three. Lost to Ohio State by four. Uh, lost to Nebraska by by four. I mean, they were a good team that year, but they weren't a great team. They were again. They lost five games. Right. But when you're watching that game, you're like, this is the this is a number three Michigan team, right? This is a Michigan team coming off of a nine and three year. Uh, you know, had had if you remember correctly, they played in one of the best Rose Bowls I've ever seen the year before against Vince Young in Texas lost 38 37 mm-hmm. like that was a huge that was a great game and you're like this Michigan team's gonna be good and they went out and Notre Dame beat them 17 10 I thought outplayed them the whole game only negative was Raymond McKnight got hurt in that game but you're like oh my gosh this is a big big win for Notre Dame this is huge and then of course Charlie goes out the next week and loses at home to Michigan State in overtime but that was a big that was a big one at the time. I thought a big one at the time. Somebody said 2012 Florida State. That was another one that was considered a big game. Yeah, Greg. Like, because again, it was it was one of those ones where Brian, I don't know if you remember you probably don't remember this game either, do you? The 20 2002 Notre Dame Florida State game. 
Mm-hmm. I've joked about this before. I got in trouble that game because I kept checking my phone for updates. It's like back when they were like the green and black screens and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I kept checking my phone. We were playing Gettysburg, and I kept checking my phone to see what the score of that game was. I, I didn't start doing that till the second half. We won 45 to nothing. I didn't start checking my phone until it was like, okay, we're, we're game's over. Uh, but, you know, you, you're going into that. Notre Dame was kind of having that rebound season under Ty. They had started the season off, you know – you're feeling pretty good about your team. You climb them all the way to the number six. You're playing at number 11, Florida state. You know, people still aren't believing in Notre Dame and not only did they beat them, but like they smacked them pretty good. Like they, I mean, it's early in the game. I think it was Carlo holiday threw a bomb to Arnez battle. And you're just like, Oh my gosh, they got a shot. Ryan Grant was running on Florida state that day. That was a big one. That was a really big one. 93 Florida state and 88 Miami are the two for me of the two biggest games of, of my tenure. I mean, even bigger than West Virginia in 88, which was the national title game. But those were the two big ones because those were the dominant teams that everybody, you know, nobody thought Notre Dame could beat. So those would be the ones for me. But as far as um, the original question, Ryan, I, I'm, I am, uh, I'm probably going to stay off Twitter after that game. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> but I am going – if Notre Dame wins, and again, we'll see. Uh, you know, we'll see if they win. But if they win, I'm going to I'm gonna have some fun on that post-game show. I will say that. <laughs> I will say that. So, yeah. I'm not going to be insufferable. I mean, I'm going to be intolerable. Very yes. different. Very different. Yes, yes. I'm going to probably stay off Twitter regardless just because I don't want to be that guy that – Stays off Twitter if they lose, but goes on if they win. I that I don't want to oh. be that guy. I have uh, no problem being that. Yeah, guy. that's There's all right. No to each their own, guy. man. It's all good. <laughs> to each their own. It's just not my style. But uh, you know, uh, my ad. Let's just say I'm uh, my attitude on the um, post game show is going to be a little bit different. But, but look, end of the day, in all seriousness, if Notre Dame wants people to stop disrespecting them, then this is the kind of game you have to show out. And if you really want people to respect you, like Notre Dame will gain respect if they have a competitive close loss like Florida State in 2014. But I'm tired of almost winning being or, you know, barely losing being the thing you hang your hat on. I'm tired of that. And I I don't want to hear that anymore. I mean, it'll be a, it'll be good for the program if it's a competitive win. But for me, it, it won't be satisfying. It's it's time to start winning. It's time to start winning these games. And that's that's where I'm going to be. And so. Uh, somebody says, has Brian seen a national champion? Yes, yes, 1988. I, that was the year I became a Notre Dame fan. So I remember the Miami game that year. I remember the Michigan game that year. I remember Ricky Waters' punt return for a touchdown. I remember, you know, the, especially remember the USC game. I watched it on one of those big satellite TVs at my friend Jamison Jennings' house. I still remember that to this day. And then I remember the West Virginia game. But West Virginia game was kind of like, uh, it was sort of anticlimactic. You'd already beat Miami. You've already beaten Michigan. You'd already beaten USC. That's like three top – three teams, you know, like Michigan, I think it was ranked second when their name beat them. And Miami was ranked number one. And then USC was ranked number two. It was like West Virginia. Pff, you know, I was 10, right. You know, what did I know? Major Harris, who the heck is major Harris? You know what I mean? So uh, uh, that was a little bit anticlimactic because that was a game you're supposed to win. You had already beaten the, the good teams to kind of get there and beat the team that of course you were going to beat. Uh, so I, I remember that season. That was the, I, he said, why, why, why don't you talk about Tim Brown? He only played here because I was, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't watch college football really until 1988. That was when I, my first memory of actually watching college football. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's one. So anyway, that is, that is going to do it. Uh, really appreciate all of you all um, uh, joining the show today. This was a lot of fun. A lot of, a lot of great, a lot of great, um, and hey, Jamison Jennings didn't show me the way. They weren't Notre Dame fans. They were they were Ohio State fans. But they, I was friends with Jamison, and they let I watched at his house. But they were not they were not Notre Dame fans. I don't believe they were Notre Dame fans. So anyway, my dad is the reason I was a Notre Dame fan, as we've explained on the show before. So Ryan, that is it for today's show, man. A long marathon mailbag, but lots of great questions. Uh, a lot of great questions we couldn't get to, and we apologize, everybody. But um, I'm I I got to go. I'm tapped out, Ryan. It's Friday. It's been a long week, uh, and I've got more. I'm, you know, I'm gonna be on on tonight at seven o'clock with Tiger Bait with Preston Guy at Tiger Bait talking about my uh, my comments about uh, 
about Notre Dame and just uh, LSU and Brian Kelly and all that type of stuff. So check that out. Sign up for the message boards, everybody. Boards at IrishBreakdown.com. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. We published three new podcasts today on the CFB Nation channel. So John Garcia and I recorded. We got done like around 1130 last night recording, but he basically talked about the number one ranked recruiting class. And we broke down Alabama. We broke down Ohio State, Texas, Notre Dame. Miami is a dark horse, so we put all those up on the CFB Nation podcast channel. We cut up each one of those breakdowns individually to go on the YouTube channel. So if you're not signed up for those, everybody, go check it out. Some really good content. And, of course, we have our normal podcast stuff for irishbreakdown.com. So uh, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. Sign up for the message board. And uh, thank you, everybody, for Ryan Gunn's Top Gun fun today. So uh, we, we will make sure that Ryan gets to go see Top Gun here very soon. Uh, and um, we'll talk to you all again soon. So we'll see you all. To, oh, hey, there she is. Hey, girl. So we will see uh, We will see all of you hopefully tonight at 7 o'clock with uh, Preston at Tiger Bait. Uh, tomorrow, 10 a.m., we will have the IB uh, countdown to kickoff with Sean Sires and Vince Dare. I will join for the second half to talk to preview the season. And then after that, Ryan, you and I probably sometime, seven, uh, sometime Sunday night, Ryan and I will be get together for our season preview as well. And then Monday we kick off our normal coverage. And uh, we're going to ask Julie Jules to get her, uh, her analysis and predictions for the season. Ryan, I fully expect you to have Jules to make her predictions as well for the season. So um, that is what we will, that's what we will be doing for, uh, for this weekend. So uh, for Ryan, Jules, Brian, you all have a great day. And we will talk to you again very very soon.